That was the right thing to do. This should not be about partisanships. This should be about do we want this institution to have the capacity to meet at times of crisis? Frankly, we didn't get there after 9-11. This ought to be impetus for us to get there. And we ought to all be committed that we would only use it in extraordinary circumstances. I don't believe there's been such a circumstance in the United States of America since 20, uh, excuse me, 1918. Over 100 years ago. This may be once in a century experience for our country. Let's pray that it doesn't happen again. But let us also pray that when it does, as Abraham Lincoln said, we will think anew and act anew so that we can do our job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you to Ranking Member Cole for allowing me to testify. It's always great to be here with my good friend, Majority Leader Mr. Hoyer and the rest of uh, my colleagues on this committee. Uh, this is an unprecedented proposal, and it's going to fundamentally change the way that the House of Representatives can craft, consider, and vote on legislation. The process that has led to this hearing uh, is unacceptable to me. After a previous failed attempt to bring similar rules change package to the floor last month, we, on our side, were hopeful and optimistic, just like Leader Hoyer was that the work of a bipartisan task force to get the House back to work would result in a genuine willingness toward bipartisan agreement. We Republicans on that task force offered a realistic framework and a plan to make responsible, measured, thorough reforms to get the entire House working again to perform our essential functions on behalf of the American people who elected us to represent them. And thank you for including some of our suggestions in that proposal. As Leader Hoyer mentioned, there were others that we put forth in this framework and our suggestions. I would argue, Mr. Leader, we wouldn't have to offer Speaker Pelosi or Minority Leader Pelosi in your example concurrence because we wouldn't bring this proposal to the House. We would do it much differently. Our plan was dismissed out of hand by the Democratic majority with no alternative. It was not until yesterday, yesterday morning, with the release of HR 965, House Res 965, that we saw any semblance of a plan and in no way was it a product of bipartisanship or greater member input. This resolution would dramatically overhaul the committee process, which is fundamental to producing legislation to, to now only allow for minimal input and consultation with the minority party. Let's call it what it is. We're talking about a member of Congress giving their voting privilege to someone else. There's legitimate constitutional uncertainty with what is being proposed, and it could call into question the validity of any legislation that proxy voting is used for. I'm sure that many of our peers are reviewing the proposed rules changes with the idea in mind that desperate times call for desperate measures. It's important to note that this is not the first time Congress has had to work through national emergencies, be it the Civil War, Spanish flu pandemic, the two world wars, and after September 11th, this body continued to operate. In fact, after 9-11, there was an exhaustive effort for years that would make sure that the House rules had a mechanism that would allow the House to continue to function during catastrophic times. That effort took three years to implement. And I'd like to remind members that as we sit here and contemplate changing 200 plus years of voting and committee precedent, we already have a product of those three years of bipartisan work. We have Rule 20, Clause 5, which the Speaker could exercise and was crafted to allow the House to operate when impacted by a natural disaster, attack, contagion, or similar calamity rendering the representatives incapable of attending the proceedings of the House. The changes to House floor and committee processes being proposed in this resolution are heavily dependent on the Clerk of the Houses, the House Recording Studios, and the House Information Resources' ability to execute and support these dramatic process changes. I have confidence in the clerk, CAO, and the professionals on their teams. However, it is unfair to them and puts the institution at risk by not first listening to them, mitigating risks, and testing the process extensively. These steps have been skipped. To that point, I submit today a letter for the record to you, Mr. Chair, outlining important technical questions and concerns that must be addressed before the official virtual proceedings are conducted without objection. By unanimous consent. The House is on the receiving end of 1.6 billion unauthorized scans, probes, and malicious attempted network connections per month. 
After broadcasting to the world our intention to allow members to delegate their votes via email and moving committee activity to virtual platforms, I would expect that number to increase. I want to be clear, I'm not opposed to exploring, and Leader Hoyer and everyone on the task force can tell you I and the others are not opposed to exploring common sense reforms to the way the House operates. In fact, you will find no bigger advocate in Congress for making improvements. That is why I asked to serve on the House Administration Committee. That's why I've invested countless hours working on the Select Committee on Modernization to try and move the ball forward. It's also why I was excited to work on crafting this bipartisan emergency response proposal on the bipartisan task force. Disappointed, as you know, but for weeks we've put forward roadmaps and solutions to open the House in a way that prioritizes member and staff safety as well as institutional legitimacy, but they were dismissed out of hand. I ask you, Mr. Chairman, based on your comments earlier, what has changed since just a few short weeks ago when the Committee on Rules released a report on March 23rd that could be viewed as the antithesis of what is being put forth today? I agree with each of the statements that you made, and I believe that they hold no less weight on May 14th than they did only seven weeks ago on March 23rd. In closing, I want to encourage all of us to take a step back and admire our institution for its strength, agility, and the ability to be closest to the very people we represent, <coughs> even during difficult times. I also want to remind us how fragile it is. Our rules are easy to change. A break in precedent can unravel generations of institutional reforms and institutional norms. Former member Bob Walker, who served for 20 years in this chamber and was one of the chief architects in the institutional reforms implemented after the 1994 election, recently issued the warning to me that precedent creates process. What we are considering today and the process through which it has been drafted is being considered is unprecedented. We are not here debating rule changes. We are here debating what kind of institution we want to be and the example we want to set for the American people and the rest of the world. If we approve HRS 965, we're creating a new precedent that will forever change the House processes, threaten the legitimacy of members' votes, and open a Pandora's box of unnecessary constitutional risks. Tragically, this time should have been an era of bipartisanship, like it was the previous few times we came to come together, just in the last few weeks. Instead, we're debating a member management proposal for folks who have a fundamental view of the role and responsibilities of Congress that is much different than mine and many of us have ever envisioned. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, and, um, and I would simply say that, um, again, that I regret that we couldn't come together on this. Uh, but we are looking at the current moment very differently. Uh, and uh, again, I, we saw your proposal that was released to the press uh, that we read about, uh, uh, we first found out about it that way, but it doesn't address the, the challenges that we face right now. This is the Rules Committee, right? We are one of the smallest committees in Congress, and here we are taking up the entire Ways and Means Committee room, which is one of the biggest committee rooms in Congress. Uh, what do you do with the Transportation Committee and the Appropriations Committee, uh, which, you know, is significantly larger? Some have suggested that maybe they can meet in the auditorium uh, or maybe on the House floor, one at a time. I mean, we have an, 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 a, a huge amount of work to do. There are, in addition to responding to this crisis uh, and trying to figure out how to get the economy back on its feet again, um, you know, we have must-pass bills that we, we need to get done. I mean, de de defense authorization bills, appropriations bills. I mean, and the, the, the fact that we cannot function, our committee process just literally can't function uh, the way it should uh, if we're going to follow CDC guidelines, I mean, that is problematic. So what do we do? We, do, we, don't, we, don't, we don't meet? We, 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 agree, we, we, we don't address certain issues that need to be addressed, number one. Uh, number two, um, look, uh, I don't think uh, some of my friends on the Republican side believe, as we do, that the situation right now um, is such that some members cannot come back. Um, I mean, there are, there are transportation challenges. Some members represent districts that are hot spots. And then there's, there's the whole issue of, you know, we, we could be asymptomatic carriers of the disease. And we're coming back here and mingling with our staff, Capitol Police, the people who maintain this, 
this campus. Uh, I mean, all those issues need to be need to be considered. And at the end of our process, uh, I mean, the, the two suggestions that the distinguished minority leader uh, put forward was one that he wanted concurrence on whether or not we could implement uh, a process of operating remotely. And so I said, okay, well, would you give us, would you concur? And his response was no. So all that we're talking about here, by the way, which is a response to not just Democratic members, uh, Mr. Davis, it's also a response to Republican members who have reached out to us, uh, we, you know, that, that somehow we need to figure out a way to deal uh, and to operate during uh, pandemics. Um, but basically, what the minority leader wanted was the, the ability to veto something, and he would use that veto to, to make sure we don't proceed forward. And then his alternative, uh, which I think incorporates some of the things that uh, are in the press release that you uh, guys released, was that, uh, you know, we should operate like the White House and we all should get tested. We all should move to the front of the line. We're all special enough that even though our constituents can't get tests, people who work in hospitals, first responders, people who are in, uh, working in food pantries and in homeless shelters, uh, who quite frankly should be tested, that, that Congress, the way we can kind of manage this is we all come back and every time we come into session, we'll get tested. Um, I don't know what the reaction would be in the minority leader's district, but in my district, people think that's tone deaf um, and think it's wrong, that we're not super special, that we should move to the front of the line. Um, and so those were the, I mean, that was the, the long and short of it. And um, again, um, I, I don't take this lightly at all. I mean, I, I wish we were not having this discussion. I, I wish I, you know, I wish we were we were meeting as usual and we were able to to fight with each other as usual and be able to ha have high spirited conversations as usual and and be able to move bills forward as usual. But we just can't. Now I hope that that is, is short lived. I hope that this ends really quickly. Maybe it'll end so quickly that we don't even have to utilize any of this. But then if you listen to the head of the CDC and you listen to other medical experts, they're warning about the fall. And so what happens if things get worse? I mean, much worse than they are right now. What do we do? Conduct business in the same fashion that we always conduct business? Ignore the, the, the advice of medical experts? You know, and I appreciate, you know, this issue of precedent. I mean, I, 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 I believe me, we have, we have talked to constitutional experts. I've talked to people who, are, who have studied the institution. And, I, you know, I'm very reluctant to, do, to, to make changes uh, that I don't think are totally warranted. But the, the gentleman referred to um, the change that was done, that was implemented after 9-11, when the Republicans uh, were in charge of the House. Uh, and you're, 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 in 2005, you're, you, you changed the rules for a provisional quorum, uh, which would allow in the extreme two members to constitute a quorum. Now the Constitution, you know, defines a quorum as the majority of, of, of the membership. But under the rules change that was done back then, I mean, you literally could have two members constitute a quorum. I don't think that's constitutional. But nonetheless, that was the that was the plan that was put forward, and yeah, it may have taken a long time to put forward, but I don't really think it was a very good a good plan. Um, and the the issue right now for all of us is is that this discussion is not about what ifs. What if we had a pandemic? What if this happened? What if, we are living it right now, and we all hope and pray that it is winding down, and that it will stay wound down. But if we're wrong, and this comes back, and we are not prepared, then shame on us, because we have a lot to do. And by the way, we have come together in a bipartisan way on a number of packages that have become now law, in which we have literally appropriated the House in a bipartisan way, the Senate in a bipartisan way has appropriated trillions of dollars to help respond to this health crisis and to help try to pr protect our economy. Um, we need to do oversight. We need to make sure the money is being spent the way we want it to be spent. Uh, I mean, that's one of our jobs. And if committees cannot meet because of this pandemic, 
you know, they have to wait their turn, you know, because we don't have rooms big enough here for people to meet and follow CDC guidelines. That's a dereliction of our duty. So I, I you know, I, I appreciate all your um, concerns. And let me just, I want to, I want to ask uh, unanimous consent uh, to submit to the record a letter from uh, Erwin Chermarinsky, uh, the renowned constitutional uh, expert and dean of the Berkeley School of Law, discussing the view that uh, remote, the remote, remote voting process we're considering today would be constitutional. And in his letter, the dean states, the Constitution bestows in each House of Congress broad discretion to determine the rules of its own proceedings. This authority is expansive and would include the ability to adopt a rule to permit proxy voting. Nothing in the Constitution uh, specifies otherwise. Moreover, if this were challenged in court, it is very likely that the case would be dismissed as a political question. The Supreme Court has ruled that challenges to the internal operation of Congress are not uh, justiciable in the federal courts. Indeed, I have written the court often, uh, quote, has held that congressional judgments pertaining to its internal governance should not be reviewed by the federal judiciary. And I also ask unanimous consent to submit uh, to the record a May 5th opinion uh, piece published in The Hill um, from Sai uh, Prakash, a constitutional law professor from the University of Virginia and former clerk to the Supreme Court Justice uh, Antoni uh, Antonin Scalia. In his piece, Professor Prakash said, I quote, the more general point is that if legislators are monitoring proceedings in Congress online and can vote remotely, they are in attendance and can be present for quorums. What is good for the President and the Supreme Court must be good for Congress. And I ask uh, that his letter be part of the record. I we yield to the gentleman from Oklahoma. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, I want to thank uh, you and your opening remarks uh, for the tone the tenure you set. Appreciate it and very much. Uh, same thing with our uh, two witnesses here. Um, and I've had the great pleasure of working with uh, on the ad hoc committee that the speaker appointed, and I agree very much with what the majority leader had to say. It was a, a good exercise and one that there was good give and take. We didn't get as far as we would like, but there were certainly some areas of agreement, and uh, I think it was taken seriously by everybody. Uh, Mr. Leader, my first question is to you. Um, I see uh, two changes that Republicans requested uh, as part of our task force negotiations. The prohibition on closed or executive sessions uh, and a limitation on the number of proxies for any other members. But I don't see other changes that are you tell us when and how those would be incorporated? Uh, committees are required to use software platforms that the Chief Administrative Officer recommends, and, and uh, which is, I think, a suggestion that you, uh, you made, or, or actually, I, I think, uh, Mr. Davis made. Uh, committees will not be allowed to hold closed executive sessions, as you know. If you're going to close executive session, you have to recess, and you proceed only with present members, who are not virtually present, but present. Uh, Committees have the option to hold hybrid hearings, which was one of the first suggestions that Mr. McCarthy made. Uh, committees are required to hold two virtual hearings to allow members to test the software. That was, I think, something that was sort of agreed to, but uh, you were concerned about, not you personally, but the, on your side, was it going to work? So that's one thing we think that was a good suggestion, and we've tried to incorporate it. Uh, 24 hours notice before any final passage votes during this period to give members time to secure proxies if they haven't designated one yet. Um, I'm not sure that was specifically a, a Republican proposal, but um, chairs are required to be cognizant of time zones. So uh, some chair doesn't schedule a 9 o'clock meeting and disadvantage the people who are on the West Coast. They would have to come there the day before. Well, if they're not coming in virtual, uh, that, uh, that was a suggestion that was made. Um, committees are required to provide a list of individuals with participatory access to the virtual hearing platform to the ranking member 24 hours prior to the hearing to the extent practical. And lastly, the Rules Committee will issue uniform regulations on enforcing decorum in a virtual setting. Um, <clears throat> where we disagreed, we think, was uh, and, and I think you expressed it at the beginning, the two constitutional scholars differed substantively. And I think, frankly, that's where we have a substantive difference. Because I believe 
that being virtually present and being present is essentially the same thing in the constitutional consequences of that presence. Because I can vote I here, and I can vote I a thousand miles away. And it has the same representation of my constituents. It's just trans it's transmitted in a different way. It was somewhat controversial when we went from standing on the floor and saying I or nay, which is a very dramatic kind of presentation, to the electronic voting. Now, one thing that's happened in electronic voting since I've been here, I don't know whether any of you experienced, the electronic voting machine broke down. And so we had to go back to the I, nay, and it took a long time. And uh, the next day, the machine was fixed, and we went back to that. Um, when we frankly went to television, it was Members were nervous about that. It was a real change, and you know, is it going to change the character of the House? Are we going to speak longer? Are we going to take just political positions as opposed to substantive positions? So that, 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 they were substantive changes. Where I think we and disagree, and I want to say this strongly, and I think a rep, my reputation on your side of the aisle is I try to be fair to both sides. I do not believe this changes in any way the rights of the minority, nor do I believe it in any way enhances the rights of the majority. I think it is an even playing field on both sides. No rules change. Let me give you a rules change uh, that your side made, not in this body. Uh, and both sides made this change because they were frustrated. Mr. Reed initially made a change that it wouldn't take 60 votes to approve judges. However, those judges were not the final say. Mr. McConnell changed the rule, and the Republicans, which substantially disadvantaged the Democrats, and a bipartisan choice of Supreme Court justices, because it could be made on a partisan level 51 votes. That was a very substantive change. It was made. And it did, in fact, change the uh, influence and the ability of the minority in this case, a 47-vote minority, uh, to impact the outcome. They could have no good. This how it changed, though, uh, Mr. Cole, and I have great respect for you, as you know, and we have a great relationship, and we both served on, the, served on the Appropriations Committee, so we have a lot in common. And I really think you're a very thoughtful voice on your side of the aisle and in the Congress. I don't think this changes your rights uh, and privileges at all. And if it does, I will be the first to say, no, we have to make sure it does not, either in cross-examining witnesses, calling witnesses, voting. You're going to have the same number of votes. Uh, now, some people may be absent, but some people are absent when you're physically present, uh, as you have now. This is not intended. What is it intended to do solely is to assure that the Congress is not sidelined because of a uh, an event that neither one of us are responsible for. It's no, but there's no fault here. It is a circumstance we confront. And this is an attempt to confront it so the Congress is not sidelined. Now, let me point out that we have come here, as you pointed out, three times. And we've come here because we need to do the people's business. And we are going to do the people's business. And we're going to do the people's business tomorrow. Some of us will agree that it's a good way, or some of us will say, no, that's not the way we want to go. That's the process. We'll come here. But why, when we have the technology that allows us to do it virtually, do we put lives at risk? Not only here, you're going to go back to Oklahoma at some point in time, and you're going to deal with the folks in Oklahoma, and you're going to come from a hot spot. Now, hopefully, you will not have anything to transmit, uh, but we know that that's possible. And if we have the ability to do something virtually which does not in any way denigrate our democracy, our institution, or the rights of the minority party, or enhance the uh, rights of the majority party, why don't we do it? And that's why I am a proponent of this uh, use of technology. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. Let me make two points quickly in response. Uh, Number one, a lot of the measures you mentioned that are incorporated are not actually in the resolution. I assume they'll come in the guidance 
uh, and I, I trust, certainly trust my chairman to that, but I wanted to get that on the record. Right. But many of those points aren't in the resolution yet. Hopefully, they will be in the guidance. We haven't seen that. So, and I, and I, and I want to, if the gentleman will yield. I please. certainly yield to the chairman. I, I pledge to the gentleman that we will, um, we will have that guidance available to him before this comes to the floor. We will certainly co consult with him um, before we submit it. I mean, obviously, the only thing that probably would not be in the guidance is, you know, what future technologies might exist that might be applicable to dealing with situations like this. But a, a lot of the stuff that the gentleman is. Um, referred to will be taken care of, but we will we will we will have a consultation. I, I appreciate Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Majority Mr. Leader. Let me say something. On our side of the aisle, sometimes we're frustrated with your chairman, <laughs> and we get frustrated when your chairman says, "No, that's not fair." I, we told him we'd give this, that, the other, and we say, "Oh, come on, Jim. We get you know got to get this done." No, we have to be fair. So you've got a chairman of the committee who on our side is perceived as leaning over backwards to make sure that he and his committee is perceived as fair. Well, and I want you to know, uh, Mr. Cole, as we go through adopting this technology and, and using this technology, if in fact we get there, as the chairman said, I will assure you I'll be the first one I want to hear from you. This is not fair to Republicans to say, well, let's make it fair. Well. Uh and I say this facetiously, obviously, but there's another thing we agree on. We both uh, chair the Danish co-chair the Danish caucus, right. thanks to you together, and we both occasionally get frustrated with Chairman McGovern. So uh, <laughs> there's bi there's bipartisanship right there. Um, I, I, you like frustration, yes, sir. Um, let me uh, make uh, another point, if I may, and, and I appreciate very much what you said, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to working collectively with you. And I don't have any doubt, uh, Mr. Leader, uh, about your concern about uh, trying to be fair here and, and trying to not disadvantage anybody, either individually or in a partisan sense. I accept that without reservation. Just so you know, and so I'm clear, my bigger concerns are about the nature of the institution itself. I know you share many of those concerns, so I, I didn't want you to uh, have the impression that I thought you were trying to tilt the table one way or the other to your advantage. I don't. I just worry very much about the way this place works. I worry, worry very much about members being in bubbles back in their own districts where they basically talk to people just like them. A lot of people only talk to people with different political opinions when they're here, and they sort of have to because the person has a vote and has a say. I think that's a good thing about the institution, and, and I think they also develop a lot of personal relationships that sort of provide the manner in, 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 in bipartisanship, uh, sometimes regional alliances, things like that, which I think are very hard to do remotely. I know you share those concerns. but. So just so you know, that's what I would consider. Now, next question, if I may. Uh, resolution before us today allows for the use of remote voting uh, upon the certification of uh, Chairwoman Lofgren. This was something we really never talked about in uh, our meetings. Uh, it was brought up before the task force, and, and I'm frankly a little surprised to see it here. Could you explain why you felt the need to include this? And then I'd ask your follow-up. Because I, I do think, as I suggested in my opening remarks, this is a lot of power in one person's hand. I don't think that's the intent. And again, I have a lot of trust uh, for the member in question, uh, who I have a lot of respect for. Uh, but have you considered, or would you consider, once she comes to a decision, maybe opening up and having the whole House have a look at that so that we didn't move forward technologically, really, on the basis of just one person, that there were other sets of eyes on it, if you will? Yeah. Let me, let me say that I know that the Speaker, and she indicated that uh, when Mr. McCarthy said, I may be open to proxies, but not now, and she withdrew the proposal at the last time we met. Uh, she set up a task force to discuss it. Now, out to your specific question, I think that is in largely at my instance. And the reason it was is in is because I think there are better ways to have a direct conversation with that camera. Me, not somebody I, not Rodney Davis, who I give my proxy to. And by the way, as we know, proxies are used regularly in the United States Senate today. We no longer use them in the House. I think that was a good decision that the Republicans made. Um, when I first came here, the chairman of my committee, I was on 
uh, two committees, uh, sometimes had 10 or 12 or 15 proxies in his pocket that were undesignated. This proxy is a very specific, you vote aye on this, nay on this, and it is clearly the, uh, the, the person's opinion. It's not the chairman or somebody else using a large number of proxies. The limit, as you know, was uh, your, uh, your side's concern. We, we shared that view. You couldn't go too low because uh, you might have to have somebody with a lot of proxies under those circumstances. But uh, I assure you that any change that we make, we will do with discussion, uh, serious and fair consideration. And a, I think we all have to have a sense that the technology works. For instance, let me give you my example, which I, I, I wrote an article as well, as you know, and you probably uh, read it, where I said my first in, an initial recommendation to the chairman was, let's use FaceTime. Because you put the camera up, you see my face, and you see me say I or nay. It's not somebody else. It's not an instruction I gave to somebody. I do it. I happen to think that personally is preferable. But I think what the Rules Committee has suggested is an interim step, which is now being used in the United States Senate by committees, uh, and that I think will reflect, as because they've carefully written it so you have to have specific instructions. Person has to announce first, I'm casting my vote for Tom Cole. Then they cast their vote for Tom Cole, and it is, it is as if Tom Cole were present, because it's, in the, it's going to be listed, you voted aye or nay. So the answer to your question is, I certainly, I think, can speak for the speaker that we intend to make any of these changes, and I know this is the chairman's view as well, after discussion uh, and, and, and careful and thoughtful and bipartisan discussion for the institution, not for either party, but for the institution. Thank you very much, Mr. Leader. If I can, I'll go to Mr. Davis. Uh, uh, in the unofficial, in the task force that we were all on, uh, we had a roundtable discussion with the Office of the Clerk and the Parliamentarian about, about broader issue of remote voting. In those conversations, the Clerk consistently highlighted the need to be able to certify a proxy's validity. Has your committee had any conversations with the Clerk's Office on exactly how they would do that? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, so we're sort of moving forward without a, an agreed-upon system of how we would actually verify the proxy. That's, um, that's also, Mr. Dave, oh, excuse me, go ahead. Say that, and that's why in my opening remarks I mentioned I think we need to take into consideration the professional House staff who are going to be tasked with implementing these new plans and proposals. And one other thing I would like to, to mention is I, I think there's a big difference between proxy voting and remote voting remote hearings and uh, kind of equating them all together uh, is is something that I don't think we should do in this institution. I think they all have very different uh, roles and aspects and, and potential problems that can be played in the House. Well, I know my friend the chairman's intention here is to make sure that proxies are very narrowly used and I, I commend him for that. I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, do you have any suggestions uh, or that would you know, make sure uh, that that proxy was actually cast by who was attended, used in the manner in which it was attended? Because again, I appreciate the sentiment uh, that the majority expressed here that they want to really narrowly curtail this. So we don't have what we had at the committee level that my friend the, the uh, leader referred to in the past, that is people literally casting votes without any consultation with the member whose vote uh, that actually is. Well. I have a problem with the proxy process as a whole because of the process being corrupted under 40, you know, over almost 40 years of, of one party rule in the House. And, and frankly, uh, after speaking to former members like Bob Walker, who helped institute the, the reforms that got rid of the proxy process at the committee level, uh, you know, he, he even joked about how the former chairs, now ranking members, laughed because. Uh, the Republican, the new Republican chairs took away their own power. And it, it was a process that they could not believe that um, the new majority would give up. But I think it was the right thing to do. And as Mr. Walker said, uh, 
you know, this is a new precedent. And while I appreciate the work of Chairman McGovern and, and Leader Hoyer and Chairperson Lofgren in trying to limit this proxy process, I think it's a process that has been shown in this institution to have been corrupted in the past, and it may be years from now. It may not be this Congress. It may not be next Congress. But it could be three, four Congresses later. We go back to that same corrupted process. And I don't think it's our job to allow this to move forward when we know it's been abused in the past. Mr. Cole, can yeah. you, would you mind yielding for a second? I certainly yield to the chairman. Yeah, so, I mean, let's, I mean, we, there's the proxy voting of the past, which we would all agree um, was not a good standard. And I think the Republican majority, when they, be, when they did it, get rid of it, did the right thing. Because the way it worked back then, was that the chair would have a bunch of proxies in his or her pocket uh, and vote however the chair saw fit without consulting with the member. That is not the way this should work. And that is not what this we're talking about is. Uh, what we're talking about is that if you want to give me your proxy, you have to, you have to indicate uh, in writing how you want me to vote on every single vote. And then it will be announced publicly how you voted on the, on the House floor. And if Jim McGovern had Rodney Davis's proxy and I voted, you know, contrary to the way you wanted to, it would be announced and there would be a period of time uh, if I vote, if I somehow abused my power for it, for it to be corrected. So there's a, the, the reason why we suggested this is because it is the, the approach that I think, um, you know, uh, is the, you know, let's put it, it's a low tech approach that can't be screwed around with, that could be transparent, that we, can, we know it could get the, 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 you know, that the member's vote could be cast the way he or she wanted it to be. The problem with issues like, you know, FaceTime and some other stuff right now is we've all been on calls where people freeze. You don't, you can't get through. Uh, that, 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 you know, the technology out there, you know, uh, may be such that we can actually go in a direction that Mr. Horia wants us to go more direct. I'm all, that's, that's fine. But we, but, but, you, but we need to test these things. We need to make sure that we're moving in a way that is that makes sense and that is foolproof, as, as foolproof as anything can be. So to compare what we're trying to do to the old days, it just that's just not that's not accurate in any way, shape, or form. Um, and the idea that somehow the process could be corrupted, the the safeguards that are being built into this, you know, unless a member is not paying attention, um, it just can't happen. So I just I, I just reject that comparison to the old days, because that's not what it is. And, and the gentleman knows that. We, we have talked about this time and time again. Uh, and I think we want to have a process with in integrity, a process where there could be as few errors as possible uh, in, in, in bringing this forward. Um, and again, you know, as we learn more, there may be better ways to do it. And again, my hope is, yeah, we've had multiple, by the way, we also had multiple conversations with the clerk, our staff has, um, and I feel that the clerk I think we, we feel confident that this process can move forward. So if there are better ways to do it, you know, this resolution says let, let, let's look at it. Uh, but in, in, in the meantime, let's, you know, I mean, the, the idea of just dragging this out forever and ever and ever in the middle of a pandemic doesn't make a lot of sense. So I thank the gentleman for his indulgence. I yield uh, back. It's certainly uh, my, my privilege, Mr. Chairman. Although we'll say again that if you actually look at the resolution, it's pretty specific about signing it's not very specific about voting and so that's an area that I, I again I don't doubt my friend's intent I think that's an area that the, we need to look at very carefully Mr. Mr. Cole but, would, would yes, you certainly. yield so I can respond to yes certainly sure. yield to you um, my friend look I I appreciate the work that we put that was put together in a bipartisan way on our task force I, I I'm glad you incorporated some of our suggestions I I don't see them as much as concessions as I see them as common sense reforms that should have been in anyone's proposal. Uh, the proxy process being instituted in the midst of a pandemic or whenever has the potential to be abused once again. And I worry less about, Mr. Chair, with all due respect, I worry less about, I worry less about the process being corrupted once the vote is in the hands of your proxy. And more so, how did that proxy get to that person in the first place? What are the discussions before that proxy is offered? Why is that person even offering that proxy? And could that process be abused? And you and I both know, Mr. Chair, it could be. But there's a big difference between proxy voting and remote voting 
and also remote hearings. And our plan that Mr. Cole submitted for the record laid out, I believe, a very common sense approach that gets us to a point where Congress can work just like essential workers are working throughout this country every day. My wife is a nurse. She gets up, she goes to work at a facility that is treating COVID patients in the building right next to where she, her office is. She's in and out of that building. She doesn't quarantine herself when she gets home every night. She comes home knowing she followed the proper protocol and the guidelines to make sure that she mitigated the risk of her picking up a virus. We've shown here that we can adapt in a very bipartisan way to do that. And we offered the opportunity to, to implement hearings, remote hearings, hybrid hearings. Let's test it. As you said, Mr. Chair, let's test the process. But let's not kid ourselves. What you're proposing today does leave the minority out. It gives unprecedented power to you as the chair of this committee when determining how and when a, 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 uh, to determine all regulations for all House remote proceedings. It comes directly from you. It doesn't say you have to consult with the ranking member of your committee. You solely have the authority to do this, Mr. Chair. And that takes away our ability as minority members, and frankly, any rank and file member on either party does not have the authority to work with you. This is something that you will be in charge of adapting committee proceedings to a virtual platform, and it will be the largest change to House processes and precedent in modern history. I think we do deserve our, our voices to be heard. It also gives unprecedented power to just the chairperson of House administration. Does it say she has to consult with me, the ranking member, when determining what type of technology to choose and implement before putting forth remote voting on the House floor? Remote voting is much different than proxy voting. That allows somebody to sit at home and cast a vote. And yes, there's technology, Mr. Chair, that could allow that to happen. But in the end, why do we have one person in the majority party determining what technology to use? We don't have, hey, let me finish real quick and I'll, I'll, I'll yield back. But think about this, it's, it's not, in, in modern congressional history, we've had majorities switch a lot more often than 40 years up until 1994-95. Now when this switches, if I'm the chair of House administration, do I then unilaterally get to change the process that was selected unilaterally by your majority on a remote voting process? You can consult. Well, you said you just you said but, you just but said you don't you, give you, us a, you, you, you just said that the uh, but there's nothing the that forces the, I mean, you to consult you, or concur me. you just said that the chair of the house administration committee is not required to consult with you go to page 11 of the bill it says here the chair of the committee on house administration in consultation with the ranking minority member shall study the feasibility of using technology to conduct remote voting in the house and shall provide certification in the house upon a determination that operable and secure technology exists to conduct uh, remote voting at house. So you just, you, what well, you just stated was incorrect. It is in the well, bill. Well, I, I certainly hope, uh, I, I certainly hope that and I consulting, Mr. With, Chair, I, I, I certainly I, hope that consulting, Mr. Chair, is a lot, is taken into consideration a lot more so than the consultation that we provided in a very bipartisan and public way on our task force was taken into consideration. And, right. and I think you need to be very careful about this process. There needs to be stricter procedures for minority rights. Consultation. Consultation, yes, I may have misspoke on consultation, but I would certainly like to have written in this rule and in this package a much more precise process of how this technology is chosen. The chair does not have to listen to any consultation or any advice, and you know that based upon what is written there. So I would expect much more precision to see the biggest change to House procedures in my congressional career, and that spans not just the seven and a half years that I've served here, but also 16 other years working for another member of this institution. Mr. Chairman, I think I'd reclaim my time, but I would grant you any time you might want to respond. I, 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 I just, I, again, I mean, read the bill. Um, and, um, and again, I, um, you know, I, I, I appreciated the, uh, the, the efforts that uh, were made uh, 
by both sides and, and the task force. But again, I will point out what, what my friends were asking for at the end of the day was to give the minority leader veto power over our ability to implement uh, these temporary procedures. And the minority leader, when I asked him, would he concur and allow us to move forward during this pandemic, said no, he wouldn't. So he would have vetoed that. So I, I appreciate that. And again, I, I, don't, I don't question the gentleman's motives. Uh, and again, I, have a, I respect the, uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma. And believe me, we will consult. Uh, and our staffs work very well together. We don't always agree. And the, and the end result may not be what you want, but sometimes it will be. Um, that's the way, that's the nature of this business. Uh, but, um, but at the end of the day, we, we, want, we want to get this right. We understand the, the importance of this moment. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but again, I mean, the, the idea to, to basically give the minority the ability to say, we want veto power over anything, and we will use the veto power so you can't move forward, I think it kind of defeats the whole purpose of why we're having this conversation to begin with. I mean, we have members, Democrats and Republicans, who have approached us to say that during this moment, um, we need to figure out alternative ways to be able to meet uh, and to be able to do our business. And, um, and that's what we're doing here. Uh, and if the, if the deal is we don't, either, that my friends don't think that we should do this, that's fine. We just have a difference of opinion um, that we're not going to be able to bridge. But uh, we will do our best uh, to make sure that as we move forward and, and in the regulations that we, uh, guidelines that we put forward, uh, that we are consulting uh, with Mr. Cole and others uh, and that we're as, we're being as transparent as humanly possible on this stuff. So I thank the gentleman for Re his. Reclaiming my time, um, just want to make two points. Number one, I have no doubt that you will consult in good faith, Mr. Chairman. You have all the way through the process, and I look forward to continuing to work with me. Uh, to my friend, uh, Mr. Davis, uh, you actually answered in, in your exchange with uh, uh, the chairman uh, uh, the question I was going to ask you, which is the concerns about consultation or not a single member basically making a decision about remote voting and uh, in the amendment process we may provide the op opportunity for the majority to reconsider that and I would just urge you to again I think in the end you are the majority and you have the ability to make the decision uh, as a majority you might want to consider expanding that out so it has the legitimacy of the entire house <coughs> excuse me well, the majority in the House. I just think, and I know this is not the intent, and, I, and again, I want to state for the record, I have enormous respect for the individual we're talking about. I don't have any doubt about uh, her professionalism and her personal integrity. That's not it. I just think there ought to be more fingerprints on this particular decision. I would ask my friends in the majority to consider that going forward in some form or fashion. With that, Mr. Hey, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you for your generosity with the time. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Torres. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for convening this meeting today, and thank you um, to both of our panelists for being here. Um, most of all, I want to thank, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the staff um, that is here and that made this uh, meeting possible. I know that you have stay-at-home orders, um, that you are not in compliance by uh, being called here. Um, so. In many ways, I consider you the heroes of the U.S. Capitol because you are here um, working for the people. I fully support um, this, this uh, measure, and I want to thank both of you for helping uh, members of Congress convene meetings um, through whatever means possible that we have been able to do it um, to ensure that we continue representing and hearing the voices in our communities, their concerns, and their requests for assistance as it, um, as it has come down um, to having to do these, whether it's through um, the Teams Network um, that I participated with you, uh, Majority Leader um, Steny Hoyer. I really like that platform. Um, but as, you know, platforms come and go. Um, computer programs come and go. And I certainly don't want to be stuck, you know, with an old system, you know, that is, um, um, that hasn't, you know, progressed um, with the times. Um, so this resolution is for what it is meant to address the issues of today. 
At the end of this Congress, we may not have a need um, to do this. And we may have another opportunity to do something, and hopefully we don't. Hopefully we will beat this virus and we can go back to our more comfortable way of doing. I do want to say that just because I support having an opportunity to be able um, to have another member vote for me, cast my vote on the floor for me, it doesn't mean that I am committed to doing that. Um, I have a pre-existing condition, and when I got on the plane yesterday, I was scared to death. There were people in the screening area of the TSA process that were much too close for my own comfort. And I had made a commitment to my staff, to my family, that if that plane was more than 70% occupied and there were people you know, stepping over each other, that I would immediately get off of it before taking off because I am not willing to risk my life for this. And I don't think that we should be asking our staffs to risk their lives simply because we're afraid of a new system of working under extreme conditions. This is not normal. This is not something that, you know, one party or the other. This pandemic is not a Republican pandemic and is not a Democratic pandemic. It is public health issue. 80 plus thousand people have died. 80 plus thousand that we know of. There are many others that have died as a result of the complications of this disease that are not on record simply because we did not test them. I don't want to test when my five-year-old grandson who had been sick could not even get a test. When a very popular pastor in my community died because he could not get a test. Not because he lacked insurance, but simply because the tests have not been available in my community. Like food isn't necessarily available in pantries in my community. This gives people an opportunity to vote on behalf of their constituents on the floor and not simply because they are sick. They should not have to relinquish their vote and to be that voice of their community. This gives everyone an opportunity to do that. So with that, I want to yield back and I want to thank you both for being here and risking yourselves on behalf of bringing better government and more accountability. Thank you very much. Mr. Woodall. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, for, uh, for convening us on this. I didn't have the, the privilege of serving on the, uh, on the bipartisan uh, group, and I appreciate the, the, the shared agreement on both sides of the aisle that folks put in a lot of very serious, uh, put in a lot of very serious work there and couldn't, couldn't come to conclusion uh, to be fair, uh, that work took place over a very short period of time, uh, and, and conclusions in a bipartisan way either are, either are often small uh, or they take longer. Uh, and uh, we have an opportunity to do some small bipartisan uh, things. We're choosing, uh, we're choosing uh, uh, to, to bring the whole package uh, together at, at once. I wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Leader, uh, I'm, because I don't serve on the bipartisan committee, I do serve on the on the rules committee. I'm thinking about uh, Rule 20, uh, Clause 5. Uh, this chamber spent three years uh, between September 11, 2001, and January 4, 2005, talking about uh, what to do in the event, uh, not of, uh, of of unanticipated uh, events, but uh, uh, reading from from Rule 20. Um, uh, specifically, uh, the inability of the House to establish a quorum is attributable to a catastrophic circumstances 
involving natural disaster, attack, contagion, and similar uh, uh, calamity. We anticipated uh, contagion. <coughs> Again, three years of collaborative work went into that decision. What, what's the inadequacy of the, of the, of the work we did in a, in a bipartisan way at that time? Well, you did, ultimately, we didn't come to a conclusion. Had we come to a conclusion, and, and let me back up, the reason we didn't come to a conclusion, the reality of the House shutting down uh, did not occur. Uh, the 9-11 occurrence did not shut down our economy. Uh, it shut down uh, the airplanes for about three or four days. Uh, so that there was not the compulsion of the reality of being unable, in this case because of a pandemic, to come together. And as a result, the difficulty of getting to that point was not overcome, even though they took three years. But, but we ended Now, they did take some steps, as you know, but we did not get to, the, to a step that would solve the problem that we have now, whereas Ms. Torres so, I think, uh, dramatically and correctly pointed out, she was fearful. She was fearful, and she's going to have to go to home to her family, and she is hopeful that while she's here, that wearing masks and keeping our distance uh, will uh, preclude her from uh, being infected. Let us all pray that that is the true of all of us. But the reason they didn't get to an agreement was because the reality was not as stark as it is today. Uh, you know, nobody was wearing masks. Nobody was uh, not flying because they were afraid of sitting in a middle seat. Um, you know, they didn't like sitting in a middle seat, but they weren't afraid that if they sat in the middle seat that they were going to get sick because of the proximity that that would cause. And I think it's unfortunate that we didn't get to that because if we had gotten to a solution and had provided for that, then we would not be having this discussion because we would have set in place a way for the Congress to meet virtually. And in addition to that, uh, you and I both know in the last uh, 20 or 17 years, uh, what extraordinary difference uh, we have with res respect to technology and the way to communicate with one and, and the way to aggregate ourselves in a, in, a, in a technological way rather than a physical way. So had they had that technology, they may have tried to pursue it more, uh, well, I know of your more passion, energetically. I know of your passion for reaching a, a, a virtual uh, opportunity. That, that's not where this resolution takes us uh, today. That's out there on the on the, on the horizon, but they did reach conclusion uh, in that uh, effort after 2001, which is why it's in House rules today that the House's business must go on. And so in the event that I can't get here because of contagion or Ms. Torres can't get here because of contagion, we are not going to let the absence of these two members of Congress and the inability to establish a quorum prevent the House from doing business. We're going to have a quorum call. We're going to find out which members can come back and we took the unprecedented step of then reestablishing the number necessary for a quorum. And as members began to travel or began, be, became unable to travel, that number for a quorum uh, would adjust. We, we did uh, establish Which was a radical path. change, I would suggest to you, uh, uh, that uh, Mr. McCarthy mentioned. And, and uh, that was a radical change uh, to say that less than a majority would be a majority. Uh, and frankly, what it did not provide for, Mr. Woodall, is either your voice or my voice being heard if we were not physically present, well, so I, that our constituents would have been voiceless. They, it, it does not provide for that. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that answers my question about why, as opposed to rushing forward with changes, we're not utilizing the changes we spent three years on and have never used. Uh, but, but let me go to that point about, about having our voice heard. Uh, I have read the documentation. Mr. Uh, Woodall? You, I'm you, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, please. I just, I just want to make one point. I, I thought I made it before. I just want to, again, you know, um, the Constitution is clear. A majority of each House shall constitute a quorum in order to do business. Under the change that uh, the Republicans put into place, I didn't vote for it at the time uh, because I thought there were serious constitutional questions. I mean, you could literally have two people constitute a quorum. I don't know how committees function. Um, I'm not even sure it would stand a, a constitutional challenge. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, our, the, the point we're trying to respond to is, is what Democrats and Republicans have expressed to me, and I'm sure to others as well, is that, you know, how do we function um, in a, in a, during a pandemic 
when you know we all want to participate, we all want to be, be do our committee work, we want to move things forward. Um, how do we do that? Can we do that um, remotely? And is there a way to do it? Uh, but the the, uh, the the rule change that the gentleman is referring to, um, I, I wouldn't class, uh, call it a collaborative effort. There were hearings, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it was pretty controversial at the time. And again, I don't, I'm not sure how many people can defend, you know, ha having the House of Representatives potentially consist of two people calling all the shots. I mean, I, just don't, I don't think that that, but I wanted to point that out. Uh, and what we're doing here is we, 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 we want to follow the Constitution. We do believe a majority of, of the membership should uh, be counted toward, a, should, should be what a quorum is, not just a couple of people. Mr. Woodall, can I make a comment? The, it, just one moment, Mr. Leader. To, to my chairman's uh, uh, point, uh, I have no doubt that his concerns are sincere, but Speaker Pelosi has been elected Speaker of the People's House three times since these rules were put into place. If the majority had serious constitutional questions of, about the nature of House rules, I have no doubt with the other rules changes the majority made, the majority would have, would have uh, repealed this section as, as well. I don't dispute. Well, with, with, all, with, with all the, have to, with all, the you know, to be honest, we didn't, didn't think, we, we probably should have thought about it. I mean, uh, you know, the, the deal is we never used it. Uh, and, um, but, but I think the gentleman has raised a good point. We should take another look at it. Uh, because I don't think that a quorum should be defined by potentially two people. Uh, I don't think that is inconsistent with the Constitution. But but the gentleman raises a good point, and when we get through this, you know, maybe we should be talking about, you know, uh, we should talk about, uh, you know, how we can take another look at that. But and, I and, thank the gentleman. And in the spirit of the House creating its own rules, as the gentleman knows, uh, you can, we often have two people on the floor of the House uh, under a unanimous consent agreement. The Constitution is no less... Uh, 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 adamant that a quorum be present to conduct business, and yet two people on the floor of the House conduct business regularly. So I, I, I recognize yeah. the gentleman's concern, and I think I, that's I, the minority. You know, and, and, and if the gentleman wants to defend a House of Representatives operating um, in its entirety with maybe two, potentially two people on the floor uh, to deal with everything, then he can do that. I just don't think that that is what the American people would like to see happen, and I don't think it's constitutional. But but the gentleman is right. We should take another look at it because I do think uh, we need to we need to be planning for um, for the future. The, uh, I I appreciate uh, the gentleman. I think he reflects my constituents' concerns. Two people on the House floor do not uh, represent a, a, an active uh, uh, deliberative body, uh, though nor do 45 people on the House floor. As this uh, uh, right. but the difference the difference here is that we, we would all we we could all participate virtually. So the bottom line is. As Mr. Hoyer pointed out in the very beginning, you know, when we had our, 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 our calls uh, through various platforms, uh, we all could see each other, we all could talk to each other, we all were able to participate, albeit virtually. Uh, so um, we, we want everybody to participate. Uh, those who can be here should be here. Those who can't can participate virtually. The Supreme Court is taking arguments right now. Um, you know, virtually. I, mean, I don't know why we can't, but uh, so there's a, very, there's a big difference here. Of course, the flip side of that is the United States Senate is meeting consistently right now, and I don't know why we can't, uh, but, but they, they have a they, virtual hearing. In, in a hybrid, in a hybrid way, which again the minority leader said we, he, would, he would like to be a part of. <coughs> Mr. <coughs> Mr. Leader, please. <coughs> Excuse me. I tell people I've had this call for three years, it's allergies. <laughs> Not but you feel a little more suspicious now with right, it, that's uh, right. don't you? Uh, just keep them informed. Uh, why didn't they get to a resolution? If you asked Mr. Orenstein, who was very much involved in that, Norm Orenstein, whom I think you probably know, if you asked Mr. Baird, Congressman Baird from Washington State, he will say they failed. Not that they didn't take some action. Why did they fail? Because the threat at that time was conceptual. Let me suggest to you, one of the problems we have today is that although people conceptually raised the pandemic that had happened in uh, 1918, could happen again. It was conceptual, and as a result, we were not prepared. Uh, here, it is actual. That's why you're sitting with a mask, why I'm sitting with a mask, while we're distancing, we're in this large room, as the chairman pointed out, where a small room would have accommodated the Rules Committee and the witnesses. It is here. It's not conceptual. It's not theoretical. We had 9-11. Now, if 9-11 had knocked out 
the entire uh, air traffic system, it would have been actual because people would not have been able to get here except drive maybe five days or three days from the West Coast. Um, Mr. Woodall, it's actual. Ms. Torres's fears are shared by millions of Americans in your community and in my community about a uh, pandemic that has killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, where the entire world has been impacted. Where for the first time in my lifetime, and I'm older than anybody in this room, the economy of the United States was shut down purposefully. Not because we had a recession or a depression, but because we decided it was so important to stop this pandemic in its tracks, which we have not yet done, that we would shut down the economy of the United States and 33 million people are unemployed. Depression-like levels. So this is not conceptual. It is here, and we have to deal with it. And we have to deal with it, in my view, in a context where we do not take Congress off the field. And this is an opportunity, in my view, and I use this, I talked to a newspaper reporter today, I do this with my grandchildren all the time, and it, it's much different than my talking to them on the phone. I see them. Very frankly, the children don't like to talk for very long, but frankly, when they're on TV, they like it a lot more. They feel, I can see he pop, he pop sees me, da-da-da-da-da-da. It's different. I don't know about the rest of you, I feel it's a different experience than talking on the phone. I believe you're making Mr. Davis's point, though, Mr. Hoyer. It's, it hasn't been uh, three minutes here. We've conflated uh, uh, virtual voting uh, with proxy voting. We've conflated hybrid uh, hearings uh, with not showing up on the House floor to vote uh, to vote at all. There are a lot of issues going on here that we can absolutely deal with in a responsible and collaborative way, as the committee as the committee tried to to, to do. But that experience you're having with your grandchild. Uh, you didn't phone that in. You didn't designate to your nephew uh, the ability to visit with your grandchild uh, that day and have that count as having seen your grandfather. Uh, I am it, laughing, Mr. Woodall, because you and I probably agree more than the chairman and I agree. And the chairman agrees, too, in my view, and I don't want to speak for the, with the chairman. This is an interim step. But in a world in which we live, you can be in Tokyo and I can be in Washington, D.C., and you and I can call ourselves on FaceTime and see one another in real time. It's a little different time on the clock where you are than it is where I am. But in real time, as we're talking, we see one another. And I think, you know, that's where I would go to ultimately because I think that is the better way. But this, what the chairman, and, and I, I'm going to read, I'm going to vote for this rule, has proposed is an interim way of getting there using something that we have used through history. Now, I understand in the House we, we eliminated, but the Senate's still using it, so it's a technology. I think Jim, uh, the chairman referred to it as a simpler, maybe that wasn't the word you used. Yeah, well, but I think, I think the gentleman would you just yield. Yeah, I'm, you I'm proposing chairman. that we take a baby step, <laughs> that we go with a low tech approach first, and as we feel more comfortable, we can evolve. Okay. There are, this may shock you, uh, Mr. Woodall, but there are some members of the House who still have flip phones. Um, there are some members of this chamber who are more technologically comfortable than others. Uh, there are some members of this House who think bifocals are a radical idea. So, I mean, the bottom line is we are, we are trying to, uh, uh, to, to deal with the situation in a way that we feel that there's a comfort level. And as people get more comfortable, we can then look at other, other things. But the point of the matter is we want to move in a way where everybody feels they can participate, not just uh, those who maybe have more experience with technology than others. So, um, and again, uh, I mean, that is the, 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 the reason behind this. But also, the bottom line is that, you know, we've, we've experienced this reality, and we all now to be, need to be prepared because it may be coming back in the fall. And so if it does, you know, we can learn from what, what, what works really well, how we can do things better. Uh, but we need to be prepared, and, we, and that is what this is all about. But I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, you're very welcome, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and since the leader has focused on this much more than I have, again, that bipartisan group that has been the source of, of a lot of, of, of praise, 
Uh, the, the resolution today is very specific when it comes to my designating my proxy. Uh, uh, Mr. Davis and I uh, uh, agree on a lot. We disagree on a, on a little. I hope he would trust me with his proxy if he couldn't uh, be here on a particular day. Um, and it says specifically, a member casting a vote or recording the presence of another member as a designated proxy under this resolution shall cast such vote or record such presence pursuant to the exact instruction received from the other member. Now, when Mr. Davis's name is called and I'm holding his proxy and I speak out and vote in a way contrary to, to, to the Davis instruction, because things do come up on the, uh, on the fly and, and not everything can be consulted uh, with, what is, the, what is the procedure for resolving, uh, for resolving that? The theory, uh, not the theory, but I think the, the letter of the rule that's being proposed is if you did not get instructions, you could not vote that proxy. I'm going the other direction. I did receive instructions, and I'm voting against those instructions, just like in the Electoral College, where folks have received instructions to, to vote to, uh, for President Trump, but they, they don't. Uh, uh, what, what is my recourse as a member? Again, most, most solemn responsibility we have as members is, is voting on the House floor. What is my recourse? Madam Clark, he cast my vote incorrectly. The, you, can, you can email, you can text, you can call. There's so many different methods of technology, and, and Mr. McGovern and I have had conversations about this. It's My own view, I will tell you honestly, is that the best way for me to convey my vote is to look into my phone on FaceTime and say, I vote aye or nay. I don't think, I personally don't believe there's a security question. Well, everything we do is public. This meeting is public. The TV is watching me what I do. It's, I don't have any secret on that. Mr. 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 Woodall, I could just I could say, if it, is, if, yield, if, if it is an honest mistake, right, I mean, the deal is that you will, I mean, as I mentioned before, you're, if, if you gave Mr. Hoyer your proxy and he cast it the wrong way and it was an honest mistake, you would hear Mr. Woodall voted yes or Mr. Woodall voted no. You would, there would be a period of time for you to correct it. Now, if you are assuming, if you're trying to assert that Mr. Hoyer would deliberately try to take your vote and use it in a bad way, then that's a question of privilege, and you would have the opportunity to be able to correct it. So that there, there is the, I mean, you, you, hopefully, if you're participating remotely, you are following what is going on. You will hear your name announced. You will hear how you voted. And if you call and Mr. Hoyer doesn't want to change your vote, then it's, a, it's a question of privilege, and you have the right to be able to to, uh, to change it that way. As, as, the, as the chairman knows, and certainly as the leader knows, even in the short time I've been here, uh, we've had motions to reconsider votes uh, brought to the floor of the House, and they have to be brought in real time. They, uh, we've had votes that have been held open for hours as leadership on both sides of the aisle went and twisted arms one by one by one to try to move a vote in a different direction. And I promise you it's going to be easier to move a vote of one of my nine proxies that I'm voting for than it is for you to move my vote. Uh, as, uh, on the House uh, floor. I recognize in the, in, the, in the public domain we have more opportunities than ever before to correct errors. And I can, I can, I can uh, be certain that with Mr. Davis's uh, uh, vast uh, digital presence, he will tell all of his constituents that I voted the wrong way for him. But the law of the land will have changed because I voted the proxy my way instead of his way there is no mechanism for reconsideration as I read the, read the resolution. We do have votes that hinge on, on a one vote uh, uh, margin day in and, and day out. How do we anticipate uh, correcting not the understanding of someone's constituents, but the direction of public policy for the greatest country the world has ever known? Can I suggest? that that is one of the reasons the rule provides for alternatives, and we ought to be talking about what those alternatives are that both of us believe give us a sense of confidence. This is a first step. I think it is a credible step. It is something that has been used and is used. The contingency that you raise is certainly possible. Uh, I think we all have to recognize that. Um, and it's certainly possible that any contingency might have technological glitches uh, as we move uh, forward, and uh, we'll have to consider making uh, accommodations for that that we otherwise might not have thought of. So I, I, I think you raise a legitimate point, not against the rule, but a legitimate point of something that we ought to look at as we implement the rule. 
the, Mr. the gentleman shares my concern that this may change the direction of public policy, but will still support the rule and will 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 sort these problems out on the on the on the fly. Is Mr. I, Woodall, I, I, let me call your attention back to a time when uh, the Republicans uh, who were managing forgot to ask for a recorded vote mm -hmm. on an issue. Do you recall that I stepped forward and said we're going to reconsider it so that we would be fair? Well, I would, I would do the same in this instance, because uh, the chairman's rule perceives that your intention is carried out. There's no discretion. If, if somebody votes differently than you instruct them to do, that is a violation of the rules, a question of the privileges right. of the House, and it has to be corrected. Um, I, won't, uh, I won't belabor this any longer, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I will tell you that that uh, you work very hard to build a lot of goodwill in this uh, in this committee, for which I am uh, not just grateful, but I am the beneficiary. Um, it is the consensus opinion that this is an unprecedented change. Mm -hmm. um, it is the consensus opinion that it uh, got started in a bipartisan way, but we're now talking about things that were never even discussed in the bipartisan uh, uh, committee that that might come forward, and we have defined consultation. Uh, as being uh, guidance is going to come out uh, tomorrow, and the ranking member still hasn't seen any of it uh, uh, yet. And, and so I, I hope the chairman understands, for, for institutionalists, and I, I, I want to stipulate what the leader said to begin with, that he has a reputation of, of being both an institutionalist and a, and a, a fair-minded bipartisan uh, a negotiator. Uh, we don't get to put this genie back in the bottle. Uh, uh, Harry Reid was wrong uh, to do what he did in the Senate. I think Mitch McConnell was wrong to do uh, what he did in the Senate. We are never going to get any of those things back. Uh, and what we are doing today uh, is not something that's going to last for the life of this pandemic. It's something that's going to last for the life of this institution. And I hope the chairman uh, takes the concerns on our side of the aisle, not remotely as a uh, I don't trust uh, the leader or the speaker or the chairman, but as a I have the trust of the of generations of the American people that I have to be accountable uh, for and moving moving this dramatically this quickly uh, uh, gives us uh, gives us great pause. You had a wonderful bipartisan uh, committee and I refuse to accept uh, that there was not a pathway forward. Uh, even if more incremental than the majority would like to, have, to, to, to see, that there was not a pathway forward that could have been done with the complete support uh, as opposed to, uh, uh, to this division. Mr. Leader. I thank, I thank the gentleman for his comment. Um, unlike the, the reference, I made a reference to the Supreme Court and the U.S. The district courts and circuit court uh, appointments. Uh, I agree with the gentleman's conclusion, and that was a mistake. Uh, what I disagree with is, though, that this rule does not change, as that rule changed on both sides, Republicans, Dem Democrats, does not change the rights of the minority, does not change the outcome. I don't mean that somebody couldn't make a mistake or, or let's say, intentionally, which would have been a, a, a subject to, frankly, being removed from the House, in my opinion. Somebody intentionally voted somebody's vote differently. Um, but. Uh, this rule does not change the rights of the minority. It does not change the consequences of votes. It doesn't change, as, as those Supreme Court uh, uh, decisions uh, did. Uh, and it is intended simply to empower the Congress to be able to meet uh, and meet its responsibilities to the American people. Right now, a committee that, is, uh, if its members are either can't get on transportation are sick themselves, the da da da, whatever it is, but are fully able to, uh, uh, you know, their, their, their faculties, their mental faculties are whole to instruct somebody to uh, vote. And let me say something that uh, maybe I shouldn't say. You're sitting in an aisle, there are four people sitting in the aisle, and there are a lot of people coming around. And Rodney's sitting, I said, Rodney, will you put this in the slot? He does, and I tell him how to vote. He does that. Technically, that's a violation. But it's not a violation. I'm there. I'm voting. It just so happens I'm using his hand rather than my hand. But he's doing what I told him to do. Um, what the American people want 
is the ability of the Congress at a time like this, and you cannot name another time like this in your lifetime. I can't, and I'm a lot older than you are. There's no analogy, except perhaps the Spanish flu, where they did have two people on the floor and they passed legislation, but not much. They didn't do much during the Spanish flu. That was a century ago. So this is a century happening, if you will. Uh, and uh, it's in that context that we're acting quickly. Why are we acting quickly? Because the experts tell us, and some people believe the experts, that this may regenerate itself in, as, uh, in September. We may have a, uh, a flattening, uh, but until, frankly, we get a vaccine or a therapeutic that very substantially minimizes the consequences of COVID-19, we're going to have a problem. And if it, if it raises, again, its ugly head in September, we ought to be ready because September is going to be a very busy month for us. And we don't have a lot. It's an election year, so we're going to be off in October, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so now is the time that you say we moved quickly. We did move quickly because we need to anticipate. We, would, we all hope this gets better. We all hope we get a vaccine. We all hope we get a therapeutic. But if it doesn't, we need to be ready to make sure that Congress is empowered to act on behalf of the American people and to conduct oversight that the, the extraordinary funds that we're appropriating are used in a way uh, as we intended. I stipulate this is a, a crisis uh, of a magnitude that I have never seen before. Right. Uh, but I was here with you on September 11th, and we never imagined that we would go another 18 years and not have another attack on this Capitol. We expected it to come again the next day <coughs> in the month of October, 30 days later, when anthrax came to Capitol Hill and folks became afraid to open up their mail that they were getting from their constituents. We expected there to be deaths on Capitol Hill because the Capitol was targeted. And the D.C. sniper, I remember the talks of families uh, that was it worth running for Congress again because Washington was becoming a life and death decision. I don't want to see us justify with a crisis uh, something that we would not otherwise do as our caretakers of this institution. I appreciate your commitment not to undermine minority rights. This resolution is silent on notice requirements for virtual hearings. I'm sure that will be included in the guidance, but it is silent as we sit here today. It's silent on whether or not uh, I can still have a member's words taken down. Will I be able to protect decorum? Can I make a motion yep. to adjourn? It is silent on those issues as we sit here and today, and I, I I am concerned about what the guidance is going to look like, but I am comforted by your commitment that you know it would be wrong to undermine minority rights and you have no intention of, of pursuing that path. Let me, if I can, they are silent on those rights, which are currently in the rules and are not changed. It is not the intention of this rule to change any protection the minority has that currently exists. There is no need to tell it in the rules because we don't change those rules. We want you to have... Every, Notice requirement, amendments requirement, cross-examination requirements, time that you are, are, are entitled to use during committee hearings. This is not to. This is not about a party. This is not about faction. This is not about philosophy. This is about ensuring that the Congress of the United States can act, even if it can't get its members into a particular room, including the House chamber. My friends won't believe me, Mr. Chairman. I'm trying desperately to close, uh, but the leader keeps bringing up uh, new topics uh, as, uh, as, 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 as I conclude. Uh, th there are, there are pre-filing requirements in here. There's no opportunity for me to offer second, uh, secondary amendments no, they're, they're uh, in, uh, in, in the virtual committee process. No, I, want, I wanted pre-filing uh, uh, for amendments, uh, and Mr. McGovern did not want to have that in there, and is, as far as I know, it is not in there. They're, they're talking about that. But as I read, and I had a discussion with Mr. McGovern, right. I thought there ought to be pre-filing. Let me tell you why I thought there were pre-filing. Because if you weren't in one room together, it'd be hard to hand it out. So if you got it out before, members would have, but you'd still have secondary amendments. And I think that's pretty easy to solve. Every committee almost has a screen. And you put up on the screen, and everybody sees it in their computer at home. This is the amendment, and they read it. 
but I, I thought pre-filing was a protection for every member that they would know what the amendments are. After all, this is, you know, I'm a trial lawyer, uh, and you like to sort of s spring something, surprise. You know, it's sort of Perry Mason thing, as everybody says, oh, wow, isn't that something? But frankly, we have a discovery process in the law. The reason for discovery, because it ought not to be about surprises. It ought to be about substance. Uh, that's why, but the chairman said, I don't think the Republicans will feel that's fair, so we won't do it. Now, my understanding, Mr. Chairman, that we didn't put it in. We did not. I appreciate the So I agreed with Mr. Mc well, I didn't agree with him, <laughs> but I said, if, you, if that's what you think, and you, uh, I want to be fair to the Republicans, and you think the Republicans will not think that's fair, fine, leave it out. I appreciate the gentleman's, gentleman's commitment. I was on my floor yelling and screaming for a recorded vote uh, on, a, on a measure uh, just uh, a short time ago, uh, and the parliamentarian just didn't see me. I wasn't at the microphone. I was on the, on the back aisle. I was overlooked and I was denied my uh, rights as a member of this institution because the parliamentarian could not see me to direct the chair. It troubles me that as we adopt, as we move towards adopting a brand new process of conducting uh, our business, that there would not be cognizance that not only could a member's uh, rights be denied currently in an in-person proceeding, but they would be uh, certainly susceptible uh, in a brand new proceeding. And if we are not proceeding forward with the understanding that those rights uh, uh, could easily be denied, then I have no doubt they will be trampled upon along that, along that path. So I appreciate the chairman's indulgence in letting me uh, uh, make it clear that I have those concerns, and hopefully my colleagues will share those concerns as the leader, as the leader does. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And this is all about the continuity of government, period. Bar none, that's it. And Joseph Story, a couple hundred years ago, said, Congress, in representing the entire nation, must be able to exercise certain inherent powers to deal with unforeseen circumstances which could threaten the continuity of its operations and the safety of the nation. Another famous scholar, a guy named David Dreyer, said, one of the most important duties of the Congress is to assure con continuing representation and congressional operations for the American people during times of crisis. Mr. Hoyer, I think you've explained it perfectly, and uh, Mr. Cole uh, has heard me uh, reject the nostalgia that he projects and the need to be able to meet in close groups and visit, and which is, as I said, we had a virtual hearing, what, a month ago on this? And I said to the gentleman from Oklahoma at that time, that's what I love about the Congress, is the ability to, with Mr. Davis, you know, play some catch and discuss a particular issue or sit down over a beer and try to hash out a particular problem. That's what is great about this place. But on the other hand, we're in a very different time that doesn't allow for that kind of relationship. The relationship is by phone or it is by FaceTime or Zoom or WebEx or whatever. That's what it is. I mean, I'd love to come over and sit next to Mr. Cole and, and you know, visit about this rule and say, okay, where could we make some changes that would satisfy you all? But we cannot have government come to a grinding halt in a pandemic where our own attending physician or our public health experts at home or the, the public health experts here in D.C. say, you guys shouldn't get together because you could drag the disease from Denver to D.C. or you could take the disease from D.C. back to Denver. And that's the last thing I want to do. I'm not worried about my own health. And, and uh, Mr. Jordan and I had this conversation the last time uh, we met in this room. And it's about being the vector that could affect so many others and to demand of our staff 
uh, when there are better ways to do this. So, Mr. Hoyer, let me, let me ask you a couple questions. The rule, as I understand it, for a quorum says chosen, sworn, and living, but does not require presence. Am I wrong on that? I'm, I'm sorry, repeat again. Quorum, those who are chosen, a quorum, a quorum, sworn, a virtual quorum. and living. Yes. That's what it requires, not presence. The Constitution says we should assemble in D.C. at least once a year, and I would assume we've met that requirement. We Have did, we but I would like to comment on that. Sure. Um, the founders could have no conception that you could assemble virtually uh, in that box that I talked about, that, that computer or that iPad or whatever. But, but I guess I'm just saying, even if they did, we have actually physically assembled this year yes, at least once have. in Washington, D.C. Yes. And I've said to you, and I've said to Mr. McGovern, I don't think this rule goes far enough. And, and my friends, Mr. Cole, Mr. Davis, uh, Mr. Woodall, apparently think it goes too far. If, I guess the real problem here is that when the rule was amended, as Mr. Woodall talked about, you know, 15, 16 years ago, 2005, 2006, it discussed contagion, but it didn't really go into contagion. It went into incapacity. People, if they have to stay someplace else, at home, because they've got shelter-in-place orders, or come here and we have to be six feet apart, and most of the committees are going to be in different rooms, because they can't be handled. They're not next to each other. They're not in the same place. They're going to have to work virtually anyway. So it's my opinion that the, and this is where you were going, Mr. Hoyer, I think, that in, back in 2005, 2006, the committee didn't, the, the change to the rules didn't go far enough. Because with contagion, you have a different set of circumstances that we face today. And it isn't like there was an attack and it was over and you now figure out what, what to do next. This contagion exists today. We were told that Washington is a hot spot. In Denver, we can see the surge having uh, reduced, but not here. So I said a month ago to my friends, that it would be legislative malpractice if we didn't address this subject. And a month later, it still would be legislative malpractice. Now, Mr. Hoyer, I understand that this rule terminates at some, this is a temporary rule, is it not? For the life of the Congress. And 45 days uh, in, in the sense of it has to be recertified that the, the cause of the rules being implemented was still present. Right. For the rule to be uh, called upon, it has to be the sergeant at arms, the attending physician, and the speaker. And then it lasts for 45 days, at least the, the, the proxy voting and, and the different things called for in the rule. The rule itself is temporary, the change, because it ends at the end of this Congress. So, well, 45 days potentially after, I guess, but I think it ends with the end of this Congress. The, the, it's, that's why it's temporary. So I would say to my friend Mr. Davis and to Mr. Cole and Mr. Woodall that if you all were to take the majority next year, then you could revise this rule as you so choose. I don't think you're going to take the majority next year, but you certainly could. If I didn't know the three of you better, You know, I'd say the effort here to not address this issue in any meaningful way is to, to bring the Congress to a halt. Now, I know that isn't your intention, but that's, in fact, what happens if we don't deal with this thing 
given this contagion, this miserable disease that has killed tens of thousands of people. We have to address this. We should have addressed this two months ago. And we better take care of it now. With that, I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Before I yield to Mrs. Lesko, let me just yield to Mr. Cole for unanimous consent request. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I ask for unanimous consent to submit the following for the record. A letter from ranking member of the Committee on Homeland Security, Mike Rogers, to the ad hoc working group detailing a number of rule violations with regards to the recent Committee on Homeland Security hearings. A letter from ranking member of the Committee on Natural Resources, uh, Mr. Bishop of Utah, uh, to the Chairman of the Committee on Natural Resources, uh, Mr. Rahalva, uh, detailing the uh, Committee's use of unofficial and highly partisan roundtable discussions displayed as hearings on the Committee official website, uh, a letter from the Republican leader, Mr. McCarthy, to the Speaker, Ms. Pelosi, detailing the Republican plan to establish a clear, safe, and effective path to reopen Congress, and finally, Mr. Chairman, a letter from all committee ranking members to the majority leader, Mr. Hoyer, detailing a number of issues with uh, uh, respect to uh, partisan changes proposed by HRES 965. Without objection. And Thank you very much, Mr. Now I would ask you name consent to insert in the record uh, next to those all the responses to those letters <laughs> uh, without objection. Uh, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. It's good to see both of you. Um, I'm going to oppose uh, this resolution for a number of reasons. Many have, have been stated already. Um, there's a lot of unanswered questions, I think, um, but I won't go into that. Mr. Davis, um, let's say there's a committee that we're going to do some major legislation. Let's say it's impeachment. Let's say there's more impeachment. Um, do you have a concern that there will be lawsuits filed? Because the question of constitutionality uh, is not clear, as evidenced by the different unanimous consent. You have one uh, constitutional lawyer saying it is constitutional, another one saying it's not constitutional. Do you have concerns of that, about that? I do have concerns, Ms. Lesko, and thank you for the question. In your example, uh, what you were referring to with uh, an impeachment committee hearing, uh, maybe a judiciary committee, for example, uh, you would assume that that remote technology then would be used during that markup process. If you look at the plan that was submitted uh, and, and given to the bipartisan task force during our first meeting, everything that was laid out in that plan was laid out during that first meeting. And Mr. Cole and Leader McCarthy and I specifically say we have some concerns about that markup process, specifically, number one, because of the constitutionality disagreements that we may have with others in this room and, and others that may be in the legal profession. Thank you. And Mr. Davis, do you have any other comments you'd like to make that uh, in relation to any of the previous comments? Well, Ms. Lesko, thank you. And, and thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to be here and, and communicate our, our issues and our concerns with this. Um, let's, let's be clear. This, this is a process that will fundamentally change the House. I do appreciate Chairman McGovern, Leader Hoyer, and all of the members of this committee. Everybody is here to, uh, to solve problems. We have a fundamental disagreement on this process and how it should move forward. We do not oppose, as Republicans, and you can see in the plan this was submitted for the record, we do not oppose remote hearings. We do not oppose utilizing technology. We just would like to see it done in a fair way. And the list of concerns coming from our ranking members of how it may already have been abused, Unintent it's the unintended consequences. I know everybody in this dais and here at this table uh, would likely be offended by the abuses that our ranking members have witnessed already with remote technology. That is why we laid out a clear and concise path to implementing technology for hearings so we don't see the abuse. I would like those to be taken into consideration. I know this is a hearing, Mr. Chairman. I know you're going to have a rules committee process where amendments to this piece of legislation are going to come forward. I certainly hope you take into consideration the debate and discussion we had here today 
as those amendments come to each and every one of you, and let's work together to make this rule better. You're going to pass this rule because you're in the majority. You're going to implement this. We get that. Let's, let us have our voice throughout the rest of the day in this room, and let's see some amendments that are going to be offered by the minority put into this rule to make it better and to make it more fair. And I do want to clarify some things. Yes, the United States Senate does have a proxy process. But that proxy process, unlike the rule that's being debated today, does not ever allow a proxy vote on the House, on the Senate floor. That's something that this rule will allow for today. That's why we have some constitutional concerns. That's why I think you're going to see any piece of legislation move forward going to have to go through the courts. Uh, somebody somewhere will file a lawsuit and it will go through the court system. But let's also remind the American people today in closing that this Congress has not stopped working. This Congress just a few short weeks ago had 300 members that came out here. I do understand and I share the concerns of my colleagues in this room about staff, which is why we worked in a bipartisan way before this crisis to get equipment to every office so that every office was ready in case they needed to telework, and they did. And it's working great. We want to protect the staff. And the debate on testing is not just about testing members. It's about setting up a process in a bipartisan way that we can ensure the safety of our staff and the people who work in this facility when we're not here. I certainly hope that's something that we can debate and discuss as we move forward and as we see testing capabilities increase in this country every single day. Let's protect the people who protect this house. But let's continue to work in a way that we showed the American people just a few weeks ago and a month ago when we put forth the CARES Act and the updated CARES Act. That's what we should see here today and, and unfortunately our task force did not come up with a bipartisan agreement. I certainly don't begrudge the people who are on that task force, even Chairman McGovern, who offends me by wearing that Patriot mask. <laughs> you know, <laughs> although you know I'm a Raiders fan, Mr. Broncos fan, I would be more offended if it was a Broncos mask. But, but in the end, we wanted to come up with an agreement. Today is not an agreement. It's not bipartisan. I'm certainly regretful of that. I certainly wish we could have gotten something like that in place. But in the end, uh, we've had our voice heard today in this hearing room. I appreciate that opportunity. And again, I reiterate, the voices of my fellow Republicans that are going to come offer amendments behind me, I certainly hope that you take their suggestions into consideration and make this bipartisan before it gets to the floor. And thank you, Ms. Lesko, for your questions. And I, I yield back. I, th I think, let me just, just for clarification here, I mean, uh, the, the question Ms. Lesko asked was about the constitutionality of committees. Um, meeting. I, why would that be a constitutional question? Um, Actually, sir, my question, if I could yeah. speak, it was just on constitutionality. Let's say another impeachment thing right, goes but, on and it's a vote on the floor. But I mean, uh, is that you know, well, votes on the floor are one thing, but in terms of committees, they're, crea they're creations of Congress, they're not, you know, creations of the Constitution. So uh, I think there's a distinction. Yeah, put your mic on, though. Yeah. That'll be better. Uh, the Patriots are not playing. The Broncos are not playing. The Nationals are not playing. The Yankees and Red Sox are not playing. Why are they not playing? Because they have determined to bring people together in large numbers is dangerous. That's all this rule recognizes. And I think we can work together. This is not about party or faction or philosophy. This is about how we can safely exercise our duties with a confidence that it is, in fact, Hoyer's opinion that's reflected, not somebody else's opinion. I was elected by 750,000 just like the rest of you. And they want us to reflect their opinion. We're just talking about what kind of technology, whether it's a and when I use that example, you know what happens. We see it on the floor. What I'm using is, I'm putting it in. You know, you, I'm using your arm. You stick it in, but you do what I say. 
That's what proxy voting is. Now, it may be a thousand mile long arm. I get that, but it's no difference in terms of character. That's why, you know, Maryland, I grieve. I use this in my uh, graduation speech, which I'm giving on the 22nd about. Uh, we have a, a young man, his name's Cowan Jr. He lives in Bowie in my district. One of the great guards in America. He didn't get to play in the Big Ten Finals. He didn't get to play in the Final Four. He's a senior. He won't get that opportunity again. Why? Because millions of people who had a lot of money at risk decided it is not safe. And we want to keep people healthy and safe. Not just us. As, as Mr. Perlmutter said, he's going to go back to Denver. And, and I tell you as, as passionately as I can, I don't want in any way the use of this technology to diminish the rights of the minority any more than I want it to enhance the rights of the majority. This is not about Democrats and Republicans. It is about our institution and having it on the field at a critical time in our history. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, Mr. Thank you. Let me yield to uh, a constitutional scholar, Mr. Raskin from Maryland. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I want to thank the Majority Leader for his very thoughtful comments and also my friend, Mr. Davis, for uh, what he has said today. Um, I actually want to pick up with something that Mr. Davis just said, where he said that the rule um, threatens a fundamental change of Congress and institution. And I think it's the coronavirus that has already fundamentally changed this institution and Congress. Just it, is, it, has, it has fundamentally changed the government of the United States society, culture, economics. We have 82,000 of our fellow citizens who have died already. We have tens of millions who have been thrown out of work. We have seen massive shutdowns um, in the economy. So it's the coronavirus that's transforming everything. We need to respond, as my friend from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, says this is all about the continuity of government. What are we supposed to be doing? Well. It's all summed up in one sentence in the preamble of the Constitution. We, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and preserve to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty, do hereby ordain and establish the Constitution. And the very next line says that all legislative powers belong to the Congress of the United States, the sovereign power of the people to create the Constitution and the government flowed immediately to us in Congress and gave us the power to fix the rules of our own proceedings consistent with particular constitutional parameters, taking the eyes and the nays. There's nothing in this rule that violates the constitutional requirement of taking the eyes and the nays. Consistent with the quorum requirement, there's nothing in this rule that offends the constitutional quorum requirement. If, it, if it's, um, you know, if some people object to um, the use of the proxy, well, let, let me say this first about the proxy rule, because I, I would have gone all the way with the technological rule, but the proxy rule is perfectly constitutional. And I, found the conversation between Mr. Cole and Majority Leader Hoyer uplifting on both the process and the substance, because they agreed that there was a real effort to try to arrive at a bipartisan judgment. And sometimes it just doesn't work. And that's why we have voting. And the framers of the Constitution understood that. We even have voting on the Supreme Court, where they're just interpreting particular language. But in the final analysis, if you can't agree unanimously, you vote. That's how we do it in democracy in democracy, and so the process was one where there was a good faith effort on the part of Democrats, there was a good faith effort on the part of Republicans, uh, but the majority felt that we need to put a rule in place, an emergency rule, to deal with this terrible crisis that the country is in. And on the substance, I think I also heard them both agree that this is a rule that doesn't benefit the D's at the expense of the R's or the R's at the expense of the D's. It's just a rule that allows Congress to continue to meet and to function. That's what it's all about. So um, for me, and, and I, I was asked about it by members of the staff and by the chairman, um, and although I, I favored moving towards a technological you know, voting by distance 
uh, technology solution, I said that the proxy voting is fine so long as the person who is the proxy exercises no discretion and no judgment. They're acting like a letter carrier. They are delivering a letter. That's all. And I have both a constitutional vested interest in that, and I have a personal vested interest in that, because I live 25 minutes away from the Capitol. These days, it's more like 18 minutes, and, and members know that. So not only do I know I will be called, I've already been called by members saying, if it comes to this and we pass this, would you be willing? And these are members who uh, have expressed some of the fears that our distinguished colleague from California has expressed. It's people who have members of their family who are medically vulnerable. It's people who are not sure the transportation will be working for them. Um, but I tell you that the, my, my so and, and I believe that every member of this body who is asked to be a proxy will act in utter 100% good faith, whether it is a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. I think we might have a couple of those now. Um, everyone will act in strict accordance with the instructions of the person who asks them to cast their vote for them. And not only that, Mr. Hoyer properly reminds us that it's a matter of public record. Everybody's going to be able to watch it. It's a perfectly transparent process. And if there's any departure from it, the member whose vote is miscast will know immediately and will be able to call and protest and get it changed. And I cannot believe that anybody in this body would think it's not a violation of rule one of our code of official conduct to deliberately miscast a vote, which it says that a member shall behave at all times in a matter that shall reflect creditably on the House. Would anybody think that it reflects credibly on the House to deliberately miscast a vote in the proxy rule adopted, uh, I hope, today? I don't think so. But having said that, my reluctance um, is being a local member and knowing that, um, I, I, you know, I think about, about Romeo and Juliet and how one of the major themes in Shakespeare is failed communication. The, the whole plot in Romeo and Juliet turns on the failure of Friar Lawrence to get Friar John to deliver the message to Romeo that Juliet has just taken a sleeping potion. She's not really dead. Remember? But, but Friar John never delivered the letter. Why? Because he was stuck inside because of a plague, because of a pandemic, and he couldn't get the message to Romeo. So he finds Juliet. He thinks that she's dead. He commits suicide, and then she commits suicide. So things go wrong. Now, things go wrong with technology, too. Um, I understand that. But I do think that there's that the committees will be able to operate very well under this rule. And I think over the last several weeks, by necessity, the Congress of the United States, like the rest of the country, has gotten a lot of practice on how to use Zoom and Teams and all of these different technologies. And again, those are open, those are public, they're transparent. Um, and people know if there's funny business afoot. Um, I do think that's the direction ultimately we have to uh, get to. And if I am called upon uh, to be a proxy. I will do my very best to get here on time, to be here, and to act consistent with the, absolutely consistently with the instructions I've been given. Um, but, you know, my real fear is just people not making it for some reason. Um, and that's my only hesitation about it. But look, we're living in a dramatically imperfect world right now. And um, I'm very happy to support this rule. I think that the Constitution demands it. The Constitution, Justice Jackson said, is not a suicide pact. We don't have to go down the drain together. We can make the Constitution work. There's a wonderful passage from Jefferson where he said he deplores the sanctimonious reverence with which some people regard the way things were back when the Constitution was written. He said that all of us have the, the same potential wisdom and knowledge of the founders, but we have something they don't have, which is the experience of living in our own times. And we have to adjust our practices, our policies, and our institutions to the requirements of our own time. And that's why I'm very happy to support this resolution. I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Scanlon. 
You know, just thinking of uh, Mr. Raskin saying we, we can't always be wedded to the practices of the past when the Constitution was written, Ms. Shalala, myself, Ms. Lesko, and Ms. Torres wouldn't be here. So Congress must change with the times. You know, we were here three weeks ago today to debate this rules change that would allow the House to do the people's business while complying with medical advice and working remotely. Three weeks have passed. Some things haven't changed. Our colleagues across the aisle are still opposed to a rules change that will allow the House to do its job while reducing the risk to members of Congress, our staff, the Capitol Police, our families, and the communities that we serve when we go home. The other thing that hasn't changed is we still don't have enough testing, PPE, or vaccines to be able to control this pandemic. Some things have changed in the three weeks since we were here last discussing the same thing. In the three counties that I represent, in southeastern Pennsylvania, the COVID-19 infections have swelled to over 26,000 infections. And the number of deaths has doubled. We're now approaching 2,000 COVID deaths in those three counties that we know of. We know that it's greater because there are a lot of suspected deaths that can't be confirmed because we didn't have testing. I've been in daily contact with our healthcare providers in that region, and they're hopeful that infections have begun to decline, but they stress that will only continue if we maintain our vigilance, maintain social distancing, and implement a comprehensive test testing program. Here in DC, infections have not yet begun to decline. And it's dangerous to expose members, staff, families, and communities to a virus that is so insidious, it has even invaded the White House, despite the extraordinary testing and precautions that have been put in place in that workplace, if nowhere else. Congress has provided the administration with the funding and the authority to develop and implement the comprehensive testing and federal guidance that Americans are begging for. Now, we can't force the president to use those resources any more than we can force him to wear a mask. But if the president won't do the responsible thing and lead by example, Congress can. We can wear masks, we can lead by example, and we can follow the advice of medical experts. We don't have time to waste on trumped up process arguments while lives are in the balance. We can work remotely, and so we must. I strongly support this rule change, as I have for the past several weeks, and I look forward to voting on it. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Morelli. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I uh, apologize for repeating some of what my colleagues have said, but uh, I think this is a critically important subject, as evidenced by the fact that the Majority Leader is with us. So I do want to take a moment to just sort of um, make some comments about what uh, what we propose to do here. And I do want to thank you for your extraordinary work on this. As on all matters before this committee, you approach it with incredible professionalism and bipartisanship and uh, fairness. And, and I appreciate what you do and Mr. Cole. And I certainly appreciate the Majority Leader and uh, Mr. Davis being uh, with here the, uh, this afternoon. You know, we, uh, we did have a, uh, a conversation. We've had one remotely on this committee. And I expressed some reservations uh, in that uh, conversation. I've expressed reservations publicly and privately about changes, significant changes to a legislative process. I you know, acknowledge I'm a traditionalist, and although this is my first full term in, in the House, I have a, 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 a background in legislative um, uh, bodies at the county, uh, state, and now the federal level. And so I always worry about what's the character of the legislative work. It's been discussed by others here that, uh, you know, much of what we do in the conversations we have are our conversations like this together, uh, and that does inform our work and does have a significant impact on the work we do. I also con you know, c have concerns about the precedent-setting precedent nature of what we do and whether or not the precedents we set uh, in some way impact in a negative way the work that we do. And then I, I also express my concern about the security of, of the technology. But at the end of the day, for me, there's, there's really two sort of central questions. The first is, wh what's the nature of the challenge we face? If this were a, uh, a, a small challenge, if it were an inconvenience, and obviously 
I would be uh, rightly, I think, concerned about significant changes. And the second question is if the challenges we face are so significant that it affects our ability to do our job, then the question, the second question to me is what's the nature of the resolution to correct or to address those challenges and that problem? And so, you know, as it relates to the first, I mean, this is obviously undeniable. I think all of my colleagues have expressed as well. 84,000 deaths from COVID-19 just in the United States, uh, millions uh, infected, and we continue to face challenges from a public health perspective. We face challenges in terms of commerce and our economy. Unemployment numbers uh, may reach 25% of Americans. 36 million Americans have applied for unemployment insurance. And to the majority leader's point, even things, it, it, let's, let's be clear, major sports is major business in the United States, and it's completely ground to a halt, as so many industries have. Um, so this is undeniable. I mean, there are no challenges that we have faced in our lifetime uh, that uh, come anywhere close to the challenges that this faces. And it does occur to me that Congress must respond to it. And so I also think of sort of common sense. What would people that I represent, what would they say if posed with two sort of questions? First, do they decide that we insist on the status quo and not have a functioning government in the United States? Or can we use available means and available technology to, to respond to the crisis in an appropriate way? I think all of us would probably agree that if you could achieve the second, the second option would win overwhelmingly by the American public. They would want us to use available means in an appropriate way to respond uh, to this crisis. And I do note, just parenthetically, that a number of states have moved to remote voting. Some have constitutional problems in their states, but many uh, that do not have addressed this. The state of Oklahoma, the uh, state of Pennsylvania, the state of South Dakota, Wisconsin, Vermont, New Jersey, even uh, my home, the state of New York. And I often used to say, no disrespect to the members here, but the New York State Assembly is the oldest, longest serving uh, democratic elected legislative body in the world. It actually predates the House of Representatives. And they've made changes uh, despite long traditions in history that allow them to vote remotely. So we're not alone. In fact, in some ways, we are now two months into this. I wouldn't call this a precipitous response. In some ways, uh, you might argue that we've, we've um, I guess you could look at it as we've, we've taken our time to prudently think about this. Others might say that it is, uh, is too slow. People on this panel might believe that. So in my mind, answering the first question, that this is clearly a challenge of unprecedented nature, uh, the question then is, does the resolution before us meet, at least in my mind, the question of appropriateness, and is it, in effect, a, a proportional response? And I just want to, um, just uh, if you'll permit me, just go through how I view this. First of all, the fact that this is a temporary rule and it does not permanently change the rules of the House, I think, is, a, is a, a, an important distinction to make and an important uh, decision that's been made to move ahead. Uh, that does not hold any future Congress to the rule we impose here, uh, and I think that's appropriate. We'll be able to judge whether or not this uh, rule uh, bears being put into the permanent rules of the House, but that's not a decision we make today. We make it with the ability to look back, having watched what happens and what unfolds over the ensuing several months of this Congress to make that determination. I think that's entirely appropriate. Secondly, and I, I uh, thank the Chair for this, um, very much, and, and, and the members and the majority leader. It is very narrow and very specific. Um, it's a public health emergency due to a, a novel coronavirus. I mean, that's about as narrow and as specific as you could possibly think. I guess the only other thing you could have put is COVID-19, the specific year in which that virus was, to, was found. But since we're in 2020 and you can't, and this is only a temporary rule, it applies to this uh, epidemic, which I think is entirely appropriate as well. The process to trigger it, notification by the sergeant at arms in consultation with the attending physician, um, the speaker in consultation with the minority leader may designate a period. Um, and these are 45-day increments, which again, it seems to me entirely appropriate. As I read the rule, um, at some point that the sergeant at arms concludes in consultation, again, with the uh, attending physician that a uh, uh, that, that an epidemic, that an emergency no longer exists, the rule terminates or the process uh, terminates. So again, I think this is very narrow. It's very thoughtful, um, even uh, to the degree, and I appreciate always the comments made by my, my uh, uh, good friend from Georgia, 
relative to how a member shall cast a vote. I think on page six, lines six through 11, it's pretty clear, following instructions, a member casting the vote or recording the presence of another member as a designated proxy under this resolution shall cast vote or record, or record such presence pursuant to the exact instruction received from the other member under paragraph one. It doesn't say may cast, that you use your independent judgment because someone who's designated you as the proxy trusts you enough to do it, although I hope that's the case. Shall cast, not may cast, shall cast. That's the rule that we're living under and I would, I would hesitate to believe that any single member of this House duly elected would ever violate the rule of the House by casting a vote uh, that is not an exact instruction received from the member who has designated them as a proxy. And uh, what I would do, and I, you know, I'd certainly ask the majority of you, leader if he wants to comment on it, but what I would do if I had designated a proxy, I would tell the majority leader in advance who I had designated and make sure that the majority leader knew how I intended to cast those votes. Now it is true, motions come up. Uh, but there will be given ample time for those instructions to be relayed. But that would allow the majority leader to make sure that those votes are cast in accordance with the rule. But, but, but I go back to my earlier point, which is I don't believe any member of this House would ever violate the rule of the House and would not cast the instructions that have been given, the exact instructions, and that's what the, the, uh, the rule suggests. The, would my friend from New York yield? Yes, sir. They, while you're following that line of, of, of questioning, you, you raise an interesting point about unexpected votes. It had been my assumption that if I was carrying proxies and an unexpected vote came up, that those members would trust me and I would cast my vote. I would cast the vote as I would anticipate they would no, want it I, cast. But uh, I believe, I believe, and I'll, I'll defer to the majority leader or the chair. I don't believe that's how it works. I think what will work then is again, you need written instructions, exact instructions given by the member who is given the proxy. So if you were my proxy, and I would certainly trust you to carry my proxy, Mr. Woodall, um, if there were a motion that came on the floor, a motion to recommit or some other motion before the House that was not anticipated, uh, you would have to be required, and I'm sure the House would allow most, enough time for this to happen, you would be allow, you, there would be enough time to allow me to uh, give you exact instructions on how that vote should be cast before the vote is cast, which will slow down the process. I don't think there's any question about that, but we want to get this right, and I would defer to the majority leader or the chair. I believe that's what's anticipated by this. Is that right, Mr. Majority Leader? I think the rule that uh, Mr. McGovern has put forward is specifically you have to instruct on every vote. It's not that uh, I would trust you to know what I want to do. You have to have either in writing uh, or electronically in some communication, whether I send you a text, whether I send you an email, uh, what vote I would cast, not what you think I might cast, but what vote I would cast. And that's why it's specific, exact instructions of how to vote. Uh, because we, we, we don't want, this is, this is you voting. This is not, as this example I gave, his hand is putting that, my card, because we're all jammed up, in the slot, uh, which is technically, of course, not allowed, but it is my vote, not somebody else's. And this, therefore, uh, we would contemplate only acting if you got specific instructions. And if you didn't get instructions, you could not cast a proxy. And, and to go further, I believe in the rules, announcing instructions immediately prior to casting the vote or recording the presence of another member as a designated process, proxy under this resolution, the member shall seek recognition from the chair to announce the intended voter recorded presence pursuant to the exact instruction received from the other member under paragraph one. I think it's pretty clear that there is no, that this isn't intended as I understand it, and I think this is appropriate, is not intended to give license to the designated proxy to cast votes as he or she thinks is appropriate. It's to allow them to do physically what the, uh, what the member who has designated them wants to be done as though they were there physically. And so there is no, there is no, um, you're, you're not giving anyone license to do anything or to use their judgment in place of yours. And I assume, and again, people can correct me, but if I'm not available to give that exact instruction, then I would not be casting a vote and any member who cast a vote without my exact instruction would be violating the rule of the House and I think would suffer the sanctions and the consequences of having violated the rules or any rule of this House. Is that right, Mr. Majority Leader? That is correct. So uh, let me, I'll just conclude this way, and I, I appreciate the indulgence of the chair. 
Uh, I do think the resolution before us is measured. I think it is proportional. I think it leverages appropriate and available technology. I think it meets my concerns over security. Uh, I think it is narrow. I think, and this has been repeated, and I, I, I firmly believe this, I do not believe it advantages either side in terms of a partisan divide. It simply allows those members to do what's right. So I think this creates a method to move us forward and protects not only the prerogatives under Article I, and prerogatives are important, but the duties and obligations and responsibilities that we have under Article I of the Constitution. And uh, so therefore, I, I will support the resolution, and I appreciate all the incredible work done by, uh, by all my colleagues on both sides. And I do want to, again, uh, particularly thank the uh, chair for his, uh, his great work, as well as uh, the majority leader. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Shalila. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the quality of the discussion that has taken place. Uh, and I have deep respect for this institution and for uh, its leaders. Uh, this virus is vicious. Uh, most of our states are opening up without meeting the CDC guidelines. Nothing is winding down. And those of us that had to go through airports can describe them as scary. We have two responsibilities here. The first is to do the people's business. And the second is to save lives. We have a responsibility to continue to do the people's business. And we're responsible for the lives of people who work here. This proposal is minimalist, as far as I can tell, so that we can do our jobs. And we must do our jobs. In my state, 2 million people have applied for unemployment. Less than half have received it. We have a legacy system that was designed to say no. And our poor new governor is trying to fix it. Thousands of really small businesses applied for PPP in my district, and very few got it. Oversight? We need oversight on unemployment insurance and, and the SBA at the minimum. So virtual oversight hearings are critical on the trillions that a bipartisan Congress approved. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I can be okay. um, just as tough with a mask on as without a mask. My personality doesn't change if I have to look at a screen. Um, but my second responsibility to save lives in my community uh, with all of you um, in every community and I will not put my hardworking staff or the others that serve and protect us here at risk. So if I have to choose between a mask and a screen, I choose the screen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, seeing none, let me thank the distinguished majority leader uh, for being here uh, and for his um, work on the task force. Let me also thank Mr. Davis, Ranking Member Davis, for for being here uh, all this time and um, for his work on the, t on the task force. Uh, and let me just say as strongly as I can, Mr. Davis, uh, that I strongly disagree uh, with you and emphatically disagree with you on the New England Patriots. Um, <laughs> but as my late father would say, hate the sin, love the sinner. So we have to, we will, we will, we will work things out. Uh, but I appreciate uh, you being here, and uh, I don't know if anyone has any final things to add. But Chairman, I just want to say that uh, I think the Congress is, is uh, blessed by having someone as chair of the Rules Committee who is as fair uh, as uh, any of our members, who wants to make sure that uh, the process is fair. Uh, obviously, he wants the result uh, that he wants, uh, but he wants to make sure, and I agree with him, that the process of getting to a decision gives everybody a fair shot. And we want to do that in this process, but we do want to make sure that the Congress can, in fact, act at a time of great crisis. Thank you very much, thank Mr. You, Chair. Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Chair, Leader, uh, my fellow colleagues, thank you again. Uh, I would just like to remind the committee, uh, following us today, you are going to be members of our party offering amendments. I certainly hope you take into consideration our debate today, and I certainly hope you take into consideration their amendments to make this rule 
much more bar bipartisan than it is right now. So with that, thank you, Mr. Chair. I still don't like your mask with yeah, the Patriots. Get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, nice to see you. Uh, you're dismissed. And now uh, I'd like to call up our next panel, uh, Mr. Bergman, uh, Mr. Bishop, Mr. Byrne, Mr. Jordan, and Mr. Pence. And, and, and what does it, it say? Uh, to, yeah, to maintain health and safety, please uh, take a chair in the second row. Uh, staff will escort you to your chairs, right? Yeah. Oh, we're okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Perlmutter. Thank you. I just, uh, uh, Mr. Morelli's uh, uh, discussion reminded me of something I meant to put into the record. Um, and we discussed it uh, at the virtual conference we had a month ago. Uh, National Conference of State Legislatures has compiled, I think, 14 states that allow for um, some type of remote voting. And I believe the template for this current rule is uh, similar to that that's being done in Pennsylvania. I'd also like to uh, have the record reflect that virtually every democracy around the world is now allowing for some type of uh, virtual voting because of the novel cor coronavirus. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, so um, I know you're all probably gathering support around an amendment to limit the five-minute rule in the Rules Committee. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, but, uh, but let me, uh, uh, I don't know whether anyone has a preference to go first, but if not, we'll begin with Mr. Bergman and we're Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think your mic is not on, yeah. There we go. There we go, okay. Welcome. Are we doing this alphabetically or by age? I <laughs> <laughs> Either way, you're first. <laughs> well, uh, number one, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and the Rules Committee for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I believe that the American people want to hear this dialogue. I want to be brief. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'm just a Marine. Over 50 years ago, I swore an oath to, quote, support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That oath never expires. Honor, courage, and commitment are not Marine Corps buzzwords. They are part of a belief system designed to instill confidence and achieve results at all times, but especially in stressful times, life-threatening times. As a, uh, just an, a fact, 35 years ago today, by days, 35 months ago, by days, uh, 14th of June. Several of us uh, were uh, scrambling for our lives on a baseball field in Alexandria. So uh, we were uh, not worried about a lot that day other than making sure that we did the right thing for the right reason and it was instinctive. The actions that we take, the decisions that we make as the 116th Congress will be viewed reviewed, debated, and discussed by future generations. When those of us privileged enough to be empowered by our constituents to vote on these important issues, reflect back, will we see that the actions that we took built trust, built confidence, or diminished it? And that trust is from given to us, granted to us, if you will, and, uh, by the American people. Either they trust us or they don't. Are we, as the House of Representatives, leading by example? Are we inspiring others? You know, we will adapt. I heard, as I listened here for the last couple of hours, suggestions about how we can change the setup of the committee room. Some of us are used to setting up forward operations around the world 
in uh, contended areas are used to um, adjusting to the, to the challenges and the threats of the day. I know that we're better than what I've seen recently in the media, but I believe we as a body can come together and show the American people, show them that we can be socially distant, that we can be personally responsible, and that we can conduct our own business here in Washington, D.C. in a, an appropriate, safe manner. But what the American people want to see and need to see, they need to see us agreeing to disagree, being passionate about, passionate about what we believe in, but in the end, coming to a, a consensus, if you will, and making a decision and going forward. So I oppose the proxy voting. We will adjust technologically, and we can do it safely, but we must do it aggressively with the thought of actually what we've been chartered to do by the people who sent us here. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, uh, Chairman McGovern, uh, Ranking Member Cole, for the opportunity to testify, members of the committee. Um, it's been a fascinating experience to listen to your proceedings today because there are many members here and, of course, your witnesses who have great experience, long experience in Congress. No one's more rank and file than me, elected last September, a member of the minority. And if, uh, I learned a great deal in the comments made by all, but one thing that kept ringing in my ears is that is perhaps Mr. Woodall, something that you said in response to Mr. Hoyer or agreed with Mr. Hoyer, that this is an unprecedented experience. And it's not. It, now, it is, uh, Mr. Woodall, for your age, because you were born in 1970, but in 1968-69, there was the Hong Kong flu pandemic that killed 100,000 Americans and a million people worldwide. And at, at a population then of 200, uh, 200 million in the nation, uh, if you extrapolate it, according to the American Institute of Economic Research, it might be a $250,000, uh, $250,000 person uh, death uh, in, in current, if you extrapolate it. And I heard a lot said by Mr. Hoyer and other members and members of the committee that have well voiced the fears that we all experience. But I think what is different about this situation is the way in which we are reacting to fear, because it is not an unprecedented situation. In 1968-69, it's not even clear that there are any alterations in the proceedings of the Congress. In 1918, the Congress wasn't dissolved. Unfortunately, what this bill represents is a failure of leadership when leadership is desperately needed a loss of nerve when courage is called for. Contrary, well, to Mr. Hoyer's point, this institution has always met in times of crisis. This house has remained open in the aftermath of the attacks on 9-11. And in 1861, with the Confederate Army a few miles away, by refusing to let members get back to the work we were elected to do, Speaker Pelosi and the Democratic leadership seek to enforce a vision of the House completely at odds with the vision of the framers of the Constitution, and in the process supplant the will of the people with the will of a liberal elite. Given that, it is no surprise that instead of a bipartisan recovery package supporting efforts of states to reopen, later today this committee will consider a bill that amounts to a socialist wish list masquerading as a relief package. That failure of leadership, which this one exacerbates, reflects the simple truth that members cannot represent their constituents without being here in Washington to debate 
negotiate, and work with their colleagues. Instead of considering common sense proposals to allow all members to perform responsibly the work we were elected to do, this proceeds with a radical change to House procedure that would upend 200 years of precedent and irreparably damage this institution. So-called proxy voting cheapens and dilutes the people's constitutional right to have their voice heard, voices heard in this nation's capital. I'm here ready to work with all my colleagues, and I will keep coming back to Washington every week as safely as possible, but confronting risk if necessary, to uphold the oath I took when I was sworn into this office. Thank you for your patience. I yield back. Thank you very much. Our former colleague on the Rules Committee, Mr. Byrne, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to be back. The last few hours have reminded me of all the fond memories I have of being a member of this committee. <laughs> I'm here today to testify you regarding H.R. 985. We all have a responsibility to defend the Constitution and this institution. Members walk these halls hundreds of years before we have arrived, and God willing, they'll continue to do so for hundreds of years after we're gone. The truth is, we are mere custodians of this building and this institution, and the awesome powers and responsibilities that the founders laid down for us. As ben Benjamin Franklin is said to have famously retorted, this is a republic if we can keep it. Republics have vanished in the past. The Roman Republic vanished when their legislative body, the Roman Senate, simply abdicated its legislative responsibility and let men who actually acted as dictators and then later emperors took over. Today, it is my strong belief this committee will transmit a rule change to the House that is not only unconstitutional, but will damage the institution of the House for years to come. I came back early to tell you I think it is a grave mistake, and I ask you to reject it. The Constitution of the United States, Article 1, Section 5, makes it pretty clear that each house shall constitute, a, in each house, a majority shall constitute a quorum to do business. But a smaller number may adjourn from day to day and may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members. Now, why would they want to have that power to compel the attendance of absent members unless they intended for a quorum to include the physical presence of members. Now, we have further proof of this. And the very first Congress, which was supposed to meet and did meet on March the 4th, 1789, in New York, one of the members there, by the way, was James Madison, probably the most important person in the Constitutional Convention. They met, but they couldn't conduct business because they couldn't achieve a quorum. In fact, they met for day after day after day until April the 1st, 1789, when they finally got enough people there physically to constitute the quorum that the Constitution required. Now, Mr. Madison didn't raise his hand and say, hey, we didn't require that. He sat there patiently day after day after day waiting for that quorum to arrive. That was a pretty important Congress. That Congress created the Department of Treasury, created the Department of State, created the Department of War, created the Attorney General's office, created the first federal court system, and sent the Bill of Rights to the states for their ratification. If that Congress, with people like James Madison in it, could wait for that quorum to get there, surely we can get our quorum today. Now listen to the majority leader talked about the quiet dogmas of the past, quoting President Lincoln. The Constitution of the United States is not quiet, and it is not dogma. It is the fundamental law of the United States. By the way, President Lincoln used those words in his annual report to Congress on December 1, 1862, when he proposed one of the worst ideas he ever had, which was not to free the enslaved people of the United States, but to round them up, put them on boats, and recolonize them to Africa. Thankfully, we didn't follow what he wanted to do. But it just goes to show even great men can have bad ideas. 
As you've heard over and over again, Congress has met through foreign invasions in the War of 1812, the Civil War, two world wars, and by my count, three serious pandemics. In fact, during the 1890s and the early 1900s, Washington was the hottest spot in America for typhoid fever. And up until 1950, because of the water around this place, Washington was subject to recurrent bouts of malaria. So Congresses have met here for centuries in the face of disease and figured out a way to make it work without having to change their rules. And I did check with CRS to make sure we never changed our rules in light of those diseases, and we didn't. I do not mean to make light of the serious issues that some members face in getting to Washington, D.C. Now are the fact that some members may be simply unable to attend or face serious health risks if they do. However, the framers already provided for this. They did not say we cannot transact business unless all were present. They were clear majority present would suffice. The fact that most of us are here today and probably arrived in, in, to Washington via air travel would be astounding to our forebears, many of whom travel weeks or even months to make it to a session. Certainly the framers would probably never have imagined that even on an inconsequential vote, it is not uncommon for 95% or more of the House to be present in voting. Despite all the challenges that we're presently facing with COVID-19, only 35 members missed the roll call vote two weeks ago. Again, the Constitution contemplates only 218 of us being able to make it. And we already provide a mechanism for members to enter into the record how they would vote had they been present. Yet the majority feels comfortable today effectively lowering the quorum requirements to a mere 22 members. Under the rule proposed today, only 22 Democrats to command the House to pass or do whatever you want. I know many will say it is unfair for me to demand members come to Washington right now. They will say it's dangerous or a health risk to others. Let me say this. I have interacted with, in my district, over the last couple of months, people who have been forced to go to work day after day after day, health care workers, people in the agricultural industry who produce our food, the people who process our food, the people who transport our food, the people who stock it on the shelves and check us out, people who work in pharmacies, people who work in uh, utilities. And I could go on and on and on, and they show up every day without near the protections that we all have here today, and they do their job. And they have a right to expect that the House of Representatives will show up like they do and do our job. The truth is that the quorum requirement and the quorum point of order is an important check on abuse of power. And remember, it was abuse of power that did in the Roman Republic. At the Constitutional Convention, no less an authority than George Mason called the thought of a less than a majority quorum to be dangerous, remarking that it, quote, would allow a small number of members to make laws, close quote. What would George Mason say about the Congress today? In the last three months, some of the most monumental pieces of legislation passed in decades, and they've appeared out of air from the Speaker's office. No hearings, no markups, no amendments accepted. We've already spent over 11% of our GDP in the last three months under this process. Now we're about to lay upon the House another bill that counts for a 70% growth of last year's entire federal budget under the same manner. We're living in a house where the work product is coming from the very top and being thrown upon the rest of us. And we're abdicating our responsibility to legislate. If we're honest with ourselves, I believe no one would challenge me when I say the rights and individual prerogatives of the members of the House have been steadily shrinking for decades. It was true when the chairman eloquently made this point when he was the ranking member of this committee, and it's just as true today. Too much power has been taken away from individual members and committees of jurisdiction and transferred to the office of the speaker. And with all due respect, this proposal today reinforces what is fast becoming a complete transfer of the power of the institution to the speaker. If the committee and amendment process is unnecessary to make laws, so is the presence of members to even bother to come and vote. Your proposal says to members, don't come to Washington, it's already been decided. 
That address from Mr. Lincoln to the, to the Congress, as I say, occurred on December 1, 1862. We were in the middle of a civil war. Ten days later, the Battle of Fredericksburg occurred 50 miles from here. There were 18,000 casualties in that battle. It was a decisive victory for General Lee and the Confederacy. And there were many members of Congress that were worried that General Lee would march that same army up here and take the capital of the United States. And yet the Congress continued to meet here in Washington, D.C. Perhaps these prior Congresses were just made of sterner stuff. Or perhaps they had an understanding of their obligations as members different from ours. I am concerned about this disease. I take it seriously, and I take precautions. But I'm not afraid of this disease any more than those people I talked about who show up day after day after day and do their jobs are so important to us, any more than they're afraid enough to not show up for work. If they can show up for work and do their job, Mr. Chairman, I think we can show up for work and do our job. And if I can make one last point. Mr. Cole said something that I hadn't thought about. He's right. There are times when I'm in conversations here in Washington with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and they tell me things that change my mind. And if we're not together, we're not going to have those opportunities as a practical matter. We'll lose that opportunity. And we'll lose the ability to have the sort of deliberative process that makes better policy. When we got the second coronavirus bill that dealt with uh, paid leave, paid sick leave. It showed up without any committee work, including the committee on which I sit, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction. We were given less than an hour to look at it and then vote on it at 1 o'clock in the morning. And then we found out there were so many problems with it, they had to pass a 90-page technical corrections bill. Perhaps if it had gone through the regular process and we had done our job, that that bill would have been right the first time it came before us, instead of being shoved down our throat. With that, Mr. Chairman, I Thank yield you. back, and I appreciate it. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ranking Member, three weeks ago, in a critically important memorandum, the Attorney General of the United States said this, the Constitution is not suspended during a crisis. And amen to that. And guess who agreed with him? Guess who agreed with him just last month? The Speaker of the United States House of Representatives said this, there is a constitutional requirement we vote in person. Today we are changing that. Today we're not following the Constitution. In fact, I think we're trying to suspend the Constitution by allowing proxies to establish a quorum. The Supreme Court was very clear. In the Ballin decision, the Supreme Court said this. Members have to be present. Constitution requires the presence of a majority, and when that majority is present, the power of the House arises. You've got to have a majority present. You can't, you can't phone it in. You can't mail it in. Present means present. You've got to be there. Frankly, you've got to be here in order to conduct the business of the American people. And understand what's in this proposal. One member can have 10 proxies. You know what that means? 22 members with 10 uh, proxies in their back pocket can conduct the business of the American people. 22, 5 percent of the United States House of Representatives. 5 percent can conduct the business of the American people representing all 330 million? You can't phone it in. You can't mail it in. We are supposed to be present to do the business of the American people. Article 1, Section 4 mandates that the Congress, quote, must assemble at least once a year. We do this at the start of every Congress. Article 1, Section 5 requires Congress to physically congregate to vote to change where it sits. So if we're going to change where we sit, we've got to come together. That's, well, frankly, what you're doing tomorrow, what the, what the majority wants to do tomorrow. Article 1, Section 5 requires a recorded vote on any question at the desire of one-fifth president. This is where the people said the, the people require uh, uh, for a recorded vote stand up on the, on the floor. We do this every vote we take on the House floor. 20 percent, how can that happen? If you've got 22 members with 10 proxies, how can you even have that? Article 1, Section 6 says this, it protects members from arrest during travel to and from their attendance at a session of their respective house. Well, golly, if you can mail in your vote, why would the Constitution say you have to be protected from being arrested coming to vote? You could just mail it in. That makes no sense. 
All these provisions envision members physically traveling and being present at the seat of the federal government to do the business of the American people. But we're going to change all that. We're going to change all that. The Constitution leaves no room for what we're trying to do here. It is so wrong. Farmers are planting crops. As my colleagues mentioned, farmers are planting crops, truckers are moving goods, grocers are stocking shelves, frontline health care workers haven't missed a day, law enforcement are busting their tail every day doing their job, but somehow Congress can't. Nope, nope, we're going to phone it in, we're going to mail it in, we're going to ask a co-worker to do our job and vote for us. This is a very, this is a dangerous place we are heading, and everybody knows it, but the majority is going to go ahead and do it. And that is, what, that is what ticks me off. Proxy voting, Zoom, WebEx, house party meetings and hearings, quasi hearings, remote depositions. Remote depositions? The example this sends, the precedent this sets is wrong, and I think even the majority knows it. But they're going to pass it anyway. And that, that's why the country gets so ticked with this place. Just, let's just get here and do like we're doing today. I, I testified for an hour in this very room three weeks ago. These, we're all testifying here keeping our appropriate distance, doing it the way we're supposed to do it. It isn't going to be easy, but doing things the right way is never easy. The hard way is usually the right way. So let's do it the hard way. Let's do it the right way. Let's do it the way we've been doing it for 200 plus years instead of phoning it in and mailing it in. I yield back. Thank you very much. I just would like to remind the, uh, the panel uh, of the uh, advice of uh, Dr. Monaghan. That, um, that if uh, the discussion becomes especially high-spirited in nature, that we should wear masks because the, uh, we release uh, virus particles onto the microphone. Changing the uh, Constitution should and, be high-spirited, uh, Mr. Just, Chairman. Just, Holy cow. Well, not changing, yeah. not adhering to it. All right, the gentleman has been heard. Mr. Pence. Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole, thank you for allowing me to testify on the House Democrats Proposal to authorize remote voting by proxy and remote committee proceedings. Mr. Chairman, throughout our nation's history, the House of Representatives has cast their votes here under all circumstances. Tomorrow we will consider legislation that represents one of the largest power grabs by a select few or one in the history of this of Congress. This legislation was written without the participation from more than half of the country's representatives. I know that the coronavirus pandemic continues to pose a real threat to our health, but these concerns do not supersede the responsibility we have and I have to my constituents. I believe it is very wrong to pass my vote to someone who has never stepped foot in my district. This voting card does not belong to me. It is not mine to proxy to my peers. This voting card belongs to the 6th Congressional District of Indiana. Today I'm here to uphold the oath I took when I said, and I quote, I will well and faithfully represent the Hoosiers that sent me to Washington, D.C. to cast my vote on their behalf. I'm here to stand with the health care providers, truckers, farmers, and essential workers, the Marines, sailors, soldiers, airmen, coasties, and all the other heroes who are still showing up every single day on behalf of their communities in this country. Mr. Chairman, I respect that some of my peers are concerned about their own health and personal safety, but that does not absolve Congress's responsibility or mine. The definition of Congress is, and I quote, a national legislative body, especially that of the United States, which meets at the Capitol in Washington, D.C. The Trump administration is working here. The Senate is working here. The United States House of Representatives should lead by example and come to, hear, to work here, too. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Anybody, everybody testify? Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. Let me just say, make a couple of remarks. I don't want to uh, go on too long here. Um, sometimes I get the impression that we just talk past each other uh, in this chamber. Um, and. Um, 
and I'm listening to some of the testimony that I, I don't think reflects some of the concerns that were raised, at least accurately, um, during the, during this hearing. Um, but let me let me begin by reminding everybody here that I uh, over a month ago, I actually sent a dear colleague letter everyone everybody here, Democrats and Republicans, asking for input on how we might deal with this. Um, a handful of people responded. Um, I don't recall anybody here sending me uh, or the Rules Committee uh, guidance or advice, be that it is in May, but the idea that somehow that nobody wanted to hear what anybody else had to say uh, is just not right. Um, we heard, um, by the way, I've, we've heard not just from Democrats, uh, but I've got calls from a lot of Republicans. In fact, some of your colleagues on the Republican side expressed frustration with the fact that we didn't do something the last time we were here. Uh, and um, I asked whether they would have voted with us. They said probably not. But nonetheless, they wanted us to do something because that was the right thing to do. And let me just say for the record, this is not about courage or about protecting members of Congress. I'm, I'm reminded of that great philosopher Billy Joel who said only the good die young. I'm not worried about members of Congress. Um, what I'm worried about are our staff. I'm worried about the Capitol Police. I'm worried about the people who maintain uh, uh, this, uh, this campus. Um, this is a serious, serious, serious pandemic. I heard reference to uh, the pandemic of 1918, how Congress continued to function. It really didn't. In fact, it, 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 be, it, it, was, it was so dysfunctional uh, that a, uh, a bill uh, to uh, provide additional doctors to rural areas couldn't get passed because people couldn't get here. I mean, that, that's an example of failure that I don't want to see repeated now. And yeah, I understand all the constitutional questions. Uh, believe me, we've, we've, been, we've been talking to constitutional scholars, and maybe, maybe you have as well. Um, and clearly, we do not want to do anything. I think that's a bipartisan concern to, that would, in fact, uh, violate the Constitution. But I will remind you, and I, this is, I've never heard anybody object to this, that when my friends were in charge and they changed the rules post 9-11, you came up with a scheme that would allow literally two people to constitute a quorum here in the House of Representatives. I think the Constitution is very clear about what a quorum is. Uh, and the idea that you could basically say that two people can just run everything, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I, I voted against that uh, when that came up. Uh, but that was something that my, my, my friends um, did when they were in charge. I'm not sure, I, I don't know whether any of you were here at the time, but that was the response. I mean, I think that, that to me, there were constitutional questions. But having said that, I didn't say that the Republican Party tried to destroy the Constitution. I think that th that was born out of a legitimate concern about how we would function um, in, the, in, the, in the face of a catastrophe, a major terrorist attack. I think it was the wrong approach. I voted against it. But I, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't question the motives of, uh, of what people were doing. I agree with Mr. Byrne. I don't like the idea that we are passing major pieces of legislation without committee hearings or markups. That's one of the things this is trying to address. Um, you know, I'll remind you that we're here because already it's May and 85,000 people are dead of this virus. I hope the president is right that, in, you know, that this is going to go away forever soon. I hope he's right. And then we'll never have to even do any of this stuff. But if he's wrong, um, and we're already close to 100,000, um, and we'll probably get to 100,000 before the end of June, and we're being told that things might be much worse in the fall, I want to be prepared. I want to make sure we function. I mean, I want to make sure that we could do hearings um, and that it is safe for people to come here. Uh, not just, again, members of Congress. I, I mean, we all could be carriers and be asymptomatic. And, you know, by interacting with the people on our staffs or here, we could be inadvertently spreading this disease. I, I, I just, this is, you know, I, 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 I get all, I mean, and maybe this is, you know, maybe it, this is about something, maybe we're, you know, again, I don't want to question anybody's motivations here, but I'm just simply saying, that I think the status quo is unacceptable. I, I, I want there to be hearings. I want there to be deliberation. I want there to be oversight. I want to make sure 
that the money that all of us in a bipartisan way, at least most of us in a bipartisan way, uh, passed, that is getting to the people that need it. That's an important, that's an important obligation that we have. And I want to make sure that we also, in addition to responding to this emergency, that we're doing our appropriations work, that we're keeping the government running, that we're passing a defense authorization bill. And under the, the, the proposal we're putting forward, if you want to come here, you can come here. But let me just say, just from a practical, logistical uh, point of view, we're the Rules Committee. We're one of the smallest committees in the Congress. And here we are taking up the entire Ways and Means Committee room, which is the biggest committee hearing room in, on the House, in the House of Representatives. Now, some of us could maybe meet in the, in the auditorium, I guess, uh, if you're the Transportation Committee. Maybe some could meet on the House floor or whatever. But by the way, we're, we're not just three committees. I mean, we have lots of committees that all feel that they're doing important work, and they are doing important work. Veterans committees, resources committees, a, you know, all the appropriations subcommittees. I might go right down the list of, you know, of all the committees that we have here. So, I mean, you know, we have a job to do. And look, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we have, we have, we had a bipartisan uh, task force to try to look at some of this stuff. I mean, we agreed on some stuff, some stuff we didn't agree on. You know, sometimes that happens. There's, you can't get to an agreement. Um, and we'll have this debate and we'll move forward. But I, I just really, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I resent the implication that somehow our motivations are suspect here. When in fact what we are trying to do is respond to the, to the bipartisan calls and concerns that have been expressed by members of this House. So, you know, I mean, I can drive here from Massachusetts. And that's what I've been doing. I, I'll, and I'll come here, um, you know, for committee meetings. I, you know, I, I'll we'll try to follow, you know, all the rules and regulations. Um, but, you know, in this case, one glove doesn't fit all. Uh, and, um, you know, so I don't think it's a test of one's courage or, you know, I, I want to, you know, I want to show that, uh, you know, I'm willing to show up no matter what. I mean, this, this is about also about common sense and about protecting the people that we come in contact every single day. Not just us, but everybody around us. Uh, so I appreciate you being here. Um, you know, we will have a vigorous debate. Mr. Byrne. Just one last thing. I, I believe that the rule change in 2005 is also unconstitutional. I, I appreciate I, that. And we, I, just, and maybe, I, I don't we want to, to seem look. inconsistent on that. I do think it's unconstitutional. And we need to, and we need to look at it. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank all of our witnesses. I just actually have one question that I would just ask to all of them, if I may. And I recognize uh, constitutional scholars disagree on this. I recognize all of you aren't uh, lawyers, uh, so but you are members of this body. And so I just want to know, in your opinion, personally, if you have one, is it constitutional to allow members of Congress to vote on matters before the full House without them being physically present in the chamber. And I'll start, if I may, uh, with you, General, and then just move across. No. No, by virtue of the basic of the definition of the word present. No, sir. No, but it is very much against what my constituents have told me where they want me to be. Thank you. That was an incredibly brief set of answers, and I, I thank all of you for that. But I, I asked the question, Mr. Chairman, just to make the point, uh, I think every member in this particular panel feels strongly about this constitutionally. I don't think they're here to question anybody's motives or, uh, or courage or anything. I don't, I don't believe that for a minute about it. And I don't believe that of people that hold the other point of view either. I just think, uh, you know, if you take an oath and this is the way you understand your oath to apply in this circumstance, that's an important thing for the record to show. That the members are all here in this particular panel because they think literally the rule we are about to pass, assuming uh, we do, uh, and we probably will tomorrow, is unconstitutional. That the rule just as my friend Mr. Burns said, maybe what we did in 2004 or 5, whatever that too. So you can't get mad at members uh, when they're expressing their opinion about their constitutional obligation under an oath that they all uh, swore to. So with that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Torres.
Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, was struck by your opening that uh, sometimes we talk past each other because I, I think you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Uh, your high-spirited uh, uh, response to our witnesses was that Congress has a job to do and we've got to get back to it and folks just need to get on board and we need to get it done. When I was listening to the testimony, I didn't hear anybody say uh, Congress should abdicate their responsibility. I thought I heard everybody say Congress needs to get back about uh, their business. And I, I say that because I was so disappointed that the bipartisan group couldn't reach a bipartisan consensus. Chairman says he resents the implication something nefarious is going on here. I resent the implication that we don't love this institution enough collectively to find a bipartisan solution uh, to getting about our work. I know that we can, but, but uh, General, if I could start with you as, as Mr. Cole did and go, a, go across. Chairman says we've got to get this place back to work. Um, uh, that is what I thought I understood you to say. Did I understand you correctly? That is correct. We've got to get back to work. That's what the American people expect us to do. And we can do it safely. I mean, I've already done the, uh, I loved geometry when I was in high school. I've done the geometry of all of these rooms based on committee size, how we can do it and make the American people proud of us. They sent us here to debate, to go at a, an issue from all sides, and we can do it, and we need to be the example of how to, if you will, if you want to talk about the bigger reopening of the economy, let's talk about reopening of the House of Representatives in its functional daily business. Mr. Bishop, you've spoken out against the underlying uh, rules change, but for or against uh, getting the House back to work? So much for it, Mr. Woodall, that I'm coming every week. I'm spending my weeks here because we must and we can return to our duty here. The, uh, Mr. Byrne, you're visiting with folks who are getting back to work uh, every day. Chairman's right. We need to get the House of Representatives back to work. You've spoken out against the underlying uh, uh, rules change. The United States House of Representatives Every single one of us is essential to the functioning of this nation. Every other essential worker in America is at work. Every member of the House of Representatives that can be here, and there's some of us that can't be here, need to come here and do our job as we've done it for over 230 years. Hey, Mr. Jordan, this is twice you've come to testify before, uh, uh, before this committee, as this committee has been trying to get back to work. Again, the chairman's right. The Congress has to get back to work. We have to find a pathway forward. But you've spoken out against this rule change. Yeah, I mean, you heard my comments earlier, uh, Congressman. Um, the chairman mentioned this is a small committee, and we're taking up a good portion of this large hearing room. But there are other facilities. And he mentioned there's lots of committees. This is a smaller committee. but Practical concerns and scheduling concerns shouldn't dictate a, a deviation from what the Constitution requires. Let's, let's schedule this room around the clock for committees that can meet here. Let's schedule the auditorium in the HBC around the clock for committees that can meet there and maintain the appropriate distance. That's just a scheduling practical concern. But instead, we're saying, no, no, no. Members can give their vote to some other member and conceivably, under this legislation, 22 members could conduct the business of the American people. That is certainly not what was envisioned in any way by the Constitution. So let's not make a scheduling and practical uh, concern. Very real. The chairman's right. Very real. But let's not make that the reason we're going to change the Constitution and not follow the Constitution. Let's, let's get back to work and let's do it in the right way, just like this committee is doing as we speak. Mr. Pence, you traveled uh, uh, back to Washington for this committee uh, uh, hearing uh, today. Again, we do have to get Congress uh, back to work, but you've spoken out against this rules change. Yes, sir. I actually came Sunday as I felt so strongly about being out here. As I mentioned earlier, my constituents kept asking me, uh, when it, when's Congress going to get back to work? In their mind, back to work is right out here. It, Mr. Chairman, I don't go through that exercise for effect. Yeah, I think okay. you genuinely are looking for bipartisan cooperation to get Congress back to work. And I believe you and Mr. Cole share a disappointment that the bipartisan committee couldn't find that. But I can tell you this is a, a, a perfect cross-section of the Republican conference, and every single one of them uh, uh, is concerned about the underlying resolution, but absolutely shares the passion uh, to, get, uh, to get back to work. I, I know 
that if we commit more time to it, as we talked about, this is a September uh, 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 problem. We're worried about what happens in, in, uh, in round two, that we can find that bipartisan cross-section. We don't have to do this in a way that divides us. We can do this in a way that brings this institution together, as I know you want to do. And with that, I yield back. Well, well thank you very much. I, you know, again, I don't know, I can't speak for all of you, but uh, I've been working uh, very hard uh, during this time. Uh, uh, talking to committee chairs, weighing in on my priorities and some of the bills, dealing with my constituents. So, I mean, some of us have been working. And I would also say that uh, I guess where we disagree is that you said that you think the only way we could do our job is by all being here in one spot, whereas some of us believe we can, uh, we can operate remotely in some cases or in a, hybrid, uh, uh, in a hybrid fashion. But here's the good news. For everybody who wants to come back, I mean, what we're doing here today basically allows for that, and, and if, if that's what you feel most comfortable in a committee room, you are more than welcome to do that. So nothing in any way, shape, or form would undercut that. Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Jordan, you and I didn't agree last time you were here. We don't agree today. So I'll just, I'll just you know, that's, that's really surprising for the two of us. But I do, General, I, I kind of like math, too. So I did some math. Mr. Bishop, I'm looking at a Hong Kong flu. Hong Kong flu, 100,000 died over three years. We have 84,000 in two months. So if I do the math, the math is 18 times 84,000 puts us at a million five twelve if it continues for three years. So they're not the same thing. This is more like the, the hell of it. This is more like the, the Spanish flu, which ultimately resulted in us coming up with the UC, unanimous consent, where two people have to agree and you pass legislation. The thing that the Hong Kong flu may be like this is that it was the second wave that was worse than the first. And we have to watch out for that. At that time, it was considered to be an epidemic. And I'm looking at the sidebar of where there were 650 deaths a week in America. Today, it's 2,000 a day. So the math, much different. Mr. Byrne, I did some math for you. And, and it was brought to my attention because of Mr. Pence. He's here to represent the 750,000 or so folks from his district. And I assume you represent about that many, too. I think my district were up to about 850. But just doing the math, you said the last vote, 35 were not present. 35 times 750,000, I think, is about 11,250,000. That's how many people they represented. That's how many people were disenfranchised by their not being here because they're present. We have at least two members of this committee, uh, one of whom you served with, uh, Mr. Hastings, who has been told in no uncertain terms he cannot travel because of his condition. But he certainly is capable of making decisions and representing the 750,000 people. And I wish he were here, because his voice is so strong and powerful. And I want him to be able to participate and provide his experience and his logic whether it's virtually or by casting a vote by proxy. And we have two pieces to this particular rule. You all have been talking more about the floor vote and the proxy vote. But we also have the ability of committees, although maybe imperfect, to continue to meet and allow for individuals to make decisions and make votes on behalf of Americans. And that's the bottom line here, is the continuity of government. And I appreciate everybody's legal opinion that this is unconstitutional, which I absolutely dispute every way to Sunday. This is about representing people. We've asked most of America 
to work remotely to avoid precisely what happened with the Hong Kong flu and the Spanish flu and have another big outbreak. We've asked that because this administration was caught flat-footed when this virus came on our shores. And we didn't have enough protective gear. We didn't have enough ventilators. We didn't have enough beds. And thank goodness Americans, those who provide essential services, and God bless them, I assume every one of you is going to vote for the bill tomorrow because it has hazard pay for those people. But thank goodness Americans said, you know what, we're going to take the advice of the CDC and people to suppress this surge so that our health care system isn't overwhelmed and so that there, you know, God forbid, or other outbreaks, there will be sufficient protective gear and beds and ventilators and of the like. Now, Mr. Pence, and I appreciate, you know, I served with your brother, outstanding legislator. And we know, t tell me, is he in quarantine now? Is he self-isolated? I don't speak on behalf of my brother. I'm here. I know you're, I know. I mean, I'm just asking. Re representative. Okay, today. so, all right, let's not talk about him. Let's talk about the 39 members of the House, most of whom went into quarantine in that first week after we broke on March 14th. Those 39 members have had to go into, had to go into quarantine, some of them very ill. There were nine senators, uh, Lamar Alexander still in quarantine. And we've had, and I didn't even realize this, uh, I forgot my friend Mr. Cole was in quarantine for some, some time. And I disagree with him sometimes, I agree with him sometimes, but I always appreciate his perspective. And so we are in a pandemic that is much worse than Hong Kong flu. Based on the numbers, it is. Three years, 100,000. And I think I just read the same story you did out of the Wall Street Journal. And I did the math. I extrapolated it from two and a half months to three years, Would which is what yield? they were saying. Would the gentleman yield? Let me finish with Mr. Pence, and I'll yield to the gentleman. But the purpose and the concern I have is whether I would agree with a Mike Pence or a Jim Jordan or Bradley Byrne, I respect their opinions. And I want those people to be able to represent the 750,000 folks back in their districts. And in an imperfect and, in fact, an improbable time like we're in right now, uh, we have to take as just a story, we must be able to exercise certain inherent powers to deal with unforeseen circumstances which could threaten the continuity of its operations and the safety of the nation. We're asking a lot of people to work remotely. We're asking a lot of uh, essential workers to present themselves. The rule that has been fashioned is very narrow. It expires at the end of this year. It's limited to 45-day increments based on the speaker in consultation with the minority leader, the house physician, and the sergeant at arms. And I think it's something that enfranchises the Alcee Hastings, the Tom Coles when he's in quarantine. And the, the notion that this is fundamentally changing the operations of the House, or the notion that this is unconstitutional, is just wrong. So I would yield to Mr. Bishop to, for him to criticize my math. I, it isn't the point of your math. In other words, it's not a question that the pandemic doesn't become serious once it crosses a magic line. Although I made the point that the number of deaths, if extrapolated from that pandemic in the United States, would be 250,000, a measure we have not reached. The point is, 
and it was made well, I think, by Mr. Burns' comments, that we have faced, this is not an unprecedented danger. And it is not the Spanish flu of 1918 in which 50 million died worldwide in a much smaller world population. This is a serious, serious risk, but it is not defining, and our response to it need not act as if it is. And I would just say to the gentleman, I would, did Mr. Morelli, you want me to yield to you? Okay. I would say to the gentleman that the rule that is before us is very proportional in terms of it would allow you, if you so chose, to come here every week, do your thing, sit in that chair, but it also would allow Alcee Hastings to offer his perspective and his knowledge on behalf of the people he represents. And for all of you to suggest that he shouldn't be given that opportunity in this pandemic, which is very serious, you admit that, uh, I think is just fundamentally flawed and ultimately leaves a lot of people without representation, which is the whole point of our government. And with that, I yield back Mr. to the Chairman. Chair. Dr. Burgess, you, you have questions, sir? Thank you. Uh, thanks to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, Mr. Pence, let me just add my praise to uh, uh, what you just heard. Your brother during his time of service here was probably the best conference chairman that, that I've served with, and uh, we honor his service here. And we miss him, but we're glad he's where he is today, so please convey that. We, we like this Mr. Pence, too. Yes, we do. <laughs> May I? Uh, and I really don't know who, to whom to address this, uh, probably either Mr. Jordan or, or Mr. Byrne. As I read the rule that we're considering today, um, yes, there's a time limit on the, on the denotation that this is an emergency and, and all, all of this is triggered, but there's an extension available, and that extension is arrived at by the speaker in consultation with the sergeant at arms, the attending physician, two individuals that I hold in very high regard, but they're not constitutional offices, so we're putting some power in the hands of some people that are really not accountable to, to the people, and this being the people's house, that seems to me to be counter to what we should be about. Do either of you have a thought on that? Go ahead, Pat. Well, I think, you've, I think you said it correctly. Um, the rules we're operating in this house right now will, will all go out January 3rd at noon when the new Congress comes in. But between now and then, there could be this perpetual running 45-day extension of this, all the way up until the very end. And there's no check on that. I mean, it's up to the Speaker. And one person, and I know the Speaker's an important position in the House, but one person can, can get this thing just roll over and over and over to the end of the Congress. <coughs> and I do think that's unconstitutional. But more importantly, I think it does great damage to the institution of the House. Yeah. I, I agree with my colleague and, and appreciate the gentleman for raising, uh, raising the point. I, I am very nervous about people whose names never go on a ballot making all kinds of policy. We're seeing it all across the country. Health commissioners in states dictating policy and the General Assembly of those respective states doesn't get to weigh in and now the U.S. Congress is going to follow a similar pattern? That, that is scary stuff. We don't, I mean, and I'm like you, I have the utmost respect for these people, but their name's not on a ballot. They're not constitutionally elected. A again. When, when you start playing these kind of games, I mean, the, the previous gentleman mentioned all kinds of math, all kinds of math extrapolations he did, but the math in the bill he didn't talk about. The math in the bill is real simple. A member can have 10 proxies in their pocket, which means, as I've said now three times, 22 people on the House floor can make policy for the country. And oh, then it gets, then it gets reapproved. We want to continue to do this for, for three people that you talked about, two of them who aren't elected. How does that, how is that government by the people, for the people, and, and we the people being, being served? Th this is so scary where we are heading. So darn scary. And, and I appreciate the fact that some members can't, can't be here today who we wish were. I appreciate that. But the Constitution is the foundational document that we got to follow. So you are, you are so right, Dr. Burgess, and I appreciate you, appreciate you for raising that point. Thank you. Uh, and let me just say I, I appreciate the fact that we're having this hearing today. Uh, I think it's important uh, that 
we be seen as being on the job? Uh, it has been extremely uncomfortable all of these weeks, many weeks that we've remained home and, and out of our place of service, which is here in the, in the capital of the United States. I, I just cannot shake the notion that the People's House was never meant to be this passive. And unfortunately, that seems to be what has devolved. We're having a bill tomorrow on the floor that none of us had anything to do with. And we're just supposed to accept it and rubber stamp it. That's not why we were elected. That's not why we ran for office. It can't be why we ran for office. Yes, sir. The gentleman, not only was the House not supposed to be this passive, it was supposed to be the most active. When the founders put this experiment together we call America, it was supposed to be the most engaged, the most active. That, 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 again, this is scary where the, this unelected, I mean, we, we have seen this the last couple of weeks with information that's come public about certain investigations and things being done, done by people whose names were not on a ballot. That is scary stuff. Again, I appreciate that. All right, don't lose it. I think, gentlemen, I'll, I'll yield back. Thank you, and again, uh, that's voice. why I think we should pass this, uh, this bill, because we can then, uh, you know, remove any excuse why we can't be meeting on a regular basis, uh, no matter where anybody might be from. And let me just say that the alternative to this is to rely on the Republican standing rule, which is to, you, well, you could literally redefine a quorum as two people. Um, and again, uh, I mean, that is, I, uh, my, my friends here, uh, many of them supported it. I, I did not at the time. Uh, but that is, what the, that is what the standing rule is right now that my friends passed uh, post 9-11. Uh, and I think that is unacceptable. Uh, what we are proposing here is a way for people to come. If you feel comfortable coming back, if you can come back, if you don't represent a hot spot, um, then you can come back. And by the way, uh, th this idea that, um, that we should de-emphasize the importance of medical advice, uh, that somehow they were unelected officials and therefore they're not as important as as the elected official. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I, 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 I want to make decisions on how we combat this virus based on the best medical advice that exists. I want to have it be made by people who know what they're talking about, uh, not by politicians who have no, many of them who have no medical degrees. Uh, we have heard some of the suggestions that have been put forward by the president uh, that, you know, leave your head spinning. Um, but quite frankly, the advice that he should follow and the advice that all of us should follow is by the experts, those who know what they're talking about when it comes to how you deal with a virus like this. Mr. Raskin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your really dedicated and impressive leadership through this tough time. And I also want to salute Mr. Cole. I got to tell you, Mr. Cole, I spoke to a, a class at Grinnell College and you got a lot of fans there. I don't know if you're a graduate of Grinnell, but they, they wanted me to send their very best to you and said that they're proud of you. So, Mr. Cole uh, posed an interesting question to the panel about whether all of you concurred that you think that the proposed rule here is unconstitutional. And each one of you in Syriatim repeated the idea that you thought it was unconstitutional. Now, Mr. Byrne has... Um, candidly volunteered that the current rule adopted by a Republican Congress is unconstitutional, which would allow two members to constitute a quorum. I just want to know, do all five of you also agree that the current rule is unconstitutional? Perhaps I could start with you, Mr. Pence. I'm afraid I don't uh, know enough about that to answer. Oh, well, you were expressing your outrage about this proposal, but the, the current rule would allow two people to constitute. Yeah, my, my answer, I, w I want to be clear about a couple of things. One is, and I agree with the chairman, you know, it's health and safety first. And for any members that feel that they shouldn't come here or can't come here, I, I, I completely understand and I support. I'm an individual that volunteered to join the Marine Corps, volunteered to go ashore in a hot, in a hot situation, and I volunteered to run for this position, okay? And my constituents have told me that I should be here. That's my answer to you. 
Okay, well, I'll come back to you about volunteering because you make a very interesting point there. But Mr. Jordan, what about you? Do you agree the current rules on constitutional? As, as, as the gentleman well knows, there, uh, my, my colleagues in the Freedom Caucus have come to the floor and objected to unanimous consent to pass certain legislation. So you agree, so, you agree so with Mr. Burnett? We, we've Burn always had a problem with that. Uh, so that. you agree, I, I'm just a yes or no question. Do you agree with Mr. Burnett? It's unconstitutional? Yeah, I, I don't like the rule. I, that, I, we've been very clear about that. You agree it's unconstitutional? Okay. Is that right? Okay. Mr. Byrne, you presumably still agree that it's unconstitutional? Yes, sir. Okay. I think if you're going to be consistent, you have to follow yep. what the Constitution requires, and what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Mr. Sometimes Bishop, do you believe— we consistent around here, but I try to be consistent. Mr. Bishop, do you believe the current rule is unconstitutional, adopted yeah, under I mean, Republican Congress? carefully, but I find Mr. Byrne's comments and those that have been made by the chairman on the point uh, uh, persuasive. I, it probably is unconstitutional. Okay. And do you agree as well? I would like to make uh, in reference to the short answer is there's the yes, but understanding that commanders command, leaders lead, advisors advise, and on the advice of my attorney off here to my right, you know, I, I, I take his advice because that's his job. My job as a commander, as a leader, is that you get the results that you were missioned to give. Okay, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of you. I think you did a great job of explaining your stance. I agree with you totally. Um, and not to belabor this, we've. I'm just going to yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morelli. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just briefly, and I thank the gentleman for uh, for their testimony, Mr. Perlmutter took us through a math lesson. I, I just, uh, at the risk of, uh, of uh, boring people with a math lesson, I just, it occurs to me that the, the testimony by each of the members suggests that we live in a binary state here. It's either on or off, binary being two choices, on or off, yes or no, black or white, work or not work. And I think the beauty of this resolution and the uh, the wonder of technology has given us an opportunity to continue to work even as we respect the guidance of uh, the house physician the guidance of uh, science and technology guidance of other ind individuals in prior pandemics and prior crises perhaps um, those were binary choices work or not work come to washington not come to washington frankly i would just say parenthetically i've worked harder in the last two months probably sitting in my uh, home office than I may have in the previous uh, year. This has been, and I, I assume this is true of everybody, not only on the panel, but uh, members of our committee, that we're all working incredibly hard to represent constituents and communities that are under uh, significant uh, stress. So we are no longer in this binary box where it's work or not work. I appreciate Mr. Burns' uh, view on the Constitution, and frankly, if we get to a point where the question of constitutionality needs to be heard, that would go in front of the courts and they would make that judgment. But I think it's pretty clear Article 1 suggests that the Congress is uh, the master of its houses when it comes to the rules. I do want to just point out, and I, I, I hate to disagree with you, Mr. Jordan, but you make it sound as though under the proposed rule that a member could gather up proxies like you might do in a committee fight back in your local town and cast them however you choose to do. The rules are very explicit on how the votes will be cast. This is not by the person who holds the proxy, it's the person who gives the proxy. They have to give exact instructions on every single motion or vote in front of them. So, it, 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 you know, I, I appreciate what you're suggesting. I just don't think it's borne out by the Gentleman text you? of the, I will. So then there's a motion made on the floor. What happens? During that motion. They, 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 did they get to vote for the 10 proxies in their pocket? No. They do not. They, cannot. they do not. And the testimony Which by, is my point. 22 members then could be making law. No, they could, no, no, they, they no. could decide. Well, let me, let me answer if I might. In the, in the rule, and the majority leader testified uh, to this as well, is that if a motion comes forward, each member who has a designated proxy must communicate to that proxy holder what his or her view is on the motion in front of the House. So it's not the holder of the proxy who uses independent judgment, it is the person who is given the proxy who gives explicit instructions, and it is repeated in a number of different instances in, in the proposed rule. So it is not the 22 people holding the proxies, and I appreciate 
what you're saying uh, about the fact that you can hold up to 10. But they may not exercise independent judgment. We, we had this conversation earlier. It would be a violation of the rule, and a member would be subject to sanctions by the House should they vote in a way that was not consistent with the instructions they had been given. So I, I just make that point only to suggest that this is not an attempt to concentrate power. It's, a, it's an attempt to continue to conduct business under the most difficult circumstances we have faced in our lifetime. And uh, I would also suggest that the, the question of whether the speaker would choose, this is, the, the speaker may, uh, upon the, uh, the uh, designation by the Sergeant at Arms in consultation with the House Physician, uh, uh, during this pandemic only, during a, a coronavirus, novel coronavirus in this Congress only, may designate for 45 days. I will note, though, 45 days is the, is the amount indicated, but it also suggests on page three that even during any, whether it's the original 45 day or an additional 45 days, it's the covered period the speaker or the designee receives further notification from the Sergeant of Arms in consultation with the attending physician that the public health emergency due to the coronavirus is no longer in effect. The speaker shall terminate the covered period. It's not as though the speaker had, it doesn't say may, it says shall. So immediately upon, so if the speaker, as I read the rule, if the speaker says on, on May 1st we have a pandemic, I've been advised by the Sergeant at Arms in consultation with the attending physician to put this temporary rule in place, uh, and then two weeks later, before the 45 days has terminated, uh, if uh, you receive, if the, if the speaker receives another, um, a certification or notification from the Sergeant Arms that the emergency no longer exists, it is terminated, shall terminate, so it wouldn't even be 45 days in length. But the, but the point I want to make, and I, I appreciate the, the concern people have, but this is not, I fear at times this is being somehow equated with weakness or strength, that our, our desire to meet uh, through technological means or our desire to conduct business by proxy is a sign somehow of weakness. And I would just you know, suggest that the Vice President of the United States and the President right now don't meet personally. It's been, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not making that up. I don't have inside information. I just read the newspaper. The Vice President has said he will not meet with the President for a period of time. I don't know if that's 14 days. I don't know what it will be. I, but I suggest to you that I suspect they're talking on the telephone and they're communicating on an ongoing basis and they are conducting business. And I don't think I would never say, and I don't believe that the Vice President is weak. I don't think the President is weak. I don't think they're fearful. I think they're just, you know, exhibiting the appropriate distancing that, uh, that healthcare professionals have suggested. So I, I, I appreciate what people have said. I have expressed my concerns about precedent, but I think the narrow nature of this resolution uh, and the arguments the that have been yield? made, I, I don't think are, uh, are compelling. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, the function of the executive and the function of the legislative branch of government are fundamentally different. Yeah, no, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't suggesting it's the same. All I'm saying is the suggestion. We yeah. have to legislate, and under the Constitution, the intent is we legislate while we're physically present. That's, what, that's why they have the command in there that a, less than a quorum can actually force people to come to where we meet. I also think that's good policy. Because as I said earlier, I think we get better policy when we go through regular order, everybody's in the room, we tash it out, majority wins, that's the way it goes, I get that. I, I don't think you can equate whether the president and vice president are physically within the same room with one another to what our job is, because our job is fundamentally different. No, I, I want to say one other thing. Yeah. You, you said something, and I hope I, I, you didn't misunderstand me here. I know we're working hard back in our districts. I talked to plenty of my colleagues. We are doing everything we can to take care of our constituents. But under the Constitution, the part of our job that is legislating, we have to do here. Well, I, I would just respond, and I wasn't, I appreciate what you're saying about our different functions, and I agree with you, we do have different functions, but I, I feel as though, and maybe this hasn't been said directly, but I, I will say I get the, um, the impression that there's sort of a suggestion that there's some weakness here, and I was simply suggesting that I don't think the President and Vice President are acting in a weak manner by not meeting together, and they certainly are using technology to continue to do their jobs. And I, I mean, and I don't think the, the, the gentleman would disagree that clearly the Constitution intended for the Congress to make its own rules. Um, and even the question of the quorum under emergencies has been suggested could be smaller. So I just think, 
I, the, the point that I wanted to make is I think it is not a decision of yes, we come to work, and even under your definition, I'm, even if we, if, even if you take the view that work doesn't mean work, but it work in terms of the Congress means that we're voting. Um, I, I believe that it is not, we don't need to be captives or hostage to the idea that in an earlier age there was no physical way, there was no technological way for us to come together, and I would suggest that only under the very narrow circumstances anticipated by this resolution could we continue to work on behalf of the American public. But I appreciate it. I yield back. Thank you. And I just, I think you also raised the point. I, I don't think there's any constitutional uh, issues revolving, uh, uh, revolving around whether or not committees can meet um, virtually. I mean, that uh, the Constitution doesn't create the committees. The Congress creates the committees. So, I mean, hopefully we can all agree on that. Uh, Ms. Shalala. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just um, I want to make a comment about the um, uh, suggestion that uh, scientists and public health people are making policy in this country. They are not. We're the policy makers. The governors, the mayors are the policy makers. They seek advice during a crisis like this one with a vicious virus from uh, experienced scientists and uh, public health officials. And they can take that advice or not take that advice. And all across the country, there's evidence that some people are taking the advice and some people aren't taking the advice. But all of the scientists I know um, and the public health people in this country, and many of them I've worked with for years, are very careful not to be policy makers. They're particularly careful just to present the evidence and not to substitute uh, for the policy makers. And um, I think that uh, this country, which has invested hundreds of billions of dollars over the years in building one of the great scientific enterprises, the National Institutes of Health, the CDC, the FDA, thank God we have them now. I yield back. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank you for your patience. It's always wonderful to see you, and you can go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, and um, so does anyone else, any other members wish to testify on H.R. 965? Seeing none, this closes the original jurisdiction hearing on H. Res. 965. The measure before the committee is H. Res. 965. Without objection, the resolution is considered as read and will be open for amendment at any point. Uh, are there any amendments to this resolution? The gentleman from o o o o the, the, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall, is recognized uh, uh, for his amendment. The, uh, I very much appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the uh, uh, at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number one to H. Res. Sorry, 986, offered by Mr. Woodall of Georgia. The, Mr. Chairman, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is an uh, amendment uh, to to make sure that this resolution does not go into effect until the clerk of the house has certified that there's a system in place that securely uh, receives and validates the proxy uh, designations. Uh, the majority has done everything in its power to move as as expeditiously uh, as possible uh, in this uh, in this direction. And I recognize we have constitutional uh, disagreements uh, about uh, this novel process. And we have disagreements about who should be the decision makers uh, as we move forward in this, uh, in this process. Uh, you will recall, as a part of our roundtable discussion with the clerk and the parliamentarian, one thing the clerk consistently mentioned uh, was that her most important role uh, here in the House as it relates uh, to uh, remote voting would be to authenticate. Uh, she said it over and over again, authenticate, 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 uh, to ensure uh, that the person uh, is uh, who they say they uh, are. I recognize the distinction between remote voting and proxy uh, voting, but it seems to be a small step in the right direction, uh, since we all have an interest uh, in making sure uh, that this uh, system is, is uh, while it may be novel, uh, certainly uh, none of us want it uh, to be fraudulent. Um, I would ask uh, that uh, we add the amendment that says we shall not move forward without an affirmative 
uh, certification from the clerk that the House has in place a system to securely receive and validate these proxy designations. Thank you. You heard the gentleman's amendment. Any questions? I mean, any comments? Um, I, I would urge a no vote. I, I, we've been in contact with the clerk's office. We feel confident uh, that we will uh, have a system in place that uh, adheres to all the principles that uh, we all care about. Uh, adding another layer of bureaucracy, uh, I don't think makes a lot of sense. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I know it, it's been over a month, but when you were interviewed on the, on the CARES Act, I know you recall, you said, I think it's not only important that Congress be competent, but that we should also look competent going forward. And I don't think a $2 trillion bill should be a, should be a practice run on a new form of, of remote voting. I know how concerned you are. I know you don't want to move forward if the clerk says, I'm not ready yet. What is the harm in having the, the office of the House that is, is in charge of, of voting integrity certify that we have voting integrity before we move move forward. I, I just I don't understand I, the harm, and if there is a harm, I, 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 I appreciate being corrected. Yeah, I, I trust I trust that my staff have been working on this, and I feel confident that we're in good measure. So the vote is now on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Be a chair. The noes have it. Can I roll call, please, Mr. Chairman? Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli. No. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman. No. We we'll report the total. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Four yeas, six nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, an amendment at the desk. I uh, would ask that the reading be suspended. Yeah, I could report the amendment. Okay. Amendment to House Resolution 965, offered by Mr. Cole of Oklahoma. You would ask. The gentleman thank, is recommended. Thank you very much. I'll be quick about this because uh, I think the fate will be quick as well. But uh, uh, I, uh, my amendment simply uh, would. Uh, Change resolution say that proxy voting cannot be authorized without concurrence of the minority leader. And, uh, you know, I know there is some concern, and I think it's a very legitimate concern on a part of the majority that uh, this we, we live in a majoritarian institution. I respect that. Uh, but this is an extraordinary measure for extraordinary times. And I know, Mr. Chairman, you'll recall when we had our discussion over this particular item, I think the majority, or excuse me, the minority leader showed a great deal of flexibility. He was very sensitive to the fact that this was a power that if it was used inappropriately, you know, would, would uh, have him effectively deciding what came on the floor, as the majority leader appropriately does. That's not something he wanted to do. So he asked, he said, look, we'd give it up for a month at a time or a time period, or if you guys can find a, a, a set of matrix that under these circumstances, you know, it would sort of automatically kick in. Uh, I, so I just say that I think, uh, well, I don't expect my friends to agree with this. This is an extraordinary moment. We've never done this before. We ought to do it bipartisan. I think the minority leader has shown that uh, uh, he would be willing on most occasions, uh, again, to be extraordinarily respectful in the use of this. So with that, I would urge passage of the amendment. I, I thank the gentleman, and again, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I guess my response to this was that, uh, you know, when, when uh, you know, I, we obviously think that this is necessary at this moment. And when I asked the majority, I mean, the minority leader specifically whether he would concur, he said no. So basically, if we would agree to this, we're basically killing this uh, for now. So I would uh, urge a no vote. Uh, the vote now is on the uh, amendment from the gentleman from Oklahoma. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 You pin the chair, the noes have it. Roll call. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. 
four yeas, seven nays. The amendment is not agreed to. And let me just say for the record, uh, Mrs. Ms. Scanlon is not here right now because she's presiding over the uh, House floor, so she will be back shortly. Further amendments, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, second uh, bite at the apple, maybe uh, not so uh, difficult. Uh, my amendment, uh, well, I'll amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk report the amendment. Amendment number three to House Resolution 965, offered by Mr. Cole of Oklahoma. <coughs> Would ask to dispense with the reading, Mr. Chairman. objection. Thank you very much. Uh, basically, this just says, let, okay, let's try this for 45 days. Uh, and let's give this extraordinary power uh, to the Speaker, which we've never done before in the 230-odd hist history of this institution. If it works well, then let's extend it, but it would require a two-thirds vote. In other words, some bipartisan buy-in. So we'll give it a trial run, uh, come back, and, and see if we can find bipartisan consensus. I know, uh, Mr. Chairman, you've mentioned a number of times that uh, uh, you've talked to some of our members that, that uh, probably are supportive. I think if they saw it work for 45 days, that might uh, encourage them to vote uh, in, in that direction. And uh, again, I think uh, that way we would uh, uh, bring what you want to do about with a bipartisan vote as opposed to what's probably going to happen tomorrow, party line vote. So I just offer that for your consideration. I appreciate it. Um, you heard the gentleman's amendment. The vote is on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those no, no. Any of the chair that knows have it. I have a roll call. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. <coughs> Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin. No. Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli. No. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui. No. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mrs. Lesko. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. I was Ms. Scanlon reported? Ms. Scanlon is not recorded. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Member, uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chair, I have an amendment to this. Uh, clerk report the amendment. Amendment number four to House Resolution 965, offered by Mr. Woodall of Georgia. Ms. Chairman, you heard uh, of most of the uh, concern about constitutionality uh, reflected on the Constitution's uh, requirement of a, of a quorum. Uh, my amendment uh, would very simply uh, uh, say uh, move forward with the other uh, issues that you want to move forward with, but let's not have proxy voting uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, a part of declaring a, a quorum. Uh, there's no doubt uh, that litigation would be involved. It matters not. Uh, that our last uh, uh, crisis uh, quorum uh, language was passed by Republican majorities, passed by Democratic uh, majorities, done in a bipartisan uh, way. It still would have been the subject of constitutional review had it ever been uh, utilized. Uh, you don't just anticipate this might be utilized. Uh, you believe that it will be uh, uh, utilized. Uh, I ask that we, we remove uh, that uh, most obvious of the constitutional uh, hurdles uh, so that it's not distracting from the other work that we both agree needs to be done. I, I th thank Mr. you, Chairman, for his amendment. We, I, I, we have consulted with many constitutional scholars who feel that, uh, in fact, in fact, what we are proposing is uh, is constitutional. Um, I think whatever we do, uh, somebody will challenge it. Um, but I feel confident that this will uh, withstand any challenge, and so I would urge a no vote. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, well, Mr. Uh, uh, Raskin. Could I speak a word on the yes. motion? Um, I think something fascinating has emerged from today's proceedings, which is that we seem to have a pretty strong bipartisan consensus, or at least among the Republican witnesses who came to testify, that the current rule adopted under Republican majority is unconstitutional because it allows for two members to constitute a quorum. By enacting this rule, we're going to dramatically expand the number of people who are required to create a quorum. So it's it's a dramatic improvement over the current rule, which is now um, reputedly unconstitutional, according to most of the people who've spoken about it today. So this at least is a is moving us in the right direction because it says a quorum is exactly that. It's a quorum. It's a majority of the people, a majority of the people who are participating, who are casting their votes, and who are intending to participate in the proceedings as opposed to the current rule, which says that two people alone, excluding the other 433, can constitute a quorum. So 
I, I rise in opposition to that amendment. Thank you, Mr. Woodall. Mr. Chairman, just to, just to dispel that because it's become a common narrative. Uh, number one, it's not a Republican uh, 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 rules uh, change. It was enacted first by a Republican Congress in 2005. It was enacted next by a Democratic Congress in 2007, next by a Democratic Congress in 2009, uh, and then by the Congress I was elected in in, in 2011. So it's, it's been a shared priority, just as this is a shared priority, how to get Congress back to work in the unthinkable event of a catastrophe. And what it said is, have a quorum call that's open for 72 hours and allow every member possible to get there. And then, if you can't get a real quorum then, have the House open for another 24 hours for a quorum call and let that number, however many people can get there then in 96 hours, let that count in this unthinkable catastrophic situation as your new quorum. So to suggest that only two of us survived a mass casualty accident, as unthinkable as that is, yes, that provision would allow the only two surviving members of the United States House of Representatives to conduct business, not because we thought that was the best answer, but because that was the best we could do in those times. I wasn't elected at that time. But to suggest that having two people, in your example, uh, run the House of Representatives is unconstitutional, but having 22 people uh, run it uh, does constitute a quorum, that's just laugh that's laughable. Either, either the House is able to change the rules in both cases, or the House is able to change the, the definition of quorum in, in neither case. But the, the, this very discussion demonstrates that it's going to be the topic of, of legal conversation. I would posit that the work we do together over the next 60 to 90 days is going to be incredibly uh, consequential work for the nation. And I just don't know why, if this is where we've laser focused on where the biggest problem is, we would, we would put our constituents uh, and our policies uh, at that uh, risk. And I, I thank the chairman for his indulgence. Mr. Chairman, could I just be entitled a moment to respond to Mr. Woodall on that? Um, the first point we got to make is that this is what the Supreme Court considers a political question. It would invoke the political question doctrine, meaning that it's up to the House of Representatives. It's our rule. That's why this existing rule adopted under a Republican Congress and succeeding Congresses of both Republican and Democratic character have kept it in there, has stayed on the books despite the fact that we had the, the testimony of the outraged witnesses that this is unconstitutional. They were more outraged about the proposal than the current rule, but nonetheless, uh, their outrage presumably flows to any rule governing uh, outside of their interpretation of what a quorum requirement is. Now, here's why I think there is a, a big qualitative difference between what we're doing and what the existing rule is, which has been fine with most of the people because people haven't focused on it. That rule says that two people could end up constituting a quorum um, of the entire House of Representatives, which is totally antithetical to the majority quorum requirement, whereas what we're saying is a majority can be constituted of people who call up and directly give their proxy to another member. So I understand those who are saying it's got to be physical voting. I think we already crossed that bridge when we went to electronic voting. There were people at that time who were saying it was unconstitutional to have electronic voting. They said, no, it calls for the eyes and the nays. It has to be a spoken vote, or it's got to be a written vote. But no, we went to electronic voting, and the republic hasn't collapsed. The critical point is that the intent of the member to cast his or her legislative will is vindicated by the system that we've adopted in our rule. And the current proposed rule is a dramatic improvement over the two people can constitute a quorum. Now, if what you're saying is, well, that's just an emergency circumstances, then you are conceding that emergency circumstances can change Congress's treatment of the quorum. And we're, we're changing our treatment of it in a much more mild and modest way than allowing two members to speak for the entire body. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The, to be fair, Mr. Chairman, yeah. uh, again, we were these were mass casualty events that we were responding to. The, 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 if, if I'm dead, the quorum requirement for the House declines. It's not hypothetical, it's actual. Uh, and, and that is what this language, is, as, as sobering as that is, anticipated, is that if 433 of us are dead, right. then two of us can constitute a quorum. And it, that, that's, that's an outrageous uh, 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 outcome for the United States of America, an unthinkable outcome. But, but this was the best we could do with what we well, had to, uh, to work with. All, I'm, I'm just... Uh, was the general yield? I, 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 I think he may be mischaracterizing 
the, uh, the, what happened in 20, 2005 a little bit, because it doesn't contemplate that everyone has to be dead for there to be a, a, a diminished quorum. I mean, it could be for a whole number of reasons, reasons including contagion. The chairman misunderstood me. If 433 of us are dead, two right, people right. does in fact constitute right. a quorum? Right, right. But I'm simply, but, but I, you know, but I think that he raises a good point, uh, and that is sometimes, uh, you know, the standing rules get passed on from Congress to Congress. But I think uh, enough people in a bipartisan way have raised issues about this that whoever the next chairman of the Rules Committee ought to take a good look at it before we, uh, before we pass the next set of rules. All right? Uh, you, you've heard the gentleman's amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. Can no. you share the no's have it? Gentlemen, want a roll call? Please. Yeah. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin, no. Mr. Askin, no. Mr. no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Court uh, report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. No, it is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Woodall. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in, given the committee's reluctance to accept that last amendment, uh, I have an amendment at the, uh, at the desk. A clerk report the amendment. Amendment number five to House Resolution 965, offered by Mr. Woodall of Georgia. The, uh, I recognize uh, that, there, that you have consulted with uh, legal scholars on this. I also recognize that most of the Supreme Court decisions I read are 5-4, and so legal scholars can disagree. Uh, and it matters who has the five and who has the four. Um, uh, what uh, my amendment uh, would uh, suggest is that since the House General Counsel is the one that will be representing the House uh, in uh, these legal contests that are undoubtedly to follow, that the House General Counsel present its theory for defending proxy voting in court uh, to the uh, uh, bipartisan legal advisory group and explain what that rationale is. Here we are, the Committee of Jurisdiction, we didn't have a single constitutional scholar, with the uh, uh, privileged exception of Mr. Raskin, uh, come and testify before the committee uh, uh, today. Uh, we, we didn't have that, uh, that uh, opportunity. Uh, I know everyone shares this concern. It's not a partisan issue. It's a, it's a House's will uh, issue. And so this amendment would simply uh, uh, require uh, that the uh, bipartisan uh, legal advisory uh, group uh, be presented uh, with that legal theory, as would the committees of, of jurisdiction, uh, so that uh, all uh, members can uh, move forward with confidence uh, that uh, our, our policy decisions will be respected by the courts. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I oppose the amendment. Um, I think that there is, uh, I mean, we, every legal scholar we have talked to has not seen any constitutional issues with regard to what we're trying to do. I think that uh, my colleague submitted a, a letter from some guy, Mr. Strand, who I don't even—I don't think is a legal scholar. I don't think he's a lawyer. But uh, in Mr. Any event, Mr. Chairman, yeah. if every lawyer you talked to had the same opinion, I, I'm very suspicious of, me, uh, of me, what is let, of what has happened. Let me also, uh, since we're talking congressional scholars, let me uh, uh, also uh, introduce and ask unanimous consent to uh, uh, include the statement of Norm Ornstein, who we all know is a congressional right. scholar. But uh, but in terms of legal scholars and constitutional experts, um, I think we feel uh, very strongly that we're on solid ground. And, and so I would urge a no vote on the gentleman's amendment. To be fair, Mr. Chairman, my amendment only asks that you make your confidence known to the rest of us, right. not just with, with pros, uh, but with substantive legal arguments, and not to those of us who are not constitutional scholars, but to the bipartisan legal advisory. And if there was going to be a challenge, that would not, uh, that would not um, probably uh, negate a challenge from an outside group. So um, I, I look at this as, as more of a delay tactic than anything else, so I would urge a no vote. Uh, you've heard the, uh, the vote is now on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. No. Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, 
Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report to total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Before I go to the next uh, amendment, I just want to ask unanimous consent to put into the record some statements that uh, and letters that have been submitted in support of uh, this, uh, this bill by Mr. Jeffries, Ms. Custer, Mr. Langerman, Mr. Peters, Mr. Thompson of California. Mr. Han, uh, Mr. Kildee, Perlmutter, Levin, Lowenthal, and Lawrence, and Mr. Cardenas, Ms. Sanchez, and Mr. Vela. Further amendments. Mr. Chairman, are you saying the current House rules allow for the participation of those members even though they're not physically present here with us today? I'm, ask, uh, I'm asking that their statements be put into the record uh -huh. uh, like we do all the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does the gentleman object? I do not object. I, I just recognize how, how effective the House rules are at, yeah. at solving those issues. Uh, do you have another amendment? Uh, not just okay, Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Let's report the uh, amendment. Amendment number six to House Resolution 965. Move, move to dispense with the reading. Without objection. So, amendment number six is simply a good government amendment. This requires the Committee on House Administration to issue a yearly report on voting integrity that describes any errors that were encountered with proxy voting. We all know about the law of unintended consequences. Things sometimes turn out differently than what we anticipated. And again, this is a good government check, uh, an oversight check on uh, what we're enacting with this rule. And I urge an I vote. And I guess it's accepted. Good enough. Uh, you heard on. The, I mean, I... You know, I mean, look, I, I think the best oversight we can do is the committees of jurisdiction, including the, rule, including the Rules Committee, uh, ought to do hearings as this goes on to see whether it's being implemented uh, the way that uh, we've intended. Um, and again, uh, hopefully, hopefully, again, uh, that the President is right that this virus will mysteriously disappear and we won't have to worry about any of this stuff. Uh, but in the meantime, I would urge a no vote. So the Vote now is on the Burgess Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can you cheer? The noes have it. Gentlemen, want to roll call? Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report to total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments. Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have an amendment. Clerk report the amendment. Amendment number seven to House Resolution. Would ask the reading be discussed with Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we obviously be dealing with a lot of legislation in the next uh, few months, NDAA, probes, things we've talked about today. My amendment uh, would limit the use of proxy voting uh, to literally uh, things that related to the coronavirus uh, crisis. We would treat other legislation the way we normally would and, and proceed. Uh, this amendment is actually the same language uh, that my uh, Democratic colleagues included in their first version proxy voting three weeks ago. So all we're asking here is to do what uh, what you were positioned to do at least three weeks ago. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, I yield to Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I oppose the, uh, the amendment by the gentleman. I opposed it when it was in the uh, initial draft of the rule uh, for at least a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we're in a pandemic. Uh, there's through the consultation with the doctor and the sergeant at arms. Two, uh, it, it had all sorts of limiting factors, the previous did, but really the, the thing that concerned me is that there will be votes that have to be taken, uh, whether they were appropriations votes or NDAA or those kinds of votes that have to be taken, and we're still in the pandemic. That was the one reason that I disagreed with the rule as it was written a few weeks ago, and two, we already know this virus mutates, and by the end of the year, it could be COVID-20, in which case, we still got a problem. So I felt the approach that was taken in the earlier draft was unreasonably limited. 
It's still very uh, limited, as Mr. Morelli pointed out when he talked about the novel coronavirus uh, section as in the beginning, but we have to conduct our business. And I think this, complete, this would undercut and needlessly limit it. Uh, and I don't want to dis disenfranchise all those people in this representative government on big issues. So I would urge a no vote on the gentleman's motion. Mr. Cole. Sure. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, just to my friend, and he's perfectly right, he's been consistent in his view on this, but I would say uh, we'd be more than happy, number one, to make it just coronavirus in general so it was not confined if, if there was a particular mutation. That's something we're willing to do. And again, uh, I'm going to do this for uh, this emergency. This is actually what we're going to be focusing on for the most part, obviously, and I think we're going to be doing it for some years. But I think, again, this limits it. We're just asking you to uh, be where you were three weeks ago, and if you can't be there as a, as a majority, I just point out for the record, it sort of does suggest there's a slippery slope danger here, because we've already moved from where the majority was three weeks ago to a different position today. So. Three weeks from if, now, if, we yet another movement. I might Mr. respond. Uh, we didn't bring it up. I was going to oppose it at that point. I had spoken to a number of members and seek to have it stricken. So I think uh, we didn't, we weren't there. Maybe you guys should have accepted it back then. Uh, but I was going to oppose it, and I know, I think a couple others at least would have opposed it. So I, oh. I yield back. I urge a no vote on the gentleman's I, I don't think we had the ability to accept it. This was in the majority's, uh, uh, you know, purview, and this is where you were three weeks ago. You moved someplace else in three weeks. So I just make that point to suggest once you let this particular, uh, you know, rabbit out of the box, it, it can run a lot of different directions, including ones you didn't expect three weeks ago. Feel back, Mr. Chairman. I just say that, um, you know, uh, during these last three weeks, we've listened to a lot of members on both sides of the aisle. We've taken some ideas from Republicans. We've heard from our members. And, when, and so, you know, I mean, uh, you know, our, the consensus on our side is that we have a lot of work to do uh, that are not, it's not just coronavirus related. And so uh, I would urge a no vote. The vote is now on the Cole Amendment. Those in favor say aye. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Who? Might I just yeah, make okay. one additional comment? Uh, just as it relates to it, it seems to me that even if we, if we adopted this amendment, the question of constitutionality, which has been raised, which we don't agree with you on, but constitutionality would still be in play. This doesn't make it more constitutional because you identify only things related to COVID-19. So I just note that, you know, from our perspective, uh, it, 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 it uh, rises or falls on the question of whether a pandemic and a national emergency exists, but not with what kind of legislation well, will be taken out. I'm from Oklahoma. Thank you. With all due respect to my friend, I didn't suggest it made it more constitutional. Frankly, no. I have serious okay. constitutional doubts about this whole course regardless. But it does make it more limited and I think more traditional. And uh, look, from an institutional standpoint, I think if you're going to do something emergent, and, and one of the things, and I think appropriately, that you have pointed out in the course of the debate, uh, and, and you in particular, uh, Mr. Morelli, is that, look, this is very limited. This is 45-day increments. We're trying to be, this is just another limitation. So I don't think it's, you may disagree with it, but again, it wasn't advanced as a constitutional argument. And it's just another limitation. Yeah. Go back. The vote is now on the uh, gentleman uh, from Oklahoma's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can you chair the no's have it? No, Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. We'll report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. No, it's not agreed to. Um, before we go to the next one, I want to ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a letter from Mark Pocan, uh, co chair of the Progressive Caucus, in favor of our underlying bill here today. Uh, further amendments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk, report the amendment. Amendment number eight to House Resolution 965, offered by Mr. Woodall of Georgia. The, Mr. Chairman, this uh, amendment uh, respects what Mr. Perlmutter uh, had to say. There is some must-do work that has to happen in this institution, and if we're going to go down this uh, constitutionally perilous uh, path, we should be getting 
uh, those highest priority items done. This would say for those bills that are not high priority uh, uh, items, those suspension bills uh, that are non-COVID uh, related, that we should not use proxy voting then. Whether we're back for a day in, in the month of June or a week in the month of June or all of the month of June, we can do those suspension bills uh, uh, in, uh, in person that are non COVID related. Again, thinking about legal challenges coming down the road uh, for those bills that are, are, are not the most uh, expansive but are the most numerous in our congressional workload, let us move those numerous uh, bills through the traditional process. Heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? Hearing none, the vote is now on the Woodall Amendment. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can no. you the chair the noes have it? Roll call, please, Mr. Chairman. Call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin, no. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is actually a pretty simple bill. I'm sort of surprised it wasn't in, in the text. It simply says uh, no, or excuse me, amendment, uh, no proxy votes on non-COVID bills that haven't had a committee hearing or markup. In other words, if we're doing these extraordinary things because of COVID, you know, other things at least ought to be able to go through a committee, particularly if we've adopted the rule as written. Uh, I would hope... Uh, uh, we, uh, we continue to defend the committee process and the markup process for things that are truly, clearly non-emergency, non-coronavirus related. Yield back. Yeah, um, yeah I, I appreciate, I mean, you know, part of what we, uh, what we require now is that the, the bills have hearings and rules unless we waive them, um, and that will be the case here as well. Sometimes things are urgent um, that, uh, we have to move quickly, uh, so I wouldn't want to tie our hands, so I would urge a no vote. The vote is on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Take a roll call. Yes, Clerk will call the roll, please. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. <coughs> Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments. Mr. Ms. Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk, report the amendment. Amendment number 10 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. This amendment, um, members, ensures that the unconstitutional use of proxy votes are not employed should the House consider future impeachment resolutions, censure resolutions, or contempt citations. And I want to be clear that I don't like anything in this bill, so my amendment is only offered because I know that the Democrats are going to pass this bill and maybe it will make it a little bit better. I mean, certainly impeachment, censure, and contempt citations are three extraordinary actions reserved for the gravest of times, and I would certainly hope that we would want all members here to consider that. And with that, I encourage a yes vote, and I yield back. Yeah, I, I would urge a no vote on this because this is like we're throwing everything but the kitchen sink at this uh, at this thing right now. I, I don't see any reason to do this. Um, I would urge a no vote. Um, the vote is on the uh, Lesko Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Can you hear the noes have it? The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Ms. Lesko. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk, report the amendment. Amendment number 11 to House Resolution 965, offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to offer an amendment that my colleague, Representative Mike Johnson from Louisiana, and I have worked on together. Mr. Johnson is also going to be introducing this amendment as a standalone bill. This amendment simply states that should a member choose to proxy vote, meaning not be here, their total member's representational allowance, commonly known as MRA, will be reduced by the amount it would take for them to travel to the House under normal circumstances to vote per the 2020 MRA travel expense formula. This is an official document all of our offices have access to from House administration. This money saved would be returned to the Treasury. Members shouldn't be able to use funds that were meant for travel on other things. That's not what our constituents want. At this point, we need to give funds back to the American people, not use them for things we aren't even utilizing. I believe this is a common sense amendment. If we're not going to, tra if members choose not to travel, they shouldn't get the money to do so, and we should, re should return it to the Treasury. And I ask for a yes vote. Uh, you heard the gentlewoman's amendment. I would, I would urge a no vote on this. I mean, let me just say a couple of things. First of all, some people have had to incur more expenses to get here from their districts because normal flights have been canceled. Okay. Secondly, I don't know what you do with your uh, MRA if there's anything left over at the end of the year. But I think it usually goes back to the Treasury anyway. Uh, but if members, you know, uh, you know, members can do whatever they want to do. Uh, they can, we, if, if they're not spending the money, they can, you know, they can make it public that they're not spending money on travel, and they can give it back to the uh, to the Treasury if they want. I, that's, I, you know, anyway, I would urge a no vote. Mr. Chairman? Yes. For folks who don't serve on House Administration, they might they may not have studied those numbers, but you know, where there's a formula in place. This isn't just about saving money. The, the, the formula says if you live further away, right. you do in fact have higher travel expenses, and so you get more money than everybody else. Mr. Raskin has the smallest right. MRA sitting here at the uh, at the table because he lives the he lives so, the closest. So, so it's, if you have money left over in your MRA, what do you what, what, can you can you what do you do with it? Can you write a check out to yourself? What do it, you? Um, it's, it's the, you, you're absolutely right. I didn't, think, if, I didn't think you could. If members choose to save it, it it's the equity issue yeah. that, I, Charlie Norwood was a great fiscal conservative from the state of Georgia. He spent every penny that he had every year because he said, this is my constituents' money and I'm spending it to serve them. I'm going to spend every penny. The reason California members get more money than, than East Coast members do is because their travel is further and if they're not traveling, they're just getting more money to serve their constituents what are, what than are, East Coast members are getting to serve their constituents. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is the nature of the is the nature I, of, the, I, of the amendment? Yeah, I, I, I strongly object to this. This is this is. I mean, we have we we've just appropriated trillions of dollars to try to help people. We should be doing oversight mm -hmm. to make sure small businesses are getting what we intended them to get. We should be making sure make sure that hospitals have the PPE that that they need. That we're that we're funding testing. So I, I just, whatever, I mean, people, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. So I just would uh, object to the gentle lady's um, amendment. I would say we're spending more money. And at this point, uh, certainly in my office, doing telephone town halls to reach people because of so many questions about unemployment, so many questions about small business, so many questions about health. And adding people like our health officers and somebody from the SBA, uh, actually, I'm finding that this is much more expensive and have uh, hope that the um, House administration and the Appropriations Committee will offer us some additional money to cover all the telephone town halls to communicate with the people that we represent. So I, I object. Uh, to the amendment and urge a no vote on it. Uh, Mr. Chair? Ms. Ms. Lesko. Can, can I respond? Yes, absolutely. Um, actually, in the last bill, every member was given extra money to do telephone town halls and to deal with the coronavirus, so we already got a bunch of extra money. In fact, I have constituents complaining about it because they think that it was used for our salaries or something, mm -hmm. which it was not meant to be. It was meant to be used for teletown halls, to, to deal with the coronavirus, 
with like equipment that our staff may need to use to telecommute and those type of things. So we were given extra money. But my amendment deals specifically in a reaction to, to the proxy bill. And the proxy bill says, okay, members that don't basically want to come in to work can turn over their vote to someone else. Well, then they're not traveling here. And we have a formula that is, that is all the offices have. It's a, it's a set out formula. It's a certain amount of money per mile. And it's based on how far away from the farthest part of your district you are to Washington, D.C. And if you're not going to fly here, if you're not going to travel here, then why should you get the money? That's all my bill does. So thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Raskin. Um, I understand, and I, I would uh, be delighted to be corrected if I'm wrong, but I understand from my chief of staff and a couple of other chiefs of staff that there was no additional MRA allowance given. That money went to the House of Representatives for maintenance staff. So if somebody could clear this up definitively, that would be great. In any event, th that kind of story, I think, contributes to the mythology about what's really going on here. And I, I want to say that it seems like there's so much outrage about such trivia being voiced today. And we hear so little about the 82,000 American citizens who've died in this process. We've heard so little about the tens of millions of Americans thrown out of work in this process, about spreading hunger in the society. The people lined up at homeless shelters, people lined up at food banks, and we get th this kind of delight in trivia. I just, I don't really get it. But let me just say, and that's a general statement, let me say specifically um, uh, about this amendment. I, what I would recommend to the gentle lady, and I know she's offered this in all sincerity, um, is that she combine with those people who are saying that members who sleep in their offices should have to return part of their salary to the United States government, because part of their salary undoubtedly is to cover the costs of their living in Washington when they're here. And they are certainly drawing on federal money when they live in their offices, something which is actually contributing to the public health danger of being on Capitol Hill. So I, I don't think that her amendment's going to pass, but I think she should go back and combine forces with the people who are saying that members should pay back part of their salary if they live in their offices. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, not to belabor the point, but since it was brought up, I have information that $8.8 .8 million for MRA uh, was included in the bill, and that it's estimated to $20,000 for each office. So, thank you. I, think I would be told that was for interns, but, 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 but putting that aside, um, my suggestion is that maybe we should bring this up with House Administration. Um, and go that way. So uh, I would urge a no vote. All those in favor of the Lesko amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 I'm opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Uh, would you, uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And let me just quickly note for the record our friend Mr. Burgess is also having a conflicting hearing and had to go. So I'm actually offering the amendment. Uh, on his behalf, and uh, just want the committee to understand why he's not here. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, this amendment says my amendment. It's actually uh, Mr. Burgess's amendment. Uh, would oh, sorry, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk, report the amendment. <laughs> amendment number 13 to House Resolution. Ask that the reading be dispensed without with objection. objection. Thank you very much, and I ask the indulgence committee. Um, this uh, we're undoubtedly probably, and, and you may well be dealing with this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and the guidance that you'll be working on. So this may be an issue that we will be talking out at a later date. But uh, this amendment would simply uh, require that your guidance uh, 
uh, include three things when it comes to proxy voting. A 24-hour notice uh, requirement before any proxy vote could be taken, specified minimum voting times, especially for unanticipated votes, uh, to ensure that all proxy votes may be cast, and, and a contingency plan for proxy voting in the event of technological limitations. I think those are all things that we ought to be considering anyway, and um, so we just uh, like to get those as part of the base bill, and then obviously your guidance would be determinative in, in how we work through that. Yeah. That I yield back, Mr. Chairman. General lady from California. I know you're um, presenting uh, on behalf of another member, but I'm just wondering if these amendment requests were um, brought up before the committee um, that got together, and what was the? Uh, no, we. I don't think we got down to that level of, of detail. There, there's going to be quite a bit of, you know. I understand she meant the task force. Uh, you know, we think uh, we're actually heading into this without a lot of these very basic things having been worked out or thought through. Uh, and so these are just three things we think when it comes to, look, we should all know when we're proxy voting is being used. We should all uh, know about, uh, you know, how the timing on the vote, those sorts of any kind of problems uh, technologically, you know, what are the contingency plans for them? So, again, I, I suspect these are things that the chairman will be considering as he puts together guidance. I have no doubt he'll be consulting with us on those matters as well. Uh, and obviously makes the final decision himself, but he's been very forthright in dealing with us openly in these things. So there's just concerns we have with respect to proxy voting. We'd like to make sure are answered whatever the guidance is going to be. And I appreciate the gentleman. And, and I, I know on a staff level, some of these issues were brought up um, in, the, in the committee. And um, I think, uh, like what I can say to the gentleman is that, um, you know, um, I, 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 don't, I, I can't say that uh, verbatim this will all be uh, adopted, but I think some of the spirit of what has been offered here will be in the guidance, and uh, we will share that with the gentleman, um, you know, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Certainly before, certainly before the vote. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, um, uh, you've heard the gentleman's uh, amendment. Uh, uh, the vote is now on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, no. You, the chair, the nose have it. Um, since it wasn't my amendment, I will do yeah, a okay. roll call just out of respect right. to Mr. Burns. Sure. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin. No. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman? No. Court report the total? Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment does not agree to further amendments. Ms. Lesko? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have amendment at the desk. Court report the amendment. Okay. Amendment number 14 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment would limit the number of proxies that any one member could carry to two. And I think there's a legitimate reasons for this. First of all, again, I don't like the bill at all or the resolution, but it's going to pass, so I might as well try to make it better. And, um, you know, I just, from a practical point of view, think about it. Let's say there's an MTR or there's a motion to adjourn or something unexpected. And, you ha and you're carrying 10 proxies, I mean, how are you going to communicate with 10 different people? I, I just think it's going to cause a problem, and so that's why I would advocate for a yes vote. I thank the gentlelady for her amendment. I will just point out to her that uh, in our original proposal, we had no limit uh, to how many people, how many proxies somebody could carry. Uh, the minority leader suggested two. We're, we've come up with 10. That, that shows, a, I think, a, a compromise. Uh, but uh, there's no question that um, voting uh, will take a longer time, um, no matter how we do it. And um, so I would, uh, I think we have moved as, uh, as much as I think makes sense, and I will urge a no vote. So the vote is now on the Lesko Amendment. Those favor, in favor say aye. Aye. Those no, no, no. Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Would you like a roll call? Clerk yes. will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. 
Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Clerk will report the total. No. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments. Ms. Lesko. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, clerk report the amendment. Amendment number 15 to House Resolution 965, offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment would strike section four of the resolution related to remote committee operations. So just take out the entire section about remote voting for committees. I, I would urge a no vote on this. I don't think there are any constitutional questions around this. Um, you know, I, I, anyway, we've had this discussion. Uh, the vote is now on the Lesko Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Aye. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Uh, roll call. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala. Shalala. No. No. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Clerk Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments. Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk report the amendment. Amendment number 16 to House Resolution 965, offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment would preclude the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the Ethics Committee from conducting remote operations. Currently, none of the platforms that can be used to facilitate remote operations can handle classified information. Given that the work of HIPSI fundamentally rel relies on access to classified information, they should be precluded from undertaking remote operations. Yeah, so our national security is too important to allow the Intelligence Committee to function remotely. The Ethics Committee handles serious and sensitive information about members of Congress and staff constantly. When the Ethics Committee holds a public meeting, it is generally in relation to allegations of improper conduct. The Sixth Amendment provides for an accused person to confront a witness against them. By permitting remote committee operations, we fundamentally de deny individuals this right. I hope that all members can support this amendment, and I yield back. Thank you. I just point out already um, we can't. This prohibits uh, classified briefings um, in, in in remote format. Um, we, um, we we say on the ethics committee, which is a, a bipartisan committee, that if they can figure out an op a way to operate remotely, they ought to go forward. Uh, the idea that um, all ethics uh, matters would be halted because of this, um, I mean, if it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, then that's the thing. But this, is a, this, this has to be a bipartisan vote uh, in the Ethics Committee in order for this to, to, if they can figure out a way to operate remotely, let's give them the opportunity. If they can figure it out, they can. If not, they can't. Yeah, uh, yeah, Mr. Cole. Just, just quickly, Mr. Chairman, I think this really is an important amendment because it gets to the point there are some things you really can't do remotely. Uh, and the Intelligence Committee, you know, if it's not talking about sensitive matters... It, it, well, they're not going to be able to operate. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that is already well, there. In the Ethics Committee, if in a bipartisan way, because it is a truly bipartisan committee, you can figure out a way know, to operate. And I just... And uh, if you can't, then we don't do it. Well, I, we'll see. But uh, this would make sure we didn't walk down that road. But with that, you'll back. Ms. Lesko. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, this doesn't... Voting for my amendment doesn't preclude ethics committee from not doing their job. It's a small committee. They could certainly meet in person. And we don't with know, that, we, I yield We don't that. know what the future is going to hold. That's the whole reason why we're doing this, this bill. Uh, I would just urge a no vote. The vote is now on the Lesko Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those no, no. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. 
Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. <coughs> Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Well, Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Members not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk, report the amendment. Amendment number 17 to House Resolution 965, offered by Mr. Cole of Oklahoma. We we'll ask that the reading be dispensed Without with. Without objection. Thank you very much. This is actually pretty simple. Uh, we just strike the language uh, to the greatest extent uh, uh, practicable in Section 4A-2. Uh, ensuring the committees must ensure that all members have the ability to. It's not the amendment. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. I've uh, right. went to my next amendment, so, okay. I'll, so we'll go, we'll do I'll go back and stay okay. in order, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for that. Um, this would just simply prohibit proxy voting uh, from counting towards a quorum and committee. I point out that again, that's something we've never done. We've had proxy votings in the past. We actually had a case in uh, 1966, the House Committee on Administration attempted to call up a privileged resolution, but a point of order was raised because a quorum was not actually present. So uh, again, I think we should uh, be careful about this, uh, this particular thing, and we shouldn't allow proxy votes to be used toward a quorum in a committee. Um, I think we've talked about this already, uh, so I would urge a no vote. Uh, the vote is now on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Being the chair, the noes have it. What about the clerk will call the roll? Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Work report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Members not agreed to further amendments. Mr. Cole. Thank you. Now back to where I was at. I have an amendment at the desk, Mr. Chairman. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 18 to House Resolution 965, offered by Mr. Cole of Oklahoma. I would ask that reading be dispensed Without with. objection. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Pretty simple. Uh, we just strike the uh, language to the greatest extent uh, practicable in Section 4A2. Uh, the committees must require all members to have the ability to participate remotely. The whole spirit of the amendment is for more members to be able to participate. So I don't see how you would limit that. Every member on a committee ought to have the ability to participate. It's the responsibility of the institution to provide that. If we're not going to call people back so they can participate here, it seems to me we have to guarantee that wherever they're at, they're in a remote location. We have a lot of members in states where this is going to be difficult on occasion, just given uh, the geography and the lack sometime of broadband. Uh, that may mean setting up hot spots. It may mean moving something to someplace else. It may inconvenience the committee. But there should never be uh, a technical uh, reason for excluding a member from actually participating in a committee hearing. So I would ask that that language be struck and we make sure that every member have the opportunity to participate uh, from wherever they're at. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Yeah, I mean, the intention is uh, what the gentleman says, but there are circumstances that could arise that, you know, I mean, right now if you're airplane is canceled uh, for whatever reason, your committee hearing is not canceled. Uh, so I mean, I, I think the spirit is to do what you want, but I think we need to build in uh, a little bit of a safeguard here. So I would urge a no vote. Uh, the vote is now on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Me no. the chair, the noes have it. Roll call. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, oh, okay. no. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. An amendment at the desk. 
Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 19 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment ensures there is guidance regarding a number of limitations within the resolution, including addressing difficulties with difference in time zones. There's a 22-hour difference between um, American Samoa and Guam, uh, for instance. Technological limitations that preclude members from fully participating in remote sessions. Decorum rules, including attire, rules for how the chair should handle witnesses and members going over their allotted time and how chairs plan to control platform access. I guess the bottom line is that there's really, I mean, I know that you say you're going to, somebody's going to provide guidance, but we're voting on this big bill that changes um, U.S. history, and we don't even know how we're going to do it. And so with that, I encourage a yes vote. So you said somebody's going to provide guidance. Um, I'm going to provide guidance. And, um, and many of these issues that you talked about will be addressed, so I will urge a no vote. Vote now is on the Lesko Amendment. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, no. no, no. Being the chair, the noes have it. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. No. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Uh, clerk report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mrs. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk report the amendment. Amendment number 20 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment would ensure that during this period of remote committee work and proxy voting that no remote markups are held. I think it's important that we take this in baby, baby steps and uh, we could see how it works without markups. Um, I think obviously markups and voting and committee are very important and I would encourage a yes vote. Um, I would oppose this. I'm getting confused because a few minutes ago we were told we can't, we should be taking bills to the floor that weren't marked up, uh, didn't have hearings or markups. Now we're saying we don't want to, we, we don't want to allow markups. So uh, anyway, I would urge a no vote. Vote I was on the. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. It, Woodall. In case it affects your uh, vote, the it consistency there yeah. is that <laughs> what we're saying is we should be here right. doing our work in both cases. Uh, is 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 what is what that is. All right. The vote is on the Lesko amendment. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. No. Be no. the chair. The noes have it. Roll call. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin. No. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Clerk Chairman, report no. the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk, report the amendment. Amendment number 21 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment would ensure that during this period of remote committee work and proxy voting that no remote depositions are to occur. Uh, this is a simple amendment aimed to protect the right to counsel. It is of the utmost importance during a deposition that those being questioned have the right to counsel readily available and that becomes much more complicated in a remote setting. We must really look to protect the right and due process during a deposition, and it is hard to square that with the reality of a remote Congress as committees conduct virtual business. In addition to this, given that some committees do not require a member to be present, this could also result in remote staff-only depositions. I hope that all members can support this amendment, and I yield back. Yeah, I, I would strongly oppose it. I mean, in the real world, depositions are conducted remotely, and I don't think we should do anything to, uh, to frustrate our constitutional responsibility to do oversight. Mr. Perlmutter. Yes, uh, depositions have been taken remotely for 20 or 30 years at least, and 
uh, evidence being presented to our courts remotely right now, state and federal. So I'm not sure uh, what lawyer is advising you on this one, but they're wrong. And I yield back. Heard the uh, General Aid's Amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Opinion of the Chair, the noes have it. Uh, roll call. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin. No. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui. No. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments. Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk, report the amendment. Amendment number 22 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mr. Cole of Oklahoma. I ask that the reading be dispensed with. Without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this would simply uh, create a point of order against consideration of legislation that violates uh, House or committee rules. Uh, and it would prevent the committee on uh, rules from waiving a point of order. All this would do is ensure that obviously a point of order that is legal under the rules would actually reach the floor to be uh, fully considered. So um, this is a protection since we're, we are obviously uh, embarking on uh, into unknown territory with uh, uh, new, new methods, new procedures that haven't been used ever in this House before would simply allow members to bring their case, if you will, beyond the Rules Committee, or decision is apt to be automatic to the full body to make a decision. Yeah, well, I, I would oppose this again. I mean, we, 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 uh, we waive the rules prophylactically uh, all the time, um, as my friends did when they were in the majority. Um, and uh, again, I, uh, I think these are attempts to obviously frustrate our ability to move forward on legislation, and I would urge a no vote. The vote well, is not on the Mr. Yeah. If I may, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, uh, we were in the majority. We never embarked on anything like this. I also understand the circumstances But, but even, even in this committee right now, we're violating uh, the five-minute rule. Yeah. Well, we've routinely done that for a long I time. I know we, we have, but I'm be the saying, first person you know, to, uh, to agree with you on that. But uh, in this case, this is a, this is a uncharted expansion of rules. This is way beyond anything we've ever done before. So. It simply makes sure you still control the body. If you control the Rules Committee, you control the body. So you're still going to win the point of order. But it allows, uh, if, if, if somebody feels like it's a flagrant violation, at least allows them to get a hearing in front of the body. That's all. The vote is on the full amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those no, no. Can you the chair the noes have it? Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. <laughs> Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will call or report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 23 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mr. Cole of Oklahoma. Ask the reading be dispensed with. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This would simply require that the guidance include uh, how the committee plans to authenticate and validate member participation. Obviously, you haven't made that decision yet, uh, but we want to make sure it's, uh, it's not in the bill uh, so, uh, or in the resolution, so we want to make sure that this is one of the things you actually consider, that we actually get an authentication and validation of member participation. Yeah, I mean, I, and, and I will assure the gentleman the guidance uh, there will be uh, language to so that you'll be able so some you can verify that someone is who they say they are. So I, it will be in the guidance, but I uh, so I would urge a no vote on this because we're going to it'll be in the guidance. Well, just and, and I know it will be, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I just want to say that we're, we're just using this uh, opportunity to point those things out to make sure. That when you review the record of this hearing, as I know you will, and that's, that's one of the things you can so much. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the vote is now on the full amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Be oh. the chair. The noes have it. Roll call. Yes, please, Mr. Chairman. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Askin. Mr. Askin. No. Ms. Scanlon. 
Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment does not agree to further amendments. Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. A clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 24 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mr. Woodall of Georgia. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is an amendment uh, to ensure that in the uh, guidance uh, that you provide uh, that a member's right uh, to offer a, a motion uh, uh, to adjourn and a motion to postpone uh, is uh, preserved. Uh, uh, again, it's so what is this? an unprecedented new process, unprecedented amount of authority placed solely in your hands to draft the entire uh, process. Uh, and so my uh, hope is uh, that you could tell me uh, today whether or not the guidance does include uh, that guarantee of each individual member's uh, offer to, to, uh, to make the, the, the motion to adjourn and, and the motion to postpone as, as the rules today provide. Well, the rules are still the rules, um, and they will not be denied. So I, I, I don't, this is not necessary, but... Uh, the vote is on the... M Mr. Chairman, yeah. j just because I, I've, I asked the question in sincerity about whether or not you intend to include it in the, uh, in the guidance, uh, the, the reason you saw everybody uh, uh, reaching over my shoulder... There, there will be nothing in the guidance to prevent members from making motions to adjourn um, or any you know, other motions that they have the ability to do um, as stipulated by the rules that are in place right now. And so when, when the implementing legislation says notwithstanding any other rules of the House, this is where we're going to go, I think that's the part that gives us, gives us pause. If, if what instead the legislation said is maintaining all of the current rules of the House, this is where we're, we're going, uh, I would have a completely different set of amendments. Yeah, I, I, will, I will just assure the gentleman that we are protecting minority rights, but if, uh, but if he wants a vote on this, um, to, to, to make an exclamation point, um, well, I'm happy to. I, I'd be, I, again, I would settle for the, for the chairman's commitment. I, it, it, it says in section four, I'm, I'm not. You have my commitment. Uh, uh, during any covered period and notwithstanding any rule of the House or its committees, here is this new process that Chairman McGovern will lay out uh, with yeah. the, in his sole discretion. I guess the, 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 the issue is if, if you would like us to go in and restate every single thing a member can currently do, the chances of us right. leaving something out would probably be greater than for us, I, you know. So I, I mean, well, whatever. I mean, I, I if, if, if the gentleman does want, well, let's let's have let's have a vote on your amendment. It, it well, and, I, and I've got several. It sounds it's, yeah. it sounds petty when you say it. And I know you're not trying no, to, not, to demean I, the I amendment. Wouldn't, I wouldn't be petty. But, no. but these are the these are the minority rights that we were you. talking with Mr. Hoyer about, and 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 yes, having those in a process that is likely. To suppress a minority, having minority rights specifically. Well, I, uh, uh, I, I, I disagree with the gentleman's assessment of, of what we're trying to do. But in any event, um, he's made his point, uh, and I would urge a no vote. Uh, so the vote is now on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can you chair the noes have it? A roll call, please. We'll call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, clerk, report the amendment. Amendment number 25 to House Resolution 965, offered by Mr. Woodall of Georgia. The, Mr. Chairman, this uh, is an amendment to ensure the uh, right of a member to have uh, a member's words be taken down, uh, be included. Uh, to Mr. Permutter's point earlier, I know things have evolved in the three weeks uh, since the last package was discussed. But in the last package, uh, it specifically stipulated that all current House rules would be followed uh, this package specifically says, notwithstanding any House rules, we're going to do things differently. I know the, the, the gentleman does not have a, a partisan goal, but I, I think it is not only appropriate, but it's the responsibility of the minority 
uh, when the when the legislation has changed from we will protect all of House procedures to notwithstanding any House procedures, uh, that we try to to provide some definition where definition is lacking. Yeah. Again, I don't think it's practicable to to restate every single right uh, in in the rules. But I will assure the gentleman that if I uh, he and I are are debating. Um, an issue and I personally attack him um, or besmirch his character, he will have the right to take my words down. I, I, I know that circumstance would never happen, uh, Mr. Chairman. But, uh, so, we're speaking hypothetically. But, but, I, so but I, I would never do that. The, 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 we, we've all experienced this on, our, on the video calls that we're on. Folks are raising their hand, they're trying to talk over each other. It's a very difficult for the chairman to run a virtual uh, committee uh, meeting, as, as, as we found in our very small committee, uh, talking over uh, one another and, and in limited uh, space. So I, I, I will concede that the chairman's absolutely right. We cannot possibly list every minority right. If the chairman would agree with me that we'll include these six that I'm, I'm mentioning, we can be done with it. Mr. Chairman. I think, if we, I think if we include these six and don't include others, then we are basically making it possible yeah. for uh, those others to be violated. Mr. Raskin. <clears throat> but I was just going to make precisely that point, Mr. Chairman. The, the omission of other rights when you're starting beginning to enumerate rights implies that those other ones are not included in the production, thus the existence of the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I don't think we need to reenact the entire constitutional history of the United States here when we have a very simple delegation of power to the chairs of the committees to operate consistent with all of the laws of the United States and the rules of the House of Representatives. If that is what we had, you would be exactly right. And that is what we had three weeks ago. Today we have the opposite. We have, during any covered period and notwithstanding any rule of the House, we do not have a document that says, please comply with all the rules. We have a document that says you are empowered to ignore all of the rules, to, to the gentleman's point. Right. Then we're just reading that differently. That, that, that clause, to my understanding, means that we can go ahead and operate according to the new rules, meaning at distance, technologically, which you couldn't otherwise do. The, the new rules being whatever Chairman McGovern drafts as guidance and shares with us whenever he decides Sure. Well, well, are you telling me that, that you think that the import of our new rule would be essentially what Donald Trump thinks is the meaning of the Article 2, that we can do whatever we want, inconsistent with the rules of the House and the Constitution? I, I, don't, I don't take the gentleman's reference. I simply know from, from, from uh, my very limited uh, legal understanding that notwithstanding any rule of the House means notwithstanding any rule of the House. I, I'm not trying to read anything into it. You change the language from incorporating every rule of the House to notwithstanding any rule of the House. I don't know why you did it. I'm sure it wasn't nefarious. Yeah. I just want to make sure that minority rights are not well, trampled upon. And next Congress, when Republicans are in control, you will thank me for having protected minority rights in this way. And, and let, me, let, me, if I could, let me assure the gentleman uh, that minority rights will be protected um, and that I think we, we can, let, let, let's just vote on the gentleman's amendment. Um, because I think we're just talking in circles now. The vote is now on the uh, Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Three yeas, seven nays. That is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Woodall. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk report the amendment. Amendment number 26 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mr. Woodall of Georgia. Mr. Chairman, again, I don't dispute uh, the, the very... Uh, uh, generous way that you have led uh, this committee, uh, but the ranking member introduced letters from other committee uh, ranking members who have not had that same experience with their uh, chairman, which is, which is why amendment number uh, 26 uh, uh, says that the guidance should include the right uh, to ensure a seven day notice before uh, the hearing and that the guidance should preserve the right to ensure 24 hour uh, availability 
of text. Uh, I don't know how chairmen will use their power. I know chairmen use their power very differently today than they did 30 years ago, and I think that's to the credit of this institution that that's, uh, that that's true. But the remote nature of a committee uh, hearing or a committee uh, markup uh, should not change the character uh, of that. Uh, uh, of that. It could be argued that without being in the room with the committee staff, with personal office staff, or expert witnesses, that folks need even more time uh, to prepare for, for hearings, not, uh, not less. And so this, again, provides those very limited guarantees that many of our ranking members have already said have been denied to them. Right. Well, first of all, we haven't had any remote hearings yet. I mean, we, 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 have to, we have to change the rules in order to do that. So when people say that, uh, you know, these hearing rules have been violated, we haven't had, been able to do that yet. Uh, but I assure the gentleman all these, uh, all, all these, uh, uh, you know, these rules will, will continue to be complied with and, um, and chairs will have to follow them, um, period. So vote now is on the gentleman's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Being the chair, the noes have it. Roll call, please, Mr. Chairman. We'll call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli. No. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui. No. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Lesko. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Amendment number 27. Amendment number 27 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mr. Woodall of Georgia. The, again, Mr. Chairman, this amendment uh, would uh, ensure that the guidance uh, includes uh, the right to offer a motion to appeal uh, the ruling of the chair. Uh, I take Mr. Raskin's point that if you if we list uh, a, a number of, of powers and do not uh, include others, that can be uh, deceptive in a limiting uh, nature. So I would uh, be willing to accept, if it would win your support, uh, uh, a, a friendly amendment that would add uh, 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 including but not limited uh, to the following uh, uh, minority rights, including uh, the right to appeal the, uh, the the ruling of the of the chair. It's going to be very difficult to go through these parliamentary processes that are already difficult for members who are not parliamentary experts. Uh, when we all sit together and are surrounded by a talented cadre of staff, trying to do this from your din uh, without the likes of of a uh, uh, of a Kelly or a Don uh, sitting beside you is only going to make it harder. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's why I'd like to, to make sure the guidance uh, includes these items. Yeah, members will have the right to appeal the ruling of the chair. So um, I think this is unnecessary, but let's have a vote. The vote is on the gentleman's amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 you the chair, the noes have it. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Woodall. Clerk report the, the amendment. Amendment number 28 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mr. Woodall of Georgia. The, Mr. Chairman, as you will remember, I misspoke earlier when I was talking to um, uh, the majority leader and, uh, and he corrected me. Uh, this, this amendment would respond uh, to that, uh, uh, to that uh, uh, conversation uh, by ensuring that the guidance does not require the pre-filing of amendments and that the guidance will preserve the right to offer second degree amendments. We see it in this committee as much as, as any where when we have a chance to talk about something together we can end up with a better solution than what we had uh, to begin with. Uh, I don't want the stilted nature of a, of a, a or even the expedited nature of a, of a, of a r remote uh, committee process uh, to undermine either uh, of, uh, of these important collegial functions. Well as the majority leader stated um, and as I stated as well um, there will be no pre-filing requirement. Um, 
I mean, some had suggested that because they thought it would actually make for more orderly hearings if they had to be done remotely. Um, it probably would, uh, but uh, that will not be part of this, um, and uh, and that's that. So um, I, there's no need for this, and I would urge a no vote. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Morelli. Yes, I, I, I just might uh, suggest, because I think you're, uh, you're being too modest, I think these kinds of protections, which you personally made sure exist, I think ought to be acknowledged. I mean, I think uh, to Mr. Woodall's amendment, I, I agree with the spirit of it, but it's already in what we have done, and the, uh, the chair has uh, not only uh, indicated that it'll be the case, the majority leaders indicated that it'll be the case, but I want to acknowledge the chair's good work in making sure that we continue to operate, uh, even if it's by remote process, uh, in the same spirit and the same letter of the uh, the current uh, the current rules. So I, I would just want to acknowledge your work, Mr. Well, I, pre I appreciate that. And let me just say that, you know, I mean, um, I think there will be some in, in this chamber, not all, and uh, but some who will try to find ways to intentionally uh, make this process much more difficult than it needs to be. Uh, and uh, so it was attractive for some to try to figure out ways to limit that, but we're not going to. All right, and so uh, we're going to, have to just all get through this together. And again, uh, we are not limiting your ability to do second degree amendments, nor are we li requiring that you all amendments have to be pre-filed. Um, so, uh, so, so uh, you know, we will we will get through this, and uh, but this is not necessary. But we'll we'll so vote on it anyway. If, if the if the chairman would would yield, I, I don't disagree with the thing Mr. Morelli uh, said about the power of your of your leadership, but. We had a choice, and I say we loosely, you had a choice when you drafted this language. We could have decided on this guidance together. This is a matter of, of original jurisdiction. Our committee gets to make these decisions, but instead, the language you drafted says pass it first, and then I'll decide no, later we, 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 how we, it's we, going we, to work. We will, we, I, I to, no I, one... I, to, I, to, I told Mr. Cole earlier today that we will share with him the guidance before... It'll be probably, this is, it's going to be before the, you know, before the, before the vote. I understand that. And, 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 I, and if the gentleman wants to now require that there be a pre-filing amendment, we can entertain that as well. The, the, the gentleman has an, we have a committee that could have a minority voice as we craft this. The very first step in, in creating remote committee jurisdiction is to say, in fact, the minority members won't be voting on any of these things. We won't, as a committee, sit on any of these things. We're going to delegate the entire process to the Rules Committee chairman. There is no better chairman than you to delegate that to. I'm not denigrating your leadership at all. What I'm saying is the first step out of the box is to say we won't do this collectively. We're going to do it in a unified way, as if we've given you all of our proxies and you have decided uh, to write uh, these rules. And, and this is the nature of our concern. It's not a faux concern. It's a very real concern, and we're living it out well, right now. Well, Mr. Chair. The gentleman is, uh, you know, has asked that we not have a pre-filing requirement. I would urge the gentleman to take yes for an answer. But everything, I, 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 see, I see what's happening here, that you know, we're, this is, we're, we're going through this procedure here, which is perfectly fine. Um, and no matter if the answer is yes, it's still not the answer that the gentleman wants. I yield to the gentleman from Colorado. And, and I guess what's bothering me here is that every one of these motions, every one of these amendments, every argument that was made by the five or six gentlemen that came in is almost ignoring the fact we are in a pandemic. We are not in a regular order system. And we've got to do the best we can. And the gentleman who has worked with you and worked with Mr. Cole has said that he will get these guidances and will visit with you. And he keeps saying this. I mean, we'll be here all night. And that's fine. I don't care. But America is undergoing something it hasn't experienced in at least 100 years. And the size of the economic fallout of this is beyond belief. And what we're trying to do, uh, Mr. Woodall, is to keep this government running in any kind of a way to address so many emergencies that exist out there right now. Do you think I want to be wearing this neck gaiter and 
choking uh, on some of my words. I mean, I don't like what we see here. This is not regular order, what is happening in here. And the language, and, and Mr., you know from your law school days as do I, you know, if you, if you exclude something in one way and you don't exclude it in another way, the courts are going to take, draw conclusions from that. And what I just want to, I want to have you, you could bring up every single section of the rules because of his use of the word notwithstanding. And if we want to be here all night, I mean, it reminds me of uh, Nero fiddling while Rome is burning. You know, we got work to do. This is a way to start getting it done. I know Mr. Cole wants to get on to normal appropriations. There's a lot of work to be done. There, were a, there was a lot of work for us to have to conduct long before this damn virus hit us all. And we got to get this done. And, and I appreciate the minority wanting to, you know, make it as difficult as possible. You know, and maybe run out the clock through the end of December. I don't think that's what you want to do, but I'll tell you, after 28 or 29 of these amendments, I can see that coming. And America will suffer for it. That's all I can say. And I yield back. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do appreciate your indulgence. And I, I know my friend from Colorado was not suggesting that I'm here in a dilatory capacity and that my sincerity uh, I know he was not questioning my sincerity in any way, shape, or form. Uh, Mr. Raskin uh, uh, went down that same line of, of I would argue, uh, policy shaming uh, for folks uh, who aren't focused on, on, on other issues. We all like to think that we're a committee of jurisdiction, that we're in charge of getting those health care dollars out the door, but that's not our job. We like to think that we're in charge of making sure that our first responders have PPE, but that is not our job on this committee. We like to think uh, that we get to go out and, and, uh, and assist our first uh, responders uh, with, uh, with equipment. That's not our job on this committee. Our job on this committee is the rules of the House. And what you're proposing today is changing the rules of the House in a profound way, a profound way. And for members who are concerned that folks are likely to use a crisis that we all agree is a crisis, likely to use human suffering, which we all agree is tragic human suffering, as an excuse to drive their will over the minority? Show up for the Rules Committee hearing on May 14th when folks say, those minority guys, they're just, del they're just uh, trying to delay it. Those minority guys, their ideas aren't, aren't even sincere. Those minority guys, they're focused on the minutia when they ought to be focused on the big picture. We're a process committee. We focus on the minutia. Because if we don't get the minutia right, the process falls apart. We don't even need a rules committee. You know that. We could operate this entire house without a rules committee at all. We have a rules committee to deal with the problems that the regular process doesn't solve. Perhaps creating a brand new way to hold committee hearings after 200 years? Perhaps responding to a crisis of unprecedented proportions? Perhaps that merits a conversation. And I think it's wonderful that after the chairman crafts the guidance, where the Rules Committee tells uh, uh, other committees how to conduct their business for, the again, the first time, because rules uh, committees usually vote on their own uh, rules. We'll be telling uh, those committees how to, how to do their, their rules. Um, I, think it's, I think it's wonderful that Chairman McGovern is going to come and consult with Mr. Cole after the fact. But there's not a single member on this committee who questions the value that Mr. Cole provides here. There's not a single member on this committee who questions Mr. Cole's wisdom as it comes to how we can operate in a collaborative, bipartisan way. And so there's not a member on this committee who doesn't think it's a waste of our collective resources to come to him after the fact when the cake is baked, well, instead of before the fact when we're mixing up the ingredients to begin with. If, well, if, let, let me, let, if I can if I respond just briefly, no, be, let, me, let me just say one thing. Um, I mean, I, we, we, we don't agree on what we're doing here. I mean, that's clear. Um, you know, we, but I will disagree with the gentleman on a couple of things. One is, um, you know, it is our job to make sure we get money to first responders. It is our job to make sure that we get health care dollars out. We're the committee that brings these bills to the floor so that, in fact, 
we can move this stuff forward. So, I mean, let's not, let's not I mean, the idea that it's just not, it, the process is policy as well. Secondly, um, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, we didn't come to an agreement in the bipartisan committee. But I think that it's not because we weren't exchanging ideas or, or I wasn't listening to Mr. Cole or he wasn't listening to me. It's just that we just couldn't come to an agreement. Um, and so, I, I mean, the, the idea that somehow we're, this is a, a big surprise that we're here right now and that there's been no consultation and no back and forth. Um, I respect Mr. Cole. I disagree with his conclusion here today. I think we need to do this to be able to help our first responders and help get health care dollars out. But, I mean, the, 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 the implication that somehow I, we don't value, I don't value his opinion or his guidance, I do. And on a lot of things, we do agree, and we, and we work things out. So I, I just, I just want, I want the record to reflect that, and that the work that this committee does is not just about, you know, you know crossing T's and putting dots on I's. It's a, it is about making sure that this place functions in a way that we can get the monies and the relief to people in this crisis who need it. And so I get it. So, and, and I, I don't question anybody's motives here. I just, I think we, we need to move on we have we have to deal with the uh, our, pro, uh, we, our, our 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 heroes package. We have we have to listen to that as well. So let us, if we could, we can maybe kind of move on and, and take a vote, Mr. Cole. Just quickly, Mr. First of all, I doubt the wisdom of consulting me all the time. So uh, I, I appreciate uh, your kind words and my friend's kind words. But um, also want to say a couple of things just in response to what you said and. Number one, I thought the ad hoc committee did really good work. And I thought we actually moved closer in the course of our discussions. You certainly accepted a number of the suggestions that we made. I appreciate that. Others, uh, you yeah, know, we probably started out on our side where we were not in favor of remote hearings at all. We accepted them to everything other than the markup. We were not in favor of proxy votes at all. We eventually accepted them with the idea of concurrence and a lower number. You moved toward us on that number. So, look, I think the whole exercise was a good one. Uh, and I think it actually eased the work here today. So all we're trying to do, we have a lot of questions. Our members want to ask. We have to go back and defend this I process to them. And I think that's what Mr. Woodall is trying to do. But uh, please don't think for a minute that any of us uh, doubt your fairness, because we don't. Uh, or that any of us uh, think that you have not been uh, forthright with us and inclusive because you have. I appreciate that. You're no, back. I appreciate it. All right. The vote is on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Aye. Any of the chair, the noes have it. Uh, would you like a roll call vote? Please, Mr. Chairman. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Before I go to the next amendment, let me ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a statement by Representative Steve Cohen in favor of the resolution. Uh, further amendments? Oh, let's go. Um, yeah. Mr. Cole, who had an amendment? Mr. Who? The, uh, I had an amendment to uh, designate number 12, Mr. Chairman, but I was uh, not going to offer that, uh, uh, that amendment. Withdraw it. Thank you. Further amendments? Uh, uh, um, uh, oh. if, if I could. Sure. The, uh, to, to, uh, just so the committee is clear, the, uh, we, we talked a lot about uh, uh, your consultation with the ranking uh, uh, member, and my amendment was to codify that to say you would in fact consult with the ranking member because that was nowhere to be found but uh, based on uh, your uh, at, uh, uh, statements uh, that uh, you have been and you will be and you will continue uh, to be uh, to your uh, point there's no need to vote on that because you've already given us uh, your Thank word you. which gives me great confidence so Thank I've withdrawn the amendment that. further amendments mr cole Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this, uh, again, is a Burgess amendment, so bear with me a little bit. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk, report the amendment. 
Amendment number 29 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mr. Cole of Oklahoma. Uh, I would ask that the reading be dispensed with. Without objection. Thank you very much. Uh, again, as I noted, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, an amendment by our esteemed colleague, Mr. Burgess. Simply ask that only CAO authorized products uh, be used to conduct the operations of uh, our committees when we're operating remotely. I think that's something that you want to do as well, but uh, we're just trying to get it nailed down so that we know uh, the source of any technology that we need to use. That's a pretty important thing, and particularly given the number of times that people try to hack into various house, uh, um, you know, uh, proceedings as it is. So, And, and, and we are going to basically take it's a very good idea. We're going to end up taking this. I think with the word, we're going to change the words approved to certified. That's uh, more than generous, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. But we're no on the amendment. <laughs> <laughs> because we're going to do it. <laughs> we're going to do it. Gee. <laughs> we're, giving you, we're giving you what you no, want. No, no. Yeah, I, I tell you what. Uh, on, on that basis. Don't purchase he won. <laughs> well, he'll, he won't look at it quite that way. <laughs> uh, anyway, the, the, the vote is on the... Uh, Full amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those, no, no. Can you share the no's have We will it? leave it at the okay. voice vote on your right, well. assurances. Uh, further amendments, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, clerk, report the amendment. Amendment number 30 to House Resolution 965, offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment would require that within 24 hours of using the authority to recess committee operations for technical reasons, the chair must notify all members about the circumstances related to the recess. We agree that the chair should have the right to immediately recess committee operations for technical issues, but there should be a mandatory follow-up promptly sent to all committee members clarifying the reason for the recess. And with that, I yield back. Yeah, let, I, let us, let us, let us, let us, let us think about this. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, um, I'm going to urge a, a no vote right now, uh, but let, it, let us see. Do you want us to set it aside while you look at it for a second and move through the rest of them? Yeah, I, we, I think we need to consult with a few, with a, with a few, with a few, it's going to take more than 10 seconds for us to go through this, but let us, why don't we have a vote, so, we, and, but if we could try to take care of this in, a, in the guidelines, we will, but, um, uh, but, but, uh, okay. why don't we, why don't we want to vote on this? I would urge a no vote so we could consult, but uh, vote. all those in favor of the Lesko Amendment say aye. Aye. Those no, no. Can you cheer the no's have it? Roll call. Roll call. Mr. Roll call. Hastings. Mrs. No. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Three A's, eight nays. Does not agree to further amendments. Mr. Woodall, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number thirty-one to House Resolution nine six five, offered by Mr. Woodall of Georgia. Mr. Woodall. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, all of the minority rights I discussed uh, earlier that, that you assured me would be protected in the, in the guidance uh, go by the wayside if a member can't unmute their phone, if a member has a, a technical problem. We are not all created technologically uh, equal in our understanding uh, and uh, our use of, of technology. And so uh, this amendment uh, by Dr. Burgess would say that if we're going to go down this road, uh, each committee chairman must ensure there is a dedicated CAO support team available to each member of the committee uh, in real time because uh, un unlike uh, our, our nightlife uh, where an inability to communicate uh, uh, with your spouse is just an inconvenience, uh, inability to communicate with your chairman in the middle of a markup uh, is uh, of uh, exponential 
uh, importance uh, when it comes to doing the legislative uh, business. And so having that technical support team, recognizing we are not all uh, equally uh, skilled, I think would go a long way to uh, ensuring the comfort uh, of members right. in this new process. So we, we agree that members ought to, uh, need to uh, be given technical support to be able to comply uh, with, the, with the new rules if we're going to operate remotely, but uh, I, I don't think we feel comfortable prescribing, you know, how that is done. Different committees uh, rely on different uh, technical support teams, and um, so I, I agree with this in spirit. But uh, in real life, I, I would I would urge a no vote at this particular time. The, the Mr. Chairman, I don't know how uh, in, individual committees pay for their support staff. But what's unique about the CAO support staff is that it is a nonpartisan staff. Again, when it comes to partisan concerns, are we suppressing uh, uh, the minority? Who's getting the, yeah. the help? Uh, having the nonpartisan uh, office uh, directed by the chairman, as opposed to uh, a, a the partisan offices that support. I, I don't know what their capacity is, to be honest with you. So, I mean, I, I, the idea of just taking this like this, um, you know, um, I, I, I would be reluctant to do so at this point. Well, so I would urge a no vote. The, if you to, to leave some of Ms. Dr. Burgess's concerns, Mr. Chairman, having assured folks that we would make a pathway forward so that all members could participate, that this would increase participation as opposed to diminish it, if we don't even know what the CAO's capacity uh, is, if we don't know what committee's individual capacity is, how are we? Yeah. How, how can we be be confident going down this this road? Yeah, I, I don't know even if this is the best group to do it. And I, so I, I would urge a no vote. And I just say, I don't, I'm not sure there's anything I can do or say that would alleviate Mr. Burgess's concerns. So I would urge a no vote. Mm -hmm. Vote on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can no, no. you, the chair, the noes have it? Clerk will we'll call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Scanlon? No. Mr. Morelli? Mr. Morelli? No. Ms. Shalala? Ms. Shalala? No. Ms. Matsui? Ms. Matsui? No. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Mrs. Lesko? Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman? No. Clerk, report the total? Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Who? Right here. Uh, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is actually pretty simple. Just the just amendment would require that any issues with remote operations should be included in the committee report uh, on activities. We're embarking again in a new area here. This will just give us a systematic way to know what the problems are and uh, address them. And uh, if they're highlighted in every committee's report, I just think that taking remedial action becomes a lot easier. So I just, I think, pretty practical thing to do. Yield back. Oh, I'm sorry. I had an amendment at the desk. <laughs> Look, report the amendment. Amendment number 32 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mr. Cole. I would ask that the reading be dismissed with, <laughs> and I think I've explained the amendment sufficiently, so I don't think there's any uh, additional uh, explanation required. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. You've heard the gentleman's amendment. Uh, any discussion? If not, the vote is on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can no. you cheer the noes have it? Uh, roll call. Look, we'll call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chair, can I just make a quick point? Uh, quick, uh, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Uh, uh, Mr. Cole. Thank you. I, I would just ask, you, yeah. you know, that you consider this when I, you're putting together your guidance. I, it's I, certainly I, appropriate to be listening, to, and again, I, it's I, serious. I appreciate that. I okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, further amendments? Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have an amendment at the desk in behalf of Mr. Burgess. Uh, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 33 to House Resolution 965, offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Many of my colleagues on the other side have expressed their serious and legitimate concerns about ensuring that committees can meet safely following the recommendations of the CDC and attending physician. I agree with their concerns about ensuring that large communities have the capacity to meet. Mr. Chairman, that is why I offer this amendment, which would require the Committee on House Administration to develop a plan that would allow committees to more fully use the Capitol complex for hearings and markups prior to permitting the use of remote operations. We have large, significantly underutilized spaces that can be used for the House's business. Uh, emancipation Hall, CVC meeting rooms, auditoriums, these could all be converted to allow for Congress to continue its work before implementing a solution that overturns more than 200 years of precedent. And with that, I urge my members to support this amendment, and I yield back. You heard the Lesko Amendment. Is there any discussion? If not, the voters on the Lesko Amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Lesko. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Members not agree to further amendments. Mr. Chairman, I believe I have the last amendment. Mr. Woodall. On behalf of Dr. Burgess, amendment number 34. Uh, clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 34 to House Resolution 965 offered by Mr. Woodall of Georgia. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, first let me say I, I've taken absolutely uh, no pleasure in our uh, proceedings uh, today. The circumstances that bring us here uh, are, are disturbing and painful, and the work that we have to do here today uh, uh, changes uh, a process that is near and dear to all of us, and we're doing it in the name of, of trying to get uh, uh, to a better e uh, ending. The anxieties that you heard shared uh, by uh, uh, all of the witnesses, save Mr. Hoyer, uh, who testified today, were anxieties that came from a very a place of, of partisanship that, that is rampant in this institution uh, uh, today. Not that anyone questions uh, uh, your leadership or anyone on this uh, on this committee, but that that concern uh, that uh, that partisanship creeps in seemingly to everything that we uh, that we do. Had we found a bipartisan solution to move forward again incrementally or or large scale, we would not be having this conversation today and the anxiety would still be present, but in a much diminished uh, way. Anxiety because we all want to serve our constituents as best we can, uh, but confidence that we were doing it in a collaborative way. And so this final amendment uh, from Dr. Burgess uh, changes Section 5 uh, and uh, changes it uh, from uh, study and implementation of remote voting in the House uh, to study of remote voting in the House. Uh, the most significant thing that this resolution does uh, today is provide uh, for the certification of remote voting in the U.S. House of Representatives on the floor of the House. That is the most consequential thing in this piece of legislation. And so asking the House Administration Committee, rather than to study it and to certify let's do it, to study it and then tell us that we're ready to do it so that we can then have a vote uh, of the House on that, it would. It would require one more Rules Committee uh, markup. It would uh, uh, requires to be down the floor for one more uh, roll call vote. Uh, but uh, no, you cannot do anything that's going to satisfy all of the concerns of the minority. But you could do this one thing that would thwart the majority's goals not one iota and would give the minority, and I believe the American people, a degree of confidence in the direction we're going that is not contained in the underlying uh, resolution. I think Dr. Burgess is spot on here. Let's proceed with the study exactly as the legislation requires, and when the conclusion comes back from the House Administration Committee to do this most consequential thing of, of, uh, of moving to remote voting on the floor of the House, let's come back and have a final vote, not on that measure as part of a giant package, not on that measure as a part of a multi-bill uh, rule, but on that measure and that measure alone. With that, I yield back. Heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? 
Hearing none, the vote is on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can you the chair the noes have it? Roll call, please, Mr. Chair. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Lesko. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Uh, further amendments? Uh, any uh, final comments, or Mr. Cole? If I may, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to uh, thank you very much uh, for the spirit in which you conducted the, the hearing. I know it's a long hearing. I know it's a contentious uh, topic. I know we don't agree on everything, but uh, you've been extraordinarily fair, as you have been throughout the process, and I appreciate that. I also uh, want to, uh, for the record note, and I know there was some frustration uh, with talking a lot about the guidance, but remember, we haven't seen the guidance yet, and our members have a lot of concerns uh, that uh, they ask us collectively to express and points to make, and that was the spirit in which we operated, uh, and uh, I know you and I will have good and, and extensive uh, comments and discussions about the guidance as we go forward. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. I also want to address a point that uh, our distinguished majority meter, uh, leader made or our concern that he expressed, and I want to reassure him as well. Uh, my concerns, and I think the concerns on our side, and, I'm, and, and I know some of these are shared on your side, are about changing the nature of the institution. They're really not about the relative power of the majority and the minority. Uh, honestly, this is a majoritarian institution. The power is where it belongs. It's with the majority. I don't have any dispute. I don't, and I don't think the majority leader or any member of our ad hoc uh, panel was trying to in any way, shape, or form change that. Uh, we just, I, I'm much more profoundly worried, and I know you know this because we've had this discussion uh, about the nature of the institution. I am very worried that some of these changes will diminish the power of the individual member pretty dramatically and enhance the power of leadership in both the majority and the minority uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, I also think uh, the use or overuse of this uh, particular, whether it's remote voting, whether it's for a virtual committee meeting hearing, will ultimately weaken us as a branch of government vis-a-vis -vis the legislative branch, or the executive branch. The executive branch is in here actually operating. And uh, I also think there is a concern, and you heard it from some of the members today, that we are asking lots of other Americans to, to do their work, to show up and do their work. And they're heroes all, doctors, nurses, obviously. But the unsung heroes are people at food processing plants and people uh, that are driving trucks and people that are stocking shelves. And I know you feel that way too, because I've heard you express that sentiment on many occasions. I know my own hometown, uh, when I was there in our extended uh, break, I go to the same 7-Eleven every morning, get a cup of coffee, know the people there, and they're there. they were there every morning. And there was a truck there every morning making sure that there was food supplies and there were gasoline. So uh, we've asked a lot of Americans to do ours. And I think as our members say, we, we understand we need to change the way we operate. This uh, very committee meeting and the way we've arranged ourselves and the way we've operated um, is an admission of that. And I think we all share that. But uh, we do think broadly that we ought to be here. Uh, doing our work and that we run lots of risk and weaken the institution and I think inhibit rather than maximize the chance for bipartisan cooperation by going down this road. So while we have great concerns about the rule and the changes that it, it proposes and um, you know our amendment suggests that, I suspect our debate will suggest that tomorrow, please don't think it's because I have any doubt about your motives. I don't or any other member of the majority on this, uh, or certainly the majority leader. I do have concerns about the judgments that, that have been made, and uh, you've tried to work with us when you could. I appreciate that. Uh, we tried to work with you where we could. Uh, we didn't get all the way there, but we got more of the way there than perhaps this hearing might suggest. I hope we can continue to do that. I look forward to working with you 
as you work through the difficult issue of the guidance. And uh, so with that, uh, we may not agree on this one, but uh, I've always found you and your staff fair and uh, uh, congenial to work with. I know that's going to continue going forward, and I look forward to that process, Mr. Chairman, and yield back. Well, thank you. Um, and let me, let me just say uh, to the gentleman from Oklahoma, my friend, uh, I appreciate his, his kind words. I, I also appreciate the fact that uh, uh, on this issue, which is contentious, uh, but also on a number of other issues that have been contentious that have come before this committee, uh, he, his staff, but the other members of the committee on the Republican side and the Democratic side, we have somehow managed to get through it all uh, in a way that uh, seems to sometimes be the exception to the rule here um, in, uh, in, in the House, which, uh, you, know, the, the, uh, you know, the fact that uh, the Rules Committee seems to uh, oftentimes be more civil um, and more thoughtful. Um, and I don't say that in any disrespect to the chairs who are out in the, out in the, uh, in the audience here today. Um, but we have, um, I mean, we've been through a lot. We've, we've, we've did hearings on Medicare for all, or we have <laughs> impeachment, uh, you know, uh, Article One responsibilities, and we have had uh, some very thoughtful uh, interactions here in this committee. Let me just just say finally, I, I, not none of us want to be in this moment where we have to confront these issues about you know not just the safety uh, of members because as I said before, I think that is the least of our concern. It is the safety of everybody who works up here that we have to be thinking of ways to operate remotely. Uh, we have never experienced anything like this pandemic in our lifetime. And lots of references were made to the 1918 pandemic. But when you look back on the history, Congress didn't function. I, mean, I, gave, a, I gave an example of the fact that we couldn't, Congress couldn't even get together to approve more doctors to go to rural areas. And probably as a result of that, more people died than should have uh, as a result of that, of that crisis. I mean, that, was, that, that is an example of how we, that, that is an example of failure. Um, and so, look, we, we're trying to come up with a package that hopefully uh, is not only temporary, but very, very temporary. And hopefully we will not have to look to this in the fall, that somehow we will manage to get through this or, you know, miraculously find a vaccine or, or something. But I think the one thing I have become very convinced of is that the status quo uh, is unacceptable. Uh, and uh, we need to figure out a way, uh, you know, if members can come here, that's fine. Uh, but not everybody can. Uh, and we also need to think about the safety of our staff and the people who work here. So in um, any event, I know we're going to not agree on, on this, but, uh, but again, I want to thank uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma for uh, his, um, uh, his uh, incredible partnership up here. And I want to thank all the members of the committee, Democrats and Republicans, and the staffs in particular for, you know, all the work leading up to this hearing, but uh, you know this has been a long day and it's nowhere near over yet. Um, so um, again, I want to thank everybody. So if there are no further amendments, the question is now on the motion to order the measure reported favorably to the House. All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. no. Uh, the ayes have it. And the motion is adopted. The clerk will call uh, the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter, aye. Mr. Askin, aye. Mr. Askin, aye. Ms. Scanlon, Mr. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, aye. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, aye. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, no. Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, no. Mr. Chairman, aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk, report the total. Eight yeas. Four nays. The motion is adopted, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. All right. So, so now, okay. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Um, there were two little bits of misinformation that were still floating around from the last okay. set of amendments and discussion. I wonder if it would be appropriate for me to take a second to correct them now. Uh, do you want to say, publicly correct the record, or do you want, what do you? Uh, yes, I, I I'll, would. I'll, I'll, I'll yield to you right now. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I understand from the House Committee on Administration that in the CARES Act, there was, there was $25 million 
that was appropriated to the House of Representatives. But it was stated in the discussion of one of the LESCO amendments that that was money that went to the MRA accounts of individual members. It did not. That money went to overwhelmingly, it looks like, contractors for the House of Representatives in the cafeteria, in maintenance and technology, especially technology contractors who helped to set people up at home. As far as I know, and as far as we can tell, there was no money that was allocated to MRAs. So that's the first. And the second I wanted to correct, Mr. Chairman, is that um, well, one of the witnesses before took issue with, uh, I'm sorry. I think we I think we need to pause and start the next hearing, and then we can I can. All right. All right. So the rules committee will come to order. Uh, today we're considering two measures. The first is H Res 965, which would temporarily allow for virtual committee work and remote voting on the House floor during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we just held an original jurisdiction hearing uh, and a markup on this resolution. We heard a lot of feedback from both sides. I'm not sure that there is anything else to add to this. Um, <laughs> it going since 11 o'clock. Um, I will just say that uh, I've, I've heard from members asking us to make these changes a reality for weeks now, not, not just Democrats. Uh, as, uh, many Republicans want us to keep legislating in the safest possible way, and uh, whether that's uh, remotely from our districts, in person in the Capitol, or both. We've discussed these ideas for weeks, and now it's time to act. The second measure we're considering today is the HEROES Act, a bill to continue responding to the coronavirus pandemic. I'm not surprised by much these days, but I'm shocked when I hear that the President and the Senate Majority Leader suggests that waiting a month or more before taking further action to combat the impacts of the virus is somehow okay. Our economy has lost more than 20 million jobs last month. The unemployment rate now stands at over 14 percent and continues to climb. More than a million Americans have been diagnosed with this virus. Families are struggling to put food on the table and to pay their bills. We're seeing some economic numbers that rival that of the Great Depression. Yet some of my uh, friends on the other side of the aisle are, are telling the American people to hurry up and wait. Uh, are you kidding me? The Congress is not waiting. We are acting on this comprehensive bill that matches the scale of what we face. The HEROES Act provides historic levels of funding for state and local governments to pay teachers, health care workers, and, the first re and first responders who keep us all safe. It includes additional funding for tracing, treatment, and testing of the virus. It establishes a HEROES Fund to provide hazard pay for essential workers. And it also provides billions of dollars so that states can prepare to hold federal elections during a public health emergency, including early voting and vote by mail. I'm especially proud that the legislation includes a 15 percent increase in the maximum SNAP benefit, as well as, bipartisan, as, well as the Bipartisan Bicameral Feed Act. These provisions will help address the hunger crisis in this country the scale of which we haven't seen since the 1930s. So I don't know what uh, the, uh, the Senate uh, Majority Leader or the President will do, but I know what they should do, and that's get this bill signed into law. When I travel around my district, my constituents don't ask for more grandstanding press conferences. They don't want to continue the rubber stamping of judges at the expense of everything else. What they want is con are concrete solutions to the challenges that they face because of this pandemic. That's what this bill will provide, and it's what uh, all, the Ameri all Americans deserve. With that, uh, let me turn it over to our ranking member for any comments he wishes to make. And then, Mr. Raskin, when we get back to you, we'll, you, we'll let you finish, okay? So I'll turn to Mr. Cole for any opening uh, statements that he would like to make. Now, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today's legislative hearing is on H.R. Uh, 6800, what the majority is calling the HEROES Act, but what is better described as an 1,800-page liberal pipe dream. Rather than attempting to work with Republicans to advance bipartisan legislation, speakers called us back here today to consider a bill that will cost $3 trillion and was assembled with only Democratic input. I regret that because we've had four supplementals in a row that were bipartisan and there was essentially no partisan division at all. Why we didn't proceed down that line, uh, which has worked in the past, is a mystery to me. Uh, indeed, there are very few liberal policy ideas the majority has not tried to squeeze into this bill. Uh, but what's most egregious is that the bill is simply a democratic agenda masquerading as a response to the coronavirus pandemic. It goes without saying, Mr. Chairman, that the bill is going nowhere and it's going uh, there fast. The Senate will not consider this bill. The President will not sign it into law. 
and why we're going through this exercise instead of negotiating in a bipartisan manner is beyond my understanding. What's even more surprising is how quickly the majority wants to move on a bill of this magnitude. Just six weeks ago, Congress passed uh, and the President signed into law the CARES Act, a bill that provided $2 trillion for coronavirus relief, uh, coronavirus relief efforts. Just two weeks ago, Congress passed and the President signed a bill that provided an additional $500 billion in relief. Indeed, much of the money included in those two bills isn't even out the colloquial door yet. Uh, we have uh, significant resources in our coffers that have yet to be tapped. Uh, but not content with having spent $2.5 trillion in six weeks, the majority is now asking us to spend another $3 trillion this week. No matter that the nation hasn't even absorbed the impact of the CARES Act yet, and no matter that the funds provided previously haven't been all spent yet. Let me be clear about one thing, Mr. Chairman. Republicans in the House, in the Senate, and in the White House stand ready to work hand-in-hand -hand with Democrats to pass another bipartisan coronavirus relief bill if and when it is needed. But today, it's not clear if we even need another bill, much less what should be in it. Uh, perhaps that's why today's bill covers a litany of liberal policy priorities, regardless of their limited connection to the coronavirus pandemic. Just as we are being asked to vote on a Democratic-only measure to fundamentally change the nature of the institution of the House of Representatives, the majority is asking us uh, to pass a bill to fundamentally change and reshape the nature of our country. Consider just some of the provisions included in this bill. $3 trillion in spending, nearly $10,000 for every person in the United States, complicated and controversial provisions allowing a government bailout of multi-employer pension plans, forgiving student loan debt, requiring changes to credit scoring models, and preventing any debt collection, repealing a provision of the law requiring the auction of um, a T-band spectrum, requiring same-day voter registration and nationwide vote by mail. I could go on and on and on with this list. I think members get the picture. So much of what is in this bill simply has nothing to do with the crisis. Mr. Chairman, simply doesn't make sense to me. If the majority actually wants to help Americans, there are plenty of bipartisan ways to do so. We should be focusing uh, our efforts on legislation to combat this pandemic, to allow people to get back to work, and to restore our economy. But instead, uh, we've been handed an 1,800-page list of $3 trillion worth of Democratic priorities uh, that they would be pursuing regardless of this pandemic. Uh, we can do better than that, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I hope in the coming weeks we will. I would ask the indulgence, Chair, at some point I need to go down and testify. So where I can do it from here or there. Whatever, 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 just you, whatever you feel comfortable. Uh, well, I, given how difficult it is to space people, maybe right. I should just okay. stay where I'm at. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rask, I'm going to get back to you during questions, okay? Is that, is that okay with you? All right. So we go right to the... Um, I, I want to welcome our witnesses uh, today uh, to provide testimony in H.R. 6800, the HEROES Act. Uh, Chairwoman uh, uh, Nita Lowy uh, and Chairman Frank Pallone uh, and Ranking Member Cole, uh, representing the minority in the Appropriations Committee. We're delighted that you are all here. Anything you brought in writing without objection will be entered into the record. I now recognize the gentlewoman from New York, Chairwoman Lowy. Mr. Chairman, my friend Ranking Member Cole, and my friend Mr. Chairman, and members of the Rules Committee, more than 84,000 Americans have died. More than 1.4 million have become sick. More than 36 million have lost their jobs because of coronavirus. While Congress has taken significant action to address urgent needs stemming from coronavirus, we must do more. As Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell told us yesterday, additional fiscal support should be, would be costly, but worth it if it helps avoid long-term economic damage and leaves us with a stronger recovery. The HEROES Act takes that wisdom to heart. 
It is the bold and transformative step we need to ensure our nation meets the challenge of the pandemic and the ensuing economic recession. Much of the bill is in the jurisdiction of other committees, and my fellow committee chairs will tell you more how this bill meets the needs of the American people. By putting money directly in the pockets of workers, including our essential workers, supporting small businesses and nonprofits, and further bolstering families, including their health security and workplace security. However, there is much in the Appropriations Division to address the health and economic crisis for the people. First and foremost, the bill delivers nearly $1 trillion to states and local governments so they can keep our heroes, first responders, health workers, teachers, and other public servants paid and working for us. I'm incredibly proud that this bill will provide $67 billion to my home state, New York, which has been hit so hard by this crisis. Second, we will only beat this disease with a robust national strategy for testing, tracing, and treatment. In this bill, we build on the CARES Act with an additional $100 billion for the Health Provider Relief Fund, and we provide $75 billion for a nationwide testing and contact tracing strategy. Third, we must meet the challenge that the economic effect of lockdowns and stay-at-home orders are having on families. As a mother and grandmother, I am deeply concerned about the effects of coronavirus on children and their education. We are including $100 billion to support K through 12 and higher education. These systems, we hope, will respond to this crisis. To address rising hunger, this bill funds an expansion of SNAP benefits and other nutrition programs so that children and families have enough to eat working with the authorizing committees to prevent a housing crisis. We are deploying new funds worth nearly $200 billion to help struggling families make rent or pay their mortgages. Finally, to stop this crisis from weakening our democracy, we have included funding to hold safe elections, to carry out a fair and accurate census, and to ensure that the Postal Service can continue safely delivering mail to American households. These are just a few of the highlights of this bill, and I'm so proud of the hard work of so many to ensure that includes the help that so many families, businesses, communities need. Mr. Chairman, the HEROES Act will meet the challenges this pandemic poses to our nation. I request an appropriate rule to bring it to the floor. Thank I you. yield back and I thank, thank you very much. Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm not uh, going to uh, talk much about the appropriations part, but rather the authorizing parts that relate to the Energy and Commerce Committee, which of course is health, telecommunications, energy and environment. Um, in terms of the health provisions of the bill, uh, as, um, as Ms. Lowy said, as Chairman Lo Chairwoman Lowy said, the HEROES Act continues our ongoing commitment to providing the health care resources and support needed to combat uh, the virus. Most important, in my opinion, is the way in the original CARES Act that we had free testing, uh, we are now expanding that to free treatment drugs and ultimately vaccine. 
And what I mean by that is that no one should not, no one should be afraid that if they seek treatment or seek drugs or seek the vaccine, ultimately, that they will have to incur any out-of-pocket costs, whether it's uh, deductibles, co-pays, or the cost uh, in general. I think that's the most significant thing. Second, um, we add $75 billion uh, to the $25 billion that was provided in the last bill, um, specifically for a national testing, contact tracing, and isolation plan. I think uh, the responsibility has fallen mainly on the states, but I don't think that should be the case. I think that in terms of providing a comprehensive testing plan and building out capacity, the federal government needs to, more, to do more to help the states. And so this basically not only adds money, but has specific plans and benchmarks with clear timetables to achieve testing capacity and make it significantly more robust, and at the same time provide for very specific ways to increase contact testing and isolation, particularly for those who can't isolate at home, because, perhaps because their apartment or home is not big enough for that. In addition to that, um, and um, I can't stress enough, we have uh, built a supply chain with, I'll call it a czar, or someone who's clearly in, ch in charge of the supply chain. Uh, one of the faults of, the, uh, of what's going on now is that many times supplies were not delivered uh, to help to, uh, with treatment, ventilators, gowns, masks, you've heard the long list over the last few weeks or the last month and a half. We want to make sure that there actually is a supply chain with someone in charge who we can go to uh, with websites and portals to specifically indicate what supplies are needed, what supplies are going out, and not only, and, and what supplies are being manufactured, so in, in more extensive use of the Defense Production Act and manufacturing here in the United States, not only for the personal protection equipment, but also for the drugs, also for the testing, also for building out uh, capacity for all that. We need a much improved supply chain. We also, as Ms. Lowy, as Chairwoman Lowy said, we add another $100 billion to the Provider Relief Fund. This is the fund for hospitals, community health centers, health care providers. But beyond the money, again, because Energy and Commerce is the authorizing committee, uh, we specifically say that this has to be for lost revenue linked to the COVID uh, virus. Uh, so far, a lot of the money that's gone out from HHS has been based on 2018, 2019 revenue losses that have absolutely nothing to do uh, with the COVID virus. And we're saying that shouldn't be the case. It may be that a hospital, for example, can't do electric, elective surgery, and therefore they can say that that's linked, obviously, to the COVID virus. But this money, when it goes out through the Provider Relief, Relief Fund, has to be linked to what's happening now in the last few months during this COVID virus period, not before. And we also take the accelerated and advanced payment program that many hospitals have used, borrowed money from. The interest rate is too high, it's 10%. We're reducing it to one. We're giving them an extra year to pay back. Um, and we're taking the money from the general revenue so we don't uh, deplete the Medicare trust fund. We also have some major Medicaid provisions, an additional plus up by 14% uh, for FMAP to help stays with their Medicaid program. Additional increase of 2.5% for DISH to support proportionate share hospitals. Increases by 10% for state Medicaid services that keep patients at home and community-based care rather than going to nursing homes. And finally, with regard to the health provisions, I wanted to say, uh, one of the most important things and one of the biggest concerns we have, I know Chairwoman Lowy has seen it in my state, the majority of the deaths are from nursing homes. And so we want to improve care at nursing homes, have a strike force that can be deployed to help nursing homes, have incentives for better uh, safety and quality protections and infection control, and also requiring the nursing homes to report information related to uh, the COVID-19 cases for more transparency. Now, I wanted to mention also the telecommunications and energy and uh, environment-related provisions. With regard to telecommunications, I can't stress enough, I know all of you know, that having 
the ability to access the internet uh, and use the internet is so important during this COVID period. So we are including, I believe it's $1.5 million, billion dollars for schools and libraries under the FCC E-rate program, an increase essentially to facilitate distance learning during the emergency. An additional four million during the emergency that goes to the low income Americans who perhaps cannot pay uh, their internet bills so that they don't get cut off. And finally, a, a pro specific prohibition uh, on uh, that providers cannot stop service to consumers unable to pay their telephone or their broadband service during the du duration of the emergency. And last, but certainly not least, with regard to uh, utilities, very similar uh, phenomenon. No shutoffs and the fund to, uh, a fund that gives a billion and a half dollars for new water utility assistance program, again, uh, for low income. And the, I, I did want to mention two other things, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm trying to summarize, but I think there's two other things I need to mention that are in this bill. One, price gouging. We've heard so much about increased price gouging. So under the bill, we provide the FTC authority to pursue civil penalties from companies and individuals engaged in price gouging. And I know members, including some on this committee, have asked about you know, what we're doing with regard to mental health. Uh, again, I don't want to uh, repeat, I know that Ms. Lowy has added significant funding to SAMHSA with regard to mental health. We also have two provisions in authorizing provisions in the bill. Uh, one provides grants to community service organizations that deal with mental and, and behavioral health and also another authorizing provision specifically for healthcare workers who are facing those types of problems uh, during the crisis. Again, Mr. Chairman, uh, I probably have spoken too long, but I can't express my enthusiasm for this bill. This really is the HEROES Act in the sense that it's helping everyone, but it's particularly helping those uh, who are the heroes, who are on the front line, our healthcare workers, our EMT workers. We've got to do more. Uh, I know that Mr. Cole said in the beginning um, suggested that, that somehow what's in this bill was not directly related to COVID. I could, you know, I, I, I respect you a great deal as the ranking member and as a person, but in all honesty, as you can tell from the things I mentioned, these are all directly related to the crisis. These are not ideology, ideological provisions. These are practical ways of dealing with the crisis right now. And that's really what this, is, this bill is all about. And I want to stress that, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, you again. Thank you very much. And now it's my privilege to yield to the distinguished ranking member of the uh, Rules Committee and uh, member of the Appropriations Committee and a member of all kinds of task forces and everything else, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. You can imagine how much I regret that my good friend and my chairman's good friend, ranking member Granger, couldn't be here tonight. Uh, and uh, so I, I regret that. And. Uh, I know she would have, uh, would have been here if she could in any way. Mr. Chairman, the pandemic we uh, currently face is unlike anything we've experienced in modern history, and so too has been our response. I'm very pleased with how Congress has worked together and quickly to provide urgent aid to those on the front lines and those struggling with the economic impacts of the efforts to slow the spread. Each of the four bills that have been enacted up to now uh, was ultimately the product of cooperation and bipartisan support. So it's very disappointing to me personally to come before you today on this bill, which has been crafted behind closed doors and without any Republican input whatsoever. This is not the spirit of cooperation that the American people expect from their leaders during difficult times. And because there's been no cooperation, this bill is ultimately going to become law. Uh, I know what can come from members working across the aisle together. It's what led to the creation of an historic infectious disease rapid reserve fund that allowed the administration to respond immediately to the emerging threat uh, from this new uh, coronavirus as we worked to understand where resources were needed. I was proud to work with my counterpart on the Labor, Health, and Human Services Committee, Chairwoman uh, uh, DeLauro. Uh, on that fund and even prouder to see it used so effectively. So knowing what we can achieve when we work together, I'm very disappointed uh, to be before you today to testify against the bill that has a 309, uh, that has $309 billion of funding in our subcommittee's jurisdiction, uh, but was created entirely without input 
uh, or that of any other Republicans on the Appropriations Committee. I want to pause there for a minute. Normally, the Labor Age Subcommittee on Appropriations has a budget of between 180 to 90 billion dollars. And um, the four years I was privileged to be chairman, my ranking member, Ms. Delora, voted with me, worked with me in that process diligently, uh, and voted for final passage each time. Last year, when she was chairman, did exactly the same thing. We are used to collaborating together. I voted with her on her first bill, and it's my hope when we get back to regular appropriations, uh, Mr. Chairman, I can do that again. But to have a $309 billion labor age portion of this bill and not to have been consulted about it, asked a question about it, what are your priorities in it, that's not how I know my chairwoman works. Uh, she does all those things. So that didn't happen because the speaker decided it wasn't going to happen. Uh, and that means this bill is not going to happen. Doesn't mean everything in the bill is bad. There's some great things in this bill. Uh, there's some other things we don't think are great. But a bill that comes out of this House with no Republican votes is not going to pass the Republican Senate and is not going to be passed uh, or signed by a Republican president. So I suspect this is a lot more about political messaging and political positioning and it is about rendering relief to the American people. And I regret that because, again, we worked together for four bills in a row and had almost unanimous support in the House. Each whip team on each side working together to maximize the vote for bills that we both knew were important. I think that spirit can be recaptured, but it's not going to be recaptured when we offer bills that have zero input from the other side, when the other side is not consulted, not included, not asked, and when we put things in the bill that we know the other side cannot or will not accept. That's what's going on here. So with all due respect to my very good friend, Chairman Lowy, who I admire enormously and who leads our committee with great professionalism, great dignity, and frankly, great bipartisanship, uh, it's my hope that the House will reject this measure and go back to the cooperative nature that has been the hallmark of our governmental response to this pandemic. The American people deserve that. And to my good friend, Mr. Pallone, again, I just disagree with you. Not everything in this bill has anything to do with coronavirus. You can hold a different opinion. That's perfectly appropriate. But you're not going to get the votes in the United States Senate for that provision to prevail. When there's so much we could work on together, I'm just sorry we're having uh, this kind of disagreement here tonight. So I look forward to debating the bill tomorrow. It's, a, again, a pretty easy bill for every Republican to propose, uh, oppose, since not a single Republican was asked for any input or any proposal. And we're going to spend this with no committee meetings, uh, very, I, I would suspect, no amendments, no nothing. So, you know, if we want to have political fireworks and a show on the floor tomorrow, that's exactly what we're going to get. But that's because this was designed to produce that. This wasn't designed to become law. This is a political messaging bill, pure and simple. Or perhaps it's, let me be charitable, a political negotiating thing. That's fine. You could have dropped the bill. We all do that. Didn't have to drag everybody back for that. But, uh, again, I just don't see this as remotely likely to become law, remotely bipartisan. And again, I regret my friends who acted in a very bipartisan way for four consecutive bills, uh, working with everybody, not always getting what they wanted, but uh, offering good suggestions. We didn't always get what we wanted either, and we put some things in bills that we didn't particularly agree with, but we recognized our friends control the House of Representatives and their priorities needed to be included and they needed to be part of the discussion, and they made sure that they were part of the discussion. No complaint with that. Uh, that's exactly what's going to happen when a Republican Senate looks at this and a Republican president. They're going to decide they want to be part of the process too, and this is not going to be anything like our final work product. And I, I fear that we run the danger of cementing people into their spots when they vote for something that we haven't agreed to and make it more difficult to compromise and delay compromise. You know, we've acted with extraordinary speed 
uh, given the crisis that's overtaken us. And both parties can be proud of that, and the administration can be proud of it. We put aside our differences, we work together. Why my friends have decided not to continue down that course, which has been productive, uh, I don't know, but uh, perhaps they'll explain that to us in the course of the debate. So, again, forgive me for going on, uh, Mr. Chairman. I feel very strongly about this. I think this is a great missed opportunity to work together in good faith. And instead, uh, you know, we're going to have a partisan vote tomorrow that we didn't need to have, and we're going to delay things that, in my opinion, didn't need to be delayed. So, that, yield back. Well, I want to thank um, the ranking member for um, his comments, and I want to begin by thanking all of you, our, our um, esteemed chairman and chairwoman, um, for being here with us. Um, I'm a bit surprised to hear that there was um, that there's a feeling that there is no consultation um, on behalf of Republicans on this bill because. Let me tell you, there's, there's a lot to hate from the Democratic side on this bill that looks much more like Republican proposals. Um, let me start, before I give my statement and ask um, a couple of questions, let me start by putting into the record a few letters of opposition that have come from our friends in labor. Um, one of them is from IBEW uh, in opposition of having the... <clears throat> the GROW Act added um, to the bill. The other one comes from uh, Bakery, Confectionery, Tobacco Workers, and Grain Millers International Union, BCTGM, Directors Guild of America, DGA, International Brotherhood of Boilermakers, International Alliance of Theoretical um, Stage Employees, IATSE, International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, International Longshore, and Warehouse Union, uh, International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, Musicians and Pension Security, Pension Rights Center, SEIU, United Food um, and Commercial Workers International Union, United Steel Workers, Western Conference of Teamsters Pension, um, United Steel Workers. Now, while it's good to see all of you um, today, and it's good to see that you are all in good health despite the pandemic ranging around us. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge why we're here. When I boarded my flight yesterday, I was in a region whose small businesses are struggling to survive in an economy that has grounded to a halt. It's a place where families are waiting bumper to bumper in a seemingly endless line of cars for food banks because their funds have run out and their children are hungry. It is a place where donation drives are the only way some of our medical workers fighting to save lives can get the PPE to stay safe. This place the region that I call home is not an obscure place across an ocean. It's the Inland Empire. It's in California, the fifth largest global economy. Those businesses I mentioned are the mom and pop shops that make our community what it is. And those people in line are not Folks from some far away place, they are our neighbors, they are our friends, and they are our family members. And those donation drives are my community's way of stepping up because for all that this Congress has done in its previous bills, it's still not enough. They're calling 911. They are crying for help. We are here today and tomorrow to answer their call for help. And so that is why today, while it has taken us five hours to take up this bill, this rule, 
The people we know and we love need us to do more in this time of unprecedented danger. The question before us has nothing to do with politics. The question before us is whether or not we support the very communities we live in and the people and businesses that make us call those communities home. The HEROES Act does exactly that. I made a number of specific requests for this package after many, many, many days and several hours on the phone with people in my community. I am happy to see that you answered their call for help in this legislation. I led more than 75 of our colleagues in a call for hazard pay for medical workers who are putting their lives on the line to keep others alive. And protections against employer retaliation for any medical worker who is a whistleblower for in inadequate PPE. This is personal. Three of my closest family members are nurses. They're on the front lines of this pandemic, just like countless of other doctors, nurses, and medical staffers across our country. We're asking them to risk their lives right now, and they deserve proper support. And I am glad to see that these provisions are in this bill. I also led a push for virtual naturalizations to help the more than 100,000 Americans in waiting take that final step to citizenship with an online oath ceremony. These are people that have already uh, proved and have been approved to become our fellow Americans. The only thing standing in the way is the oath ceremony, which is on hold to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And while everyone agrees that we must prevent the spread of this virus, including in our immigration process, in the age of the internet, there is no excuse for a stall naturalization process. And in my region of Southern California, 10,000 people were denied this final step to naturalization in March. 10,000 more were denied in April. And 10,000 more will be denied in May. Thankfully, the HEROES Act includes funding for virtual naturalization ceremonies too. Aside from fulfilling requests like these, the HEROES Act continues the vital support started in the CARES Act. It expands economic impact payments for the American people. It has new investments in small businesses, small business support, like the Paycheck Protection Program, and a new employee retention tax credit. It extends unemployment benefits for the more than 20 million Americans who are out of work through January of next year, and much, much more. To me, a profound new provision honors the most sacred and fundamental ingredient in our democracy, and that is our vote. The reason why we debated for five hours the HEROES Act has new resources to ensure our election is safe in November and our census count is, an, is as accurate as possible. And as I close, I want to revisit something I said earlier. This is not about politics. It is not about supporting the American people. It is about supporting the American people in this moment. It is about the incredible need in our communities. And it is about answering their call for help. 
so our fellow Americans don't go hungry or lose their homes, so our businesses don't falter in a free fall. And so one day when this horrible virus is behind us, we will have a society to emerge to. With that, I want to thank you again for being here. And I am going to now recognize Dr. Burgess. Well, thank you. And uh, first off, um, Actually, Madam Chair, my remarks were not in my capacity here. They were from the testimony. So I'm actually the next person on the Rules Committee to be recognized. Happy, happy to yield to the ranking member. Thank you very much. It's awkward, I know, and I'm sorry. OK, let me correct the record, since I'm having a hard time breathing here, too. Let me recognize the ranking member for his remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. And again, I recognize the circumstances make this difficult <laughs> and unusual. Um, and I do, do want to take, make a couple of remarks, though. To my friends on the Democratic side, if there are things in this bill that you don't like, we're not responsible for any of them. So this is a totally Democratic written bill. So if any of you have a concern, please don't point out the Republicans or say we wrote some, because we didn't. Second, I'm proud that you have requests that you made that you got in the bill. Nobody asked me for a request or any other Republican was last to submit anything for this legislation, not one. Uh, and yes, that's personal, because if basically you decide we're going to exclude 200 members from advocating for their constituents, because we're not going to have any amendments uh, on these bills. So we've got a bill that nobody asked any Republican uh, about, uh, that no Republican suggestion that I'm aware of has been included. If it was, it was probably included without the Republican being consulted for whatever reason or because it happened to be in common with the Democrats. And that's perfectly fine. I understand that. And again, uh, you're going to get a partisan wall of resistance tomorrow because you decided to craft it in an exclusively partisan way. I regret that. We have been very productive working together in the middle of a national crisis in a way that I think every member of this Congress can be proud of. Four bills in a row with essentially no partisan dissent. And again, I know how we operate on the Appropriations Committee under the leadership of my friend, the Chairman, and we are bipartisan. Majority obviously makes a final call, but everybody's uh, suggestions are included, are considered. We have the opportunity to do that. That's not what happened in this particular case. That's what happened four times previously. Uh, I also have, uh, Madam Chair, if I may, uh, the statement of administration uh, policy uh, for the record I'd like to submit. And of course, not surprisingly, it said if presented to the president, his advisors would recommend a veto. Without objection. Thank you very much. So that, those are the points I want to make. I'm going to have very little to say about the substance of the bill, because I've had you know, just a few hours to look at it, 72 hours, to be fair. Uh, it's a mammoth bill, but uh, I want to make it clear for the record. I didn't have anything to do with what's in it. Uh, neither did any other Republican, nor was any request given. So again, if there's any complaints on the Democratic side, I would suggest you take them to your own leadership. Please don't foist it off on us, because uh, we didn't have much to do with this thing. So um, it, it'll be an interesting debate tomorrow. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, again, thank you very much. And sorry for the awkward circumstances of being on both sides of the podium. Pretty unusual. I don't, uh, don't like it, and I know it's difficult for everybody else. But with that, I yield back. Thank you. I want to um, thank the ranking member. And I um, just want to add that um, I forced and fought for my community. I didn't wait for somebody to come and ask me for anything and just um, pushed my way through. Um, with that, I want to recognize Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thank you, and I want to thank uh, Chairwoman of the Appropriations Committee, Mr. Perlmutter, I want to thank you. A couple months ago, we were in a late rules committee, and I think at that point I was, uh, was late. Uh, and I just said earlier on the, on the amendment to the rules, we're, we're not in regular order. Um, this thing that we face is, uh, is of monumental uh, proportions. 
And at that time, I remember asking Mr. Scott, because there was a section in there you couldn't tell if it was a 1% increase in unemployment or 10% depending on the decimal point. And he said, well, and I said, is it 10% or is that when the unemployment provisions kick in? And he says, no, I think it's just 1%. And I, that made me feel a little better, except that we've really gone 10, almost 15% uh, from in two months in terms of unemployment. I mean, just something that's mind boggling. And so the, the response in this particular piece of legislation is something that is proportionate and is absolutely necessary. And I want to thank the chairwoman uh, for particularly three things. I mean, a whole bunch, but the three things. Uh, Mr. Morelli and I uh, sponsored a bill uh, for $500 billion for state governments to help backfill uh, the losses that they are seeing every single moment. Uh, Mr. Nagus and Mr. Morelli and I uh, sponsored uh, assistance to local governments. And Mr. Morelli and Mr. Nagus and I asked for flexibility with respect to money that had already been appropriated for state and local governments to, so that they could have access because this is such a dramatic drop in revenues. And all three of those things have been uh, part of this. So we can avoid, because in Colorado already, we're laying off people. The state government is. Uh, City of Denver just announced furloughs. And those furloughs are across the board. So it's law enforcement. It's firefighters. It's transportation workers. It's people helping with unemployment uh, insurance claims. It's across the board. This is so essential. And I would, I would say to my friend from Oklahoma, it was expected and anticipated uh, by many of us on the Democratic side that the drop in revenue that the states and local governments are seeing uh, so dramatically would have been in that fourth package. And the, the need to get this uh, resolved uh, really does require the urgency uh, in bringing it forward tomorrow. That's the first thing. There's $100 billion in there for K through 12 and higher education. And so I would, I also, there was a, a point that uh, Mr. Cole raised in the earlier hearing about the frontline individuals and what we're demanding of them. And we are, there's no question, uh, whether it's a grocery worker or a firefighter or medical staff. But we're also demanding a lot of other people to operate remotely to reduce the spread of the virus. And one of those groups are teachers who are going above and beyond the call of duty to try and educate their students remotely, out of nowhere. I mean, it just one day they're teaching in a classroom, and the next Monday they're teaching uh, remotely. And I know this personally because my wife is teaching high school math, algebra, geometry, trigonometry uh, from the office, and I'm operating out of the dining room. And so I want to thank you for that. A couple, three other things. Uh, I would say to my friend, I feel like I'm having a conversation with you, Mr. Cole, and it's just a one-way conversation, but um, a request was made by me of uh, Republicans uh, in connection with a piece of legislation that some might say doesn't fit in this bill, and that's the Safe Banking Act. But the reason it was included, and my uh, friends said, we'd love to support you on this, Ed, but we're not, we don't think we're going to support this bill, uh, but we support the cannabis, is that it's a particular uh, piece of legislation that deals with essential businesses. 28 states have made cannabis businesses essential. It's 243,000 employees in the, and 28,000 businesses, but no access to the Paycheck Protection Program. There's a public safety element, which we've talked about because so much cash. There's a health safety element because of the cash and the potential for transmission of the virus because of this. And finally, it was bipartisan in the vote, uh, 321 to 103. I want to thank you for correcting some of the things in the Paycheck Protection Program to make it more flexible for small businesses, especially restaurants who at least in Colorado, have not been allowed to open. Uh, will be opening, I think, soon. Uh, but there were too many restrictions. There's housing funds and rental funds because of the 
defaults that we see and are coming, and there's hazard pay for those individuals on the front line. So there is uh, a tremendous amount in this piece of legislation that is so urgently needed. Um, for us to go from virtually no unemployment in this country, it was as low as it's been in forever, to 36 million unemployed in two months, we have got to, to uh, take out all stops. And quite frankly, I've heard some people complain about the size of this bill. It's a fraction of what's been lost from the economy so far. And our job and our responsibility is to preserve this economy, to preserve what we can in a moment that none of us predicted, none of us wanted, and there is no formula for it. And I just want to tell you uh, that I appreciate the service and appreciate the product, and it's not perfect. And I would say to my friend, again from Oklahoma, that the negotiation that there will be negotiation between the House and the Senate over a lot of provisions. That's absolutely what happened with CARES First. And I, um, I know that my friend will also be a participant in those negotiations at that point. We got to get this moving. With that, I yield back to the chair. Uh, thank you. I would now like to recognize Mr. Woodall. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I had uh, one question for each uh, uh, witness. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I, I never get tired of hearing Tom Cole say nice things about you. Uh, I, I, it, truthfully, it hurts my feelings a little bit because I think he's saying nice things about the committee in general, which leaves me a little wanting here on the Rules Committee. But he's been, he's been lauding so many praises on Mr. McGovern today that I, 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 feel, uh, I feel well represented. Uh, can you point to something that explains that dramatic departure from four bills in a row that have always displayed the, the caring, cooperative character of the Appropriations Committee uh, with this uh, bill that stands in stark contrast that's before us today? Thank you for your question, and I hope I can answer it to your satisfaction. Uh, this is a broad bill that touches on a number of key priorities. And instead of a leadership-driven measure, the bill is a product of hundreds of ideas that we receive from members and includes contributions from almost every committee in the House. I can't comment, and my dear friend Mr. Cole made some very good points, but on our side of the aisle, we have held countless conference calls to discuss the pandemic and our response. In fact, my whole day when I'm home in these last weeks was on conference calls. I'm sure that you have done the same. I know there are things in the bill that some of you may not like, but when the Senate didn't express an interest in rolling up its sleeves and writing another bill together, frankly, it forced our hand. We wanted to do this together. In the last two months, we have worked together to enact four emergency supplementals, and I expect that we can do this again, as my good friend uh, Mr. Cole has said. So I think what we have to do now, in my judgment, pass the bill, and then Ranking Member Granger, Ranking Member Cole, and of all of our other wonderful chairs, Republican and Democrats, because we do work so closely on appropriations, can really do what we do best. Let's sit at the negotiating table, write an agreement, that includes the best ideas from Democrats and Republicans. So we put these ideas together, and it wasn't the traditional way. We got ideas from everybody that contacted us. So now let's do it. Let's do it together and put together a bill that really matches 
this time. I must say, my friend, that I can say it to all my friends, I've been in this Congress over 30 years. We've had some crises, right? <laughs> my friend, Ranking Member Cole, but I have never experienced anything like this. So when this bill was put together, I'm hoping now we can all contribute to it and really have a good product that we can all support that can respond to a time that most of us have never, never experienced. Well, you always bring a touch of optimism uh, to the Rules Committee. I am always an optimist. It, it, it's not always uh, in, uh, in short supply on the Rules Committee, but sometimes uh, it is, and I appreciate you adding, uh, uh, adding to it. I, uh, I too believe that, uh, that, that crises, uh, because, because of the faith I have, not just in this institution collectively, but the, the members individually, I believe crises often bring out the very best uh, in us, uh, uh, which is why I'm, I think I'm, I'm so disappointed by the departure from, a, from, the, from the partnership of the past to the, to the partisanship of the, of the presence. I sign on 100 percent to your vision of Republicans and Democrats sitting around the negotiating table and getting it done. I hoped it would have come before the bill uh, was on its way in a partisan way, because as Mr. Cole stated earlier, I worry about folks getting, getting locked into their corners. Um, that same concern, Mr. Pallone, uh, goes to a conversation you and Mr. Cole uh, had about uh, whether these are really emergency uh, uh, items uh, in this bill or whether it's everything in the kitchen sink that has wound up uh, ranking uh, provision for a very uh, long time. And I have no doubt uh, that, uh, that he, he, not just the urgency with which he sees it, but the emergency with which he sees it for the constituents that, that he serves. But I'm a budget committee guy. And we actually define emergency in the House rules. So we had a conversation earlier today about whether we were going to follow the House rules or, uh, or not, and whether they, they covered it or not. But the House rules specifically say, be, be wary about these big bills that claim to be emergencies, because members sometimes have a tendency to, to start adding things in. And we, in a crisis, want the dollars to all go to victims of that crisis, to families who are in need. So Mr. Cole said he thought, Perhaps there were a wide variety of provisions included. You said you thought uh, it was all emergency and COVID related. Am I characterizing that properly? I raise that because yes. when the amendment uh, process uh, comes, traditionally uh, in, the, in the Rules Committee, we waive points of order uh, so that none of the House rules apply. We, we, we take all of the provisions that were put in to protect members and their rights, and then we waive them all prophylactically. Uh, as a Budget Committee member, I don't want to see us waive the point of order against including measures that, unbeknownst to you, have been slipped in that are not emergency related in any way, shape, or form uh, because you've been involved in the drafting process and I have not. Uh, do you believe that I can find support on the Democratic side of the aisle because you all have combed through this, because you do know it line by line, and I've just seen it for, uh, for a couple of hours, uh, get support uh, to raise those points of order against those non-emergency things that, that tend to, I don't know, confirm the worst about us for our constituents as opposed to, to uh, confirm our very best? Well, I do believe, and, you know, having worked on major parts of the bill, that, that everything uh, that's in the bill is related to the COVID crisis. Now, you know, in some ways it's easier for me to make that case for the things that I mentioned because they're mostly health-related, right? But take whatever it is. I mean, uh, we talked about what there's about a trillion dollars for help to state and local governments. Now, I suppose one could argue, well, you know, if, if the state and local governments go broke or bankrupt, how is that related to the COVID crisis? But it is, because they're, they have all this lost revenue. And if they don't get the revenue, they're going to be laying off workers who are going to provide services during the COVID crisis. So, you know, I mean, you can argue over the individual details, but I don't think there's anything in here that is not related to the COVID crisis and what we face right now, honestly. They, well, the chairman accused me earlier of being unwilling to take yes for an answer. I've gotten a commitment to Republicans and Democrats sitting around the negotiating table and a commitment to get rid of all the, uh, the, the nonsense and, and, and really address the crisis that is, uh, is before us. So, Madam Chair, I will, I will uh, yield back, having gotten yes for an answer to both of my questions. And I, I thank you all very much for your, for your work. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, and I will recognize Mr. Ruskin. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, let's see, I wanted to start with uh, just a couple of corrective notes from the yep. last hearing yes. that we did. Um, in, in the succession of uh, LESCO amendments, it was stated at one point that um, all of us had uh, money put in our MRAs from the last CARES Act. And um, I think that that is a piece of misinformation that we need to correct. According to the House Committee on Administration, there was $25 million that was appropriated to the House of Representatives, which has gone overwhelmingly to pay contractors, including people in the cafeteria, people in maintenance, people in technology, the contractors who were brought in to set up people's uh, computer systems at home, and so on. As far as I've been able to determine, there's been no money that's been put into anyone's MRA. So I just think we should be certain that we're in the business of circulating the truth and facts and not misinformation or much less disinformation. But I, I don't think that's what it was, but I think the, the gentle lady was just um, mistaken on that point. Secondly, it was also stated after um, our majority leader came and made a very impassioned statement about the, the importance of passing the resolution um, for uh, adjusted voting, um, he invoked Abraham Lincoln and Lincoln's uh, famous uh, statement in his uh, address to the House of Representatives um, in 1862 on December 1st, where um, he talked about the dogmas of the quiet past being inadequate to the stormy present. And it's where Mr. Hoyer quoted the passage, as our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. And um, in a critique of Mr. Hoyer, one of the subsequent witnesses, um, I think, uh, misstated um, what President Lincoln was saying. He linked that statement to a proposal to relocate or repatriate uh, slaves to Liberia or to Haiti. Um, that was not at all the essence, the substance, and the purpose of Lincoln's statement uh, at that point. And if you read the entire passage, it's very clear that what Lincoln is doing, and, in, and this has been confirmed by several historians I checked with, is he was laying the predicate for the Emancipation Proclamation just a month later. And I'm just complete part of the passage for you there, so you'll see what exactly he was saying. Um, and it's actually a passage that uh, is not irrelevant to our current situation. Um, Lincoln said, the fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We are for the Union. The world will not forget that we say this. We know how to save the Union. The world knows we do know how to save it. We, even we here, hold the power and the responsibility. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of earth. Other means may succeed, this could not fail. The way is plain, peaceful, generous, just, a way which if followed the world will forever applaud and God must forever bless. December 1, 1862, Abraham Lincoln, exactly a month before he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. So um, I, I think it was either an intentional or an unintentional slur on Abraham Lincoln to say that that passage was designed to send uh, former slaves uh, to other countries. Um, so Madam Chair, uh, I rise in favor of the HEROES Act. Um, this is a, a moment of great and historic emergency in our country. We are in a public health catastrophe. We've been brought to our knees in the health system. We've been brought to our knees in terms of food supply. Uh, we have tens of millions of Americans who've been thrown out of work, and we've already lost 82,000 of our people. This is an absolute emergency. And I wish some of our friends who appeared earlier today could summon up a fraction of the outrage that they displayed about a rules change to allow us to maintain the continuity of government about these conditions that surround and pervade us and define every single one of our states, every single one of our districts to a different degree. 
Now, um, the HEROES Act has many provisions in it, and I want to speak um, quickly about the financial provisions in it, but what I really want to focus on is the, the testing, the contact tracing, and so on. But we know that this includes a trillion dollars to state, local, territorial, and tribal governments and the District of Columbia government to cover the cost of first responders, health workers, teachers, firefighters, cops, responders, people on the front line. That's why this is called the HEROES Act, because this money is going to go right to the people who are getting us through this crisis. And because of the pressure of the Senate, we know earlier legislation already went to go to a place where it could bail out the airlines industries, uh, the hotel industry, uh, the cruise industry, and so on. Okay, be that as it may, this is the legislation that is the crucible for America. This is the legislation that puts us to the test about whether we're really going to invest in the people who are fighting the battle on the front lines. A trillion dollars for the cops, the firefighters, the first responders, the nurses, the doctors, the hospitals, um, the health workers. $200 billion for essential workers so they can receive or continue to receive hazard pay for the work that they are doing to try to rescue us and get us out of this nightmare. Now, so all of that is to the good. I'm not seeing in there everything that I wanted. I liked the legislation um, that was advanced by Congresswoman Jayapal based on what's taking place in Europe. We're headed here in Trump's America to greater than 15% unemployment. We might hit 20% unemployment. Makes me think what they'd be saying if President Obama were president. I remember they took two weeks to castigate Obama for wearing a tan suit at one point. What would they be saying if Obama were president and we'd lost 82,000 people? 35 million people thrown out of work. But I digress for the moment. Um, so, um, we've got to get out of this situation. And Dr. Bright said it when he testified earlier today. I wasn't able to see the testimony because I was here. But he said, America has no plan. America lacks a plan. And any general will tell you, if you go into battle, and the president says this is wartime, with no plan and no strategy, you're going to lose. It is overwhelmingly likely you're going to lose. Any football coach will tell you, you send the team in with no plan, you're going to lose. And we got no plan. In fact, to the extent there's a plan, it's pitting the states against each other. It's like we're back in the Articles of Confederation, where this state fights with another state to get the materials they need. And groups of states have to fight with other groups of states to try to get the PPEs that they need. My governor in Maryland, who happens to be a Republican, called out the National Guard after he got some PPE equipment and some testing kits uh, from South Korea because he was afraid that the federal government was going to steal it. And he called up the National Guard and was very open about why he was doing it. So the federal government, rather than coordinating the logistics and bringing the country together, which is the role of the federal government under our Constitution, has pitted the states against each other in this brutal and wasteful, profligate competition for supplies, and then has actually pilfered some of the supplies from the states. Okay. That is not a strategy for victory against this virus. It's not a strategy to get us out of it. Now, the governments that have gotten our people out of it have all used the same technique. We don't have a treatment, and we don't have a vaccine. And we've got to be working for treatment and vaccine. But in the meantime, what has worked? Well, social distancing, that's the only thing that's given us any shred of hope in the US social distancing, and then mass public testing. You need to test, and then you need aggressive, vigilant contact tracing to be in touch with everybody who a COVID-19 positive person's been in touch with. Then you need to have a supportive isolation and quarantine of that person to make sure that they're not infecting other people. You need to put the virus on the run. Forget all of these 
ridiculous, absurd attempts to pick partisan fights and to inject partisanship at every moment by imputing partisanship to someone else. That's all we hear. This is partisan, partisan, partisan. It's all a massive distraction and evasion from what we need to be doing. Enough of that. Let's put it to bed. Okay, we need to get together. We need to be one America, one nation to fight the virus together. Okay, that's how we're gonna get out of it. But we don't have a plan. And we don't have a, and we don't have a strategy. Now, Mr. Pallone, here's where I'm gonna come to you. And you and I have been able to speak under these difficult, excruciating conditions a couple of times. And I have tried not to bedevil you and make your life more difficult than it already is. Because I can only imagine what it's like to be a chair and you've got 40 or 50 people in your committee calling you and you've got other people calling you and it's very tough to get anything done. Now, there are things that I like here that I've been able to see in the legislation. You are pushing the administration towards a plan. You are pushing for massively expanded testing and tracing. The president has expressed reservations about testing and of course we know why. Testing will reveal how pervasive the virus actually is and the fact that it's still out of control in many parts of the country. So we, we need to get a real plan for testing. We need a real plan for contact tracing. But my question is this, and I introduced legislation with, uh, with my friend, Congresswoman Shalala, who, as you know, was the Secretary of HHS, and with, I think we've got 70 or 75 co-sponsors called the Reopen America Act. And here's what we proposed, and you'll see how it's the exact opposite of what we've seen so far from the administration. We say the federal government should take over the supply chain and the logistics and guarantee that it will get the PPEs to the states, it will get the ventilators to the states, so we don't have people uh, going into cardiac arrest or suffocating at the hospital for uh, lack of a ventilator. The federal government, instead of pitting the states against each other, will coordinate the logistics. We propose for doing that the creation of a health equipment production board, modeled after the war, modeled after the war production board of World War II. Let's call together people from HHS and CDC and NIH and the Department of Defense, the Defense Logistics Agency, get them together and say, you are the team that will make sure that the supply chain is being fed so the states have the stuff that they need. Who's doing that now? We don't know. I see in your bill you've said we need one person to coordinate it. With all due respect, Mr. Plon, I'm afraid that person could be Jared Kushner. It'll be his 15th job. They'll add another job for him, and then nothing will ever happen. We need an institutional reorganization of the executive branch of government, despite the erratic qualities of the uh, chief executive. We need to create a body that will coordinate the logistics and put us on the map in terms of fighting the virus. And then, here's the other part I would like you to respond to, and I see you've moved somewhat in this direction by saying that the states need plans and we'd like to see a plan from HHS. We propose something much more formalized. How does the federal government work with the states in what we consider our federalism? There was a time when there used to be a real partnership, a real dialogue, and a a strategic collaboration between the national government and the states. Here, either the president shows up one day and he's King Kong, and he says, I'm gonna tell you what to do, but of course it's all gone the next day. The next day, he's back to being a complete bystander where he's basically just grading the state, so you're doing okay, you're not doing okay. Sometimes he even lures a state into doing something like Georgia, like I think you should go back, then they go back, then he turns on that governor. I mean, it's chaos. It is helter-skelter and everybody knows it. Everybody knows that there's no plan, that there's no strategy, and what we need is a real strategy. So here's what I propose. Let's use the strongest power we've got, the power of the purse, to say, we will invest in the states, we will invest in your reopening, and getting us back on our feet in terms of commerce, education, social life, the workplace, entertainment, everything. We will help you if you submit your plans to the Secretary of HHS, you can meet two criteria. One, your hospitals can meet the demand in your state so you're not overwhelmed. And two, you've got the virus on the run by having the infection rate going down, meaning 
that the transmission rate is less than one, that a person who has COVID-19 will be infecting fewer than one person, 0.3 or 0.4, 0.7. But if it's above one, if it's where we were before, 1.8, 1.9, 2.1, you've got pandemic conditions. It's out of control. So show us that, that you've brought the virus under control. The hospitals can meet the demand. At that point, give us your plan for reopening. We'll take all the best criteria we can get from the NIH and the CDC. And by the way, instead of censoring the Centers for Disease Control, which is what the President did last week and killed their guidelines, we will work with them to create the best guidelines and then help the states do it. And once we approve your plan, we'll pay for you to reopen. Because all the economists tell us that a dollar spent in really winning the war against the virus will save us $1,000 later through recurring outbreaks and shutdowns. So I guess my question to you, Mr. Brown, is just do you think that there's enough in this legislation to give us the structure that we need to safely, reliably, durably reopen America and not be thrust back into a terrible cycle of just random reopenings, April 1, Easter, May Day, 4th of July, whatever it is, and then we're thrust back into more outbreaks and more shutdowns? Well, I'll try to be brief. The, the simple answer is yes. Um, and I think you have very much aware of what we're trying to do in this bill. Um, and as a constitutional scholar, which I know you are, you're very aware of different ideologies about federal versus state relations. And, you know, I watch what goes on in Korea and some of these other countries that have been very successful um, in ways that we have not. And I do believe a lot of it has to do with the fact that they are much more centralized, uh, you know, places where, you know, the central government in uh, Seoul or Singapore or whatever, you know, has the ability to, to do things in one voice nationally centralized. Not advocating for that, that's not our system. But look, let me just give you an example. Um, we knew that the president was not interested in having a national testing plan. He has said that, right? He wants to give all the responsibility to the states, play some minor role maybe in helping them out a little bit, but basically it's their responsibility. He has said it. I'm not making this up. Um, so in the last bill that the president signed, we pushed very hard to say there should be a national testing plan, and the language says national testing plan, national testing strategy. And we pushed very hard to have specific benchmarks, timetables for what exactly that plan consisted of. Um, when we went to negotiate uh, with the Senate, with Senator McConnell, with the majority leader, uh, they were very much opposed to that because they did not want to have a national plan. They did not want to have the benchmarks and the timetables and the metrics, the specifics. And so that bill did not have what I wanted. It did have a semblance of it, but it, was, it wasn't as good as I liked, or we liked, I should say. And lo and behold, in implementing that bill in the last couple of weeks, uh, there's been a tremendous pushback from the President and the White House. They, they basically said, give us your state plans um, and we'll have a, a floor. You know, we'll test maybe 2% as a floor, but if you want to go to 8 or 9 or whatever, uh, you know, we'll help you. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to have the resources for it. So in this, in this bill, we went as far as we th thought that we could get um, the, the Republicans and the President to go, right? Maybe a little further, but mindful of the fact that, you know, they weren't going to make this uh, like what's happening in South Korea, for example. And so we do have, for the testing, the tracing, and the isolation, not only the, the money that's been pr provided by the appropriators, an additional 75 over the 25 for a total of 100, thank you, appropriators, but we all, we have those metrics, those benchmarks. And, and timetables. And specifically for the supply chain, we do set up a czar. Because remember, I'm not just worried about the supply chain now, Mr. Raskin, for the personal protection equipment. I'm worried about the supply chain for the testing, for the contract tasting, and ultimately for the vaccine. And that's why when I asked my question today of Dr. Bright, I said, look, 
in my opinion, what's going on so far with the supply chain for all those other things on behalf of this administration has been a total failure, right? But are we going to see the same thing with the vaccines? He said, I'm afraid you may, because the same people are charged with the same ideology. And so we have the czar for the supply chain for everything uh, and benchmarks for all that, including for not only the testing, the tracing, but also for distribution of the vaccine once it's available. So when you look in this bill, it's not only the additional money for the provider fund, for the, uh, for the t uh, contact tracing, the testing, for so many things that you've talked about uh, so far here. But it's, a, it's an effort to try to have a national plan, a national effort, not just leave it up to the states, because it creates uh, huge gaps if you do that. Well, would you United agree states the states are begging for national leadership? Even no the best question. governors, Governor Hogan and Cuomo, the ones who have been on the front lines, are saying we cannot do this by ourselves. They can. We need the central government of the United States to be coordinating logistics and bringing some rationality in the distribution of these scarce supplies. And then also, even if one state um, you know, performs yeoman service in terms of being able to reopen in a safe way, if the surrounding states don't, and it's chaos, then immediately it pours over. And, and right? Mr. Raskin, let me tell you this. If you look at the testing plans that have been submitted from the various states to Admiral Girard, right, you'll see huge variations. My state is 8%, 7 or 8%, you know, they want to test. Other states are practically nothing, maybe 1% or 2%. And so this is going to continue, these huge variations, and that's not good when you have a when, you, when okay. we're all in this so together. Th that's my question for you. We're putting up all this money. The critical power we have is the power of the purse. And why don't we attach conditions to it? That is the moment that they want the money for recovery, for reopening, for testing, for tracing. That is the moment we can say, great, and we will work with you. We will use the scientific expertise that we've got, the technical expertise we've got to improve your plan so that all the plans are good and we can reopen together as a country. And I believe we have that in this. And I believe that when you said this is the most important bill that we will have passed, the reason for that, in my opinion, is because this is the bill, the HEROES Act is a bill that will get us to a safe and, and, uh, and, and adequate reopening so that our economy can grow again and we can get rid of the virus. The problem is, you know, will, will the Senate and will the President accept these conditions that go along with the appropriations that are in this bill? And that remains to be seen. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I would just, because the hour is late, number one, I want to thank you, my friend, for your enthusiastic, thoughtful comments, as I would say the same from all those who are staying here at this hour. We can, if we pass this bill, as my friend Mr. Cole had said before, we work together. The Republicans and Democrats on your committee, my committee, work together. We've had, I would say, how many hours? <laughs> Hundreds of hours of thoughtful recommendations, comments from colleagues such as yourselves who are here at this hour. I think what we have to do is pass this bill and then go back, my friend, uh, the ranking member, I was going to call you the chairman of the ranking member, and really get to work and make sure we're moving together, not arguing with each other. You know, the, the Democratic idea, the Republican idea, this bill came together because of thousands of ideas from our colleagues. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do? Some included, some were not. But I think at this point, let's pass this bill, and then I'm hoping we can move forward and work together. As we've all said before, I go to the nursing homes. 11 people just died this morning, I got a call, from a nursing home in my district. This is a crisis. Let's work together, figure this out, move forward, but I think we've got to pass this legislation, and then I hope, my good friend, Mr. Cole, that we can work together in a bipartisan way to continue to take action, to pass legislation, to appropriate money so it's directed towards 
frankly, what the experts are recommending to us doesn't matter so much what I'm recommending. It's what the experts are recommending to us. Let's move forward in a bipartisan way. And, I, and I just have two final quick questions. One is tons of complaints in my district about the 3P program, about the eight-week provision. Somebody just wrote in originally, it's, it's all due in eight weeks when everything's still shut down, they can't rehire people and so on. I just, will you explicate how that's corrected here? I understand that it is. Have we gone from eight weeks to 24 weeks? Well, I didn't, you're referencing now the, I uh, couldn't hear that the financial you. section? Yes, of the, of the payroll. I believe protection. it's in there, yeah, but it's not okay. my area, but I believe so. Okay. And well, and the, the other thing was, is the, 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 is the District of Columbia being made whole for having been treated as a territory and not akin to a state in the first round? Is Again, I think that's in there. Again, that's not our area, but I believe that is also okay. in there. All right, very good. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate uh, the gentleman's thoughtful questions. And uh, let me just tell the witnesses, you. you only got a couple hundred hours more, and then you're done. All right. Um, <laughs> I want to yield to the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess. I thank the chair. Um, this, Chairman, let, let, me, let me just ask you, this is, uh, I guess, the fifth bill. Mr. Cole has pointed out four of them were entirely bipartisan, and, and this one is, is unfortunately not. But if I've done the back of the envelope calculation correctly, that's, this is $3 trillion dollars we did two and a quarter trillion dollars March 27th. We've added to that. Uh, we did some before. So we're probably significantly north of five trillion dollars just on appropriated dollars in the last eight weeks. Is that a, a fair assessment? Yes, but what I am saying at this point, and I want to repeat my comments before, that I want to move ahead in a bipartisan yeah. way. Okay, and I, I appreciate that. Well, let me ask you this, though. I mean, you're the Appropriations Committee. Uh, Mr. Cole is uh, the ranking member on Labor H, important part of that committee. Are, are you going to do your normal appropriations process after we finish? The, what, at some point, are we going to pass appropriations bills before the end of the fiscal year? Let me say this, and my good friend Mr. Cole would know, it's not going to become law unless Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate, get together and there'll be some compromise. It may not be everything I want, may not be everything that my good friend Mr. Cole wants, but we've been appropriators for a while, and in the end, it's the good of the country and the recommendations of the expert and a lot of compromise that gets a bill that we hope will, uh, it's not going to be a panacea, but address in a real way the tremendous challenge that's happening today. Well, just help me out here. The strategic plan for the time period after this, you want this bill passed, say that it does, it's signed into law. Then what is the strategic plan for the remainder of the fiscal year as far as appropriations? Are we done? Is this, is this going to take care of everything that you otherwise would have appropriated during no. the course of a normal fiscal well, year? First of all, with the normal fiscal year, the House passes a bill, the Senate passes a bill, and then we get to work together on a compromise, hopefully the best ideas of both. So. That would be the next step. If this bill passes or when this bill passes, we're hoping that we can get the best ideas from the Senate and the White House. I think everyone agrees that this is an emergency, so yeah. it's a time for us to work together. After this point, are you going to, does your strategic plan in the Appropriations Committee include your normal process of holding the hearings, bringing the experts in, taking their testimony, and calculating what you need to appropriate, because we will reach the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we can't postpone that. And there will need to be an appropriations process that has occurred to fund things going forward. That's my only question. Are you yes. planning that? 
Yes, and as my good friend Mr. Cole will say, was it this week? You had a hearing just this week. Last week. Was it last week? What is today, Friday? Uh, Wednesday, wasn't it? Well, whatever. We, uh, Mr. Cole um, was part of a bipartisan hearing, uh, which was, as I understand it, very successful, and I saw most of it. So the process, to the best of our ability, is moving forward. At the end of the year, we hope we'll have the bills that we can work together in a bipartisan way, negotiate with the Senate. Look, this isn't regular order. Thank I've been you. in the Congress over 30 years. I've never been part of a process like this where we're wearing gloves, we can't sit together, we can't have good conversations, but to the best of our ability, and certainly Mr. Cole and Ms. Ms. DeLauro uh, conducted a really excellent hearing, and it was a bipartisan hearing, and, and was very successful. Would my friend so from I'm, Texas... Yeah, go ahead. Would my friend from Texas yield to... So I could make a point real quick? Absolutely. Quickly? Thank you very much. Uh, to my f chairman's point, we did have a very good hearing last week. It was very bipartisan. And just so the committee knows, I don't know where we'll end up. Obviously, we're operating under unusual circumstances, very difficult for all of us. But uh, Chairwoman Delora and I have already exchanged our priorities, had a discussion about the regular appropriations bill. We did not have a, any kind of discussion about this supplemental. Uh, and I know we are in the process on both sides of the aisle of soliciting input from our members, Democrat and Republican alike, about what they would like in the, in the bill. And at some point, uh, Chairwoman Delora undoubtedly present her mark. We'll have a discussion about that. We'll move through the process. So, uh, but I will tell you, at least to this point, under very difficult circumstances, that subcommittee, and I'm sure all the other committees under my good friend, the chairwoman's uh, supervision, have been working in a very bipartisan fashion, trying to get ready for their normal FY21 appropriations bills. Yield back. And I just want to say to my good friend, um, June was the original deadline when we were go going to complete all our appropriations bill. Um, I can't guarantee anything right now, but I know Lita Hoyer is still encouraging us to complete our work by June, but it's not regular order now. But yeah, I'm but gonna, I was just going to say that understanding the huge challenge, we have a responsibility each of us are taking this very seriously. And if you have ideas, come talk to us. We welcome everyone's ideas on appropriation. But at the end of the day, we have to get bills that are going to be passed in the House. So this is the time where we're having hearings, as Mr. Laura and Mr. Cole had. Other committees are having hearing. Our Veterans Committee had a hearing. But at some point, we have to complete our work we have to have a bill and fund the government. This is not a year like any other that I can ever recall. So, Chairman Pallone, the good news then is that as authorizers, we possibly could be back in business. We've been completely sidelined. I think you'll agree that none of the language that's in here, I don't recall being through the authorizing hearings that we've held in Energy and Commerce. Um, you're talking about an FMAP bump in Medicaid. We already did one in March. Is this one added on top of that? I don't recall the hearings where we discussed what is necessary, how much is necessary. We could have done that, but we haven't. But I guess what I'm saying to you, the good news is, as chairman of the most powerful authorizing committee in the United States House of Representatives, we should go forward after whatever happens here, we should go forward as authorizers and inform the appropriators. We need, to, we need to take back that part of our jurisdiction. We are the authorizing committee for the agencies that are under our, that are under our jurisdiction. And my only point is we should take that seriously. Yeah, this is, this is very frustrating. Just like Mr. Cole, I had no input, nobody called me. I don't recall a conference call with the speaker where she said, what are your best ideas? But normally, that happens during the committee process. 
And we have long hearings. We have subject matter experts on both sides of the dais, and we're generally very thorough, and we're very well read. Uh, and, and we've just completely negated all of that going through this. And again, I would just state the, the good news from a ENC authorizer standpoint is that uh, the appropriators and their strategic plan is to continue a, on, a, on a more regular order path. I would just like for us in the authorizing committee to be back in the business of, of being involved in this as well. Absolutely. I mean, I was only here for part of uh, your debate on the rules change, but that, from what I heard from Mr. McGovern and from what I can see from this rules change, that's exactly the purpose of it. In other words, in all these four or five bills that we've done during COVID, we, we, you know, we're, I'm a big stickler for regular order. Have to have a hearing. I remember subject, those days. Have Seems to have like a, a long time ago. Well, I know, but it says it has to have a hearing in the subcommittee, a markup in the subcommittee, markup in the full committee. You know, the whole process usually takes about six months. But we couldn't do that. First of all, as you know, or maybe you don't know, I'm sorry if you don't, that, you know, I have been told by the White House that unless you have an in-person hearing, um, they're not going to send uh, somebody from the administration. So Dr. Bright, because he's a whistleblower now, he was the only one, he was the first person who's willing to come from the administration. If I, I, if I, I called and asked for Azar and others, and many of them have spoken to us on the forum calls that we've had, which have been bipartisan, but they're not official hearings, right? And so the whole idea is, um, is as Mr. McGovern, I think, was saying before, is that if this rule change takes place tomorrow, which hopefully it will, and we can have these hearings virtually, and they can be official hearings where we have um, just what I said, you know, uh, hearing in the subcommittee, markup in the subcommittee, markup in the full committee. It'll all be, for the most part, it'll be done virtually, and we go back to business as usual. But you can't do that now because unless you have a, a hearing in person, like this one, uh, it's not official, and a markup in person it doesn't count under the rules. So that's been the problem, Dr. Burgess, and that's why it's, you know, I don't want to bring in that, but that's why it's very important uh, tomorrow not only pass the HEROES Act, but, it, but also pass that change to the rules so we can get back to business the way you describe. Even if you don't want to do it that way, it will we, be official. We squandered official uh, a significant amount of time uh, during February and the, and the first half of March. There were many of the, you talked about testing extensively. I'd talk to you about having a hearing on testing. I don't understand how the CDC got so far behind the curve. I, I, I don't to this day. Um, that is important information for us to know. We passed the Pandemic All Hazard Preparedness Act. It took us two Congresses to do it. I was subcommittee chair of the previous Congress. We did most of the work. We got it across the finish line, signed by the President, June of 2019. We had an opportunity during February to have real-time oversight as to what our work product had produced. Was it doing what we thought it would do? And, you know, quite honestly, we never asked the question. We had hearings on flavored tobacco, ticket stubs, horse racing, any number of things, but we didn't have the hearings on the pandemic that was percolating half a world away, which I would argue would have been an an appropriate thing to do. But look, we are where we are. You're the chairman of the most powerful authorizing committee in the United States House of Representatives, an enviable position, one to which we should all aspire one day. And I would like to see us reclaim some of that authorizing authority. You know, very frustrating to me that we, we were told on, on the health sub that we couldn't have, uh, we couldn't have the the key witnesses in went right across the hall in oversight and government reform chairman maloney had all of the principals for two days for two days and and we did not and that i think is is one of the things that people will look back and, and that's not a good record for us to have gone into this very desperate pandemic time with not having done the the work that we should have done when we knew trouble was coming, we knew trouble was well, brewing. Look, I, I don't, I don't want to uh, spend the time of the Rules Committee, but let me just say this. 
I believe that we put in place with that Preparedness Act um, the authority and the funding through appropes for the administration to do what had to be done to prepare for this pandemic. I think it's their fault. It's not because we didn't do our job. The, the bill was there, the bill was passed, the money was there. But in terms of the ability to have regular order, unless you pass, um, when we pass this tomorrow, we can go back to that. I couldn't, even today when we had Dr. Bright's hearing, I, I, you can't imagine all the machinations we had to go through to just be able to use the room, to just be able to set it up. We, you know, that was, doc, the attending physician did not, basically said to me, we cannot have these in-person hearings for regular order during this crisis. We cannot. And we still can't. It has to be virtual. Otherwise, we will not get back to regular order. And that's my honest opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chairman Lowe, can I ask you one other question? You referenced you can, a, oh, sure. a dollar figure of $67 billion for the state of New York in this appropriations bill. Is, do I understand that correctly? You, in your statement, you said that there was $67 billion for the state of New York. I was just wondering if we had the ability to know what what other states do we have that allocation? Has that breakdown? Uh, has that de degree of granularity been been broken out? I'd be happy to provide you with as much detail you want, not just from New York but from every state in the country. I'm, I, I think that's something that uh, that the members of the full house. I, I think that's something that we should have available to us. I was not aware that there was, uh, and I don't know what formulaic basis that was derived from, uh, that would be interesting also. But still, if there, is a, if there is a dollar figure, I think people need to know what that is. All the information is very, very clear. If you want to know the number of deaths, the number of current cases, the number of nursing homes that are losing people every day, the amount of money that has been spent and frankly, the governor in New York, I think, has done a very effective job. I'm happy to provide for you as much information as you want to, frankly, back up all the investments that have made to finally, what I've seen just this week is the curve that was going up has finally turned and going down. But we're not rushing to open up in New York as some other states. This is a longer discussion, but certainly you have a right to get all the information you want, and I'll make sure you get it. Well, I'll look to receive that from your staff. Thank you. Thank the witnesses for being and here. And I should also say Governor Cuomo has had a, a TV program every single day where he reports to the nation the amount of money spent, the shows the curve, how it is starting to turn, but there is still uh, too much death, too much suffering, <coughs> too much illness that is still requiring attention. So I'm happy to get you whatever information you want. Very well. I've watched Governor Cuomo's show. I learned something about uh, his daughter's boyfriend. It was all terribly interesting, in addition to all the other information that he imparted. Right. So. Well, I would appreciate if you said it's a pleasure hearing about his daughter's boyfriend in addition to the very clear documentation of the cases and the curve that is somehow getting better. As a New Yorker, I can tell you, we haven't been out of, well, I came here, this is the first time out of my house. Um, but there is a lot of suffering, a lot of death, a lot of illnesses. Nursing homes are having a, a tremendous challenge. Just one recently, I lost about 10 people. But any event, uh, the right. hearing is long. I'm happy to get you any information you want uh, about New York, and if it's helpful to you, that's fine. Thank, thank, you. thank you. I thank our witnesses for being here. I'll yield back. Uh, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you to our witnesses for all of your hard work. It's absolutely amazing. Chairman Pallone, thank you for the the leadership and, and putting together a strategic plan to address the public health and safety issues that need to be addressed so we can move towards a long-term economic recovery. 
Um, and Chairman Lowy, I really appreciated your talking about the fact that what's in this bill is really coming from our constituents. It's what we're hearing that our constituents need. In the past week, I've had really, really tough conversations with a couple of my neighbors. On Saturday, I went for a, a masked, socially distant walk, and one of my neighbors stopped me. She's an emergency room doctor. Um, she has two kids um, with her partner. They live about three doors down, and she said, will something be done because I have a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of student loans and I'm working in three different emergency rooms right now and if I die from COVID that's going to put my family in a really tough position because I just graduated from law school recently we haven't built up a lot of wealth so that was one request I heard and and a request that is reflected in the terms of the HEROES Act the other request, or the other request, the other information was from a woman I was in home and school with. She's a nurse. She just got out of the hospital. She was in the hospital for about a month. She didn't end up on a ventilator, but she did end up having last rites delivered. She almost died. And now she's out, but she can't go back to work. It's going to be a long road back for her. She's now got a heart condition. She may not be able to return to her job. So we are, you know, this is about our heroes. It's about the frontline healthcare workers. It's about the essential workers in our transportation and in our grocery stores. Um, it's about our local governments and our state governments that have been thrust into the front lines here when we didn't have the federal leadership that we needed. Um, and it's about protecting essential services like the post office and making sure that our voting, that our elections can happen. Pennsylvania's primaries, June 2nd, we're not out of um, shutdown in my region until after that. So we need to provide the resources to our communities, to our essential services, to our families. $1,200 doesn't pay for three months rent. I mean, SNAP benefits, you know, if you're already at the max, then you were still going hungry. So I really appreciate the work you're doing. There is so much urgency. I don't know why the Senate doesn't feel the same urgency. They made a big deal out of coming back last week to confirm some judicial um, appointments, but they haven't been putting together legislation to, to take the next step, which our constituents, Americans, need. So. If this bill is what it takes to get them to the table, thank you again. And I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I'd like to uh, address um, the comments that my colleague, Mr. Raskin, made about me giving misinformation about the extra MRA money that um, we were told was going to go to us. Uh, for the coronavirus, for the town halls and uh, equipment that our employees have to use. That actually, I texted Rodney Davis, who is the ranking member on uh, the Committee of House Administration, and he said that is what he has been told, and that um, the CAO is supposed to be making plans on how to do that. And so, and he also said if that isn't the case, it's news to him, and that he's all fired up about it. So we'll see what happens on that. But let's turn to the bill itself. Um, you know, I think there are some good things in the bill, but I really believe that the bad things that I consider bad in the bill totally outweigh uh, the good things in the bill. And from what I've been told, uh, the bill continues this extra $600 a week unemployment uh, insurance payment uh, through the end of January 2021. Uh, it extends the family medical leave for another year, but it mandates all businesses to do it, including businesses with less than 50 employees. Um, and it expands the $1,200 rebate checks to people who are here illegally, and that the $600 a week that people um, are getting in unemployment pay does not count towards the income that you figure out to get, to get food stamps or SNAP. Um, and of course, it federalizes elections uh, by mandating that 
everyone gets mailed a ballot and that every state has to do uh, same day uh, voter registration as the date that they vote. And so I've had businesses that I've talked to, and I'm sure all of us have talked to small business owners, large business industries in our district and throughout our states. And over and over again, I've heard from business owners, managers, that they are trying to hire back workers because they're opening up in Arizona, we're opening up, and they're having a hard time getting the workers back because in the state of Arizona, many of their, when you add the amount of money of the $600 plus whatever the state of Arizona played in unemployment, these people are making more money than they were when they were working. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so they're having a really hard time hiring them back. So I really would, to tell you the truth, want to label this in my terms, the no incentive to go back to work bill because businesses want to hire them back. They're opening up. And what I've been told is the workers are like, well, I, you know, I get paid more, you know, staying at home. And uh, I know that there's a mechanism, I guess, where they could force them uh, to come back to work and, and report them to the unemployment insurance, but then you'd have disgruntled workers, right? So who wants that? So I, I just can't support this bill, um, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Morelli. <clears throat> yes, thank you. I, I would note that uh, in states that have a $7.25 minimum wage, it certainly would make sense for people to take the enhanced unemployment, but that might argue more for a higher federal minimum wage than we have right now in New York. Uh, we have a much higher minimum wage, and other states do as well, but it does point out how a low minimum wage in this country affects people and uh, that they would choose to have unemployment rather than go to work, I think says volumes about what we need to do on minimum wage. But that aside, I. I do appreciate it, Mr. Chair, just a moment, and that is really just to thank the, uh, the two chairs here. Uh, obviously, I have uh, special regard for the uh, chair of the Appropriations Committee, a great New Yorker, and someone who has been working tirelessly uh, on all of these issues, and I very much appreciate your leadership, particularly as it relates to states and local governments. Um, Mr. Perlmutter has, has mentioned that he and I were working with, uh, with colleagues to make sure our state governments uh, get what they need, local governments get what they need, particularly as it relates to uh, reductions in revenue, uh, and that has been dramatic since many states, most states, uh, income is derived from economic activity. So I want to thank you and, and certainly the Chairman Pallone for your leadership on so many different issues and working to try to piece together enough resources for our health care system, for additional testing, for contact tracing, all the things that our healthcare professionals continue to insist we need to do to get past the public health crisis and then to begin to rebuild our economy. So I want to thank both of you and all the people that are working with you on your committees, your staff. I think, um, as, uh, as I think uh, Ms. Lowy, Chairman Lowy mentioned, um, the, uh, the Fed Chair has said uh, the worst thing we could do is underinvest right now and to uh, pull up short in our response to this crisis, and you have not done that to your credit, and uh, hopefully the House will, uh, will, hopefully will act today, and then the House will act on Friday, and, uh, and then begin an earnest negotiation. We hope the Senate realizes the, the urgency uh, facing the American public and, and joins all of us in, in moving ahead. So thank you, Ms. Chair. You'll back, and thank you. Thank you. Ms. Shalala. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. First, I, I want to say to Chairman Chairwoman uh, Lowy and uh, Chairman Pallone, that I think they've done a marvelous job on this, uh, your usual first-rate uh, job. My district is devastated by this virus. Um, just to give you an example of why the state and local money uh, is important and the other uh, monies that are here for unemployment, Miami Beach has about 90,000 residents. It has 10 million visitors. That's what it had last year. The restaurants cannot open up with 90,000 residents. 
because I represent the hotels on the beach, the port of Miami, the cruise lines that come in. So all of those conventions and the cruise lines, I mean, um, Florida now has two million people who have applied for unemployment. And in my district, almost everyone that was involved in anything related to the hospitality industry, which is probably 80% of my district um, have lost their jobs and are applying for unemployment or they're applying for PPP. I hope on uh, PPP that we can at some point talk about the transition for those restaurants because they won't fully open up and they're concerned that uh, uh, that if they open up and they only have 25% of the business because they have to spread people out, they're still going to need some support. So I think as we talk to small businesses uh, that we're going to learn some things about transition money as we're going through. Um, the health care money, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, that's here is critical. We don't have enough testing in this country. And we haven't even gotten around um, to uh, contact tracing. And without those two things, my own judgment is we're opening up too soon in many places in the country. We're not following the CDC guidelines. And I worry that, um, that we're going to need a lot more testing, a lot more contact tracing, but we have not starved this virus down to the point where the public health people are telling us that we're really ready uh, to open up. And um, this investment in our, in our teachers, in our police officers, in our, all of our, in our fire officers, and in our first responders is absolutely critical. Not because we want the governments to survive, but because they, they provide us with the kind of safety that institutions need, particularly individuals need, particularly during a, an extraordinary uh, crisis like this one. So um, I strongly support this bill, um, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be more worried about uh, the future of the people of my district. But this, this absolutely will help us. This absolutely uh, will help us. So thank you very much, and I yield back. Well, I think nobody else has any questions. Let me just say to, to both of you, uh, I want to thank you uh, very much uh, for being here and for answering all the questions. I mean, th we are living in an, uh, an unbelievable moment, uh, a tragic moment uh, in so many respects. And um, you know, we have an economic crisis, uh, but uh, we also have a health crisis. And we're not going to solve the economic crisis until we deal effectively with the health crisis. And what you have presented in the HEROES Act is something that will deal with both. So I want to thank you for your leadership. I want to thank you for your commitment and dedication to the American people. I want to thank you for being born, um, because uh, I think these extraordinary times uh, need extraordinary leaders, and I think both of you live up to that. So thank you very much, and you are now excused. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, before we get to our next witness, I want to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record a statement from Representative Nanette Diaz Barrigan uh, uh, on, with regard to the HEROES Act, without objection. Um, and now I think uh, we have one other witness, uh, Mr. Grothman from Wisconsin. Uh, you, uh, as soon as, as soon as Mr. Palom moves, moves, we can, we can. Frank, you gotta. Yeah. Right behind yeah. You, Frank. He's got, he's got yeah. All right, all right, Mr. Yeah, there you go, Mr. All right. Mr. Grothman, you're recognized. Thank you very much. I'll try to be brief today. Um, just one comment to lead off. I take this bill very seriously because while I know this bill is not going to be signed into law in May or June of this year, I think there is a one would have to say a fairly good chance that it could be signed into law of February next year. And I think that's why this is a very important bill, uh, because this is going to be, could very easily be, uh, um, something that 
people in the majority of both the House and Senate uh, vote for in the near future and a, a different sort of president would sign into law. So that's why this bill is so important. It's very possible by this time next year uh, it is signed into law. I have three amendments. I'm going to go through them all very quickly. Um, the first one, um, I, I view this bill as dealing with two kind of separate but related problems. One, we have a health care problem, which is the most important of the two. Secondly, we have an economic problem. I do not think we're doing a good enough job of addressing the health care problem. I therefore have the First Amendment requiring the Centers for Disease Control to report to Congress by July 31st on the interrelationship of vitamin D and COVID-19. I am handing out for you folks two articles, one by something called the Science Tech Daily, once by Northwestern Now, showing that strong or adequate doses of vitamin D has had a dramatic impact on the number of people who get, and even more the number of people who die from COVID-19 in Europe. I do not feel we are doing, we're, we're focusing all on a vaccine down the road, but we're not doing enough of a job of focusing on more natural sort of cures uh, at this time. To a certain extent, I blame the CDC for that, which is why I am asking them to address this issue. If you look at fatalities in places like Sweden or Norway or Finland and Denmark and compare it to fatalities in Spain and Italy, one of the big differences is the amount of vitamin C. Not only is it important that we may be encouraging people to take vitamin D supplements, but it's also important with regard to vitamin D that we, like you were told when you were children, get outside and get some sun. And right now, a lot of governors, you know, shelter in place are basically encouraging people to stay out of the sun. So hopefully uh, the CDC can look into this a little bit and hopefully we can get a little bit of press telling people back home that if you don't want to die from the COVID, make sure you got your vitamin D levels up. There's one. I know we all read stuff, but it's worthwhile. Read these two articles and get in your local radio station and save some lives. Um, the next two amendments are with regard to the economic situation. Um, the first is with regard to the PPP. We're asking, um, we're asking the Small Business Administration to come up with a more exact uh, guidance with regard to good faith certification under the Paycheck Protection Program. It is my belief that right now we are spending more on that program than is necessary. I know a lot of people in this building don't care how much we spend, but believe it or not, it should matter. And I would argue that there are people, if I were a Democrat, I'd make the argument even stronger. There are some people who are getting this program who shouldn't be getting this program. Uh, not to mention, under all cases, I'm sure we've all got uh, constituent contacts, people do not know whether they're eligible or not. And I'm afraid there are people who are gonna find out, you know, five or six or eight months from now, that they got a loan that they shouldn't be getting or could be penalized. Uh, in any event, that's amendment number two. Amendment number three deals with an issue that uh, Representative Lescu just brought up. Uh, we're already having a problem in my district and that people are being paid more not to work than to work. Uh, it's a problem for businesses they reopen up. I think probably the biggest mistake and that big bill we passed about a month ago was adding six, or over a month ago now, was adding over $600, or adding $600 a week to unemployment. In Wisconsin, that means you're getting paid on an annual basis about $50,000 a year not to work. I don't know whether the people who put that thing in were intentionally trying to destroy the economy or not, but I can't think of a quicker way to destroy the economy than to pay people more not to work than to work. And uh, so the amendment takes that $600 back down to $300 and no longer extends it past July 31st. Um, something that's really got to be done because I really can't imagine the economy taking off if you're paying more people not to work than to work. And I will point out that there's a benefit to not working too. I think most people would probably, a lot of people, uh, would rather not work for 50,000 a year than work for 70,000 a year. So this is a problem we have in Wisconsin as we try to get the economy going again. 
and I hope you guys uh, make that adjustment. I'll make one more observation with regard to the PPP and the unemployment. Eventually, there's going to be a compromise on this bill with the Senate. One of the problems around here is when the Republicans and Democrats get together, the compromise they reach is, I'll spend more on your program if you spend more on my program, okay, which is why we're so in debt. When you look at the flaws of the PPP and you look at the flaws of the unemployment, maybe somebody who does the negotiation and approach it with the attitude of, I'll spend less on my program if you spend less on your program. Thanks much. I hope I didn't... Uh, I know you guys, I'm told you guys have been here since 11 this morning, so I thought I'd try to get the three amendments out of there pretty quick. Well, Mr. Grothman, thank you very much for, for being here. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, and uh, you waited an awful long time, and we appreciate it. And I also appreciate your attitude, uh, which is always uh, very constructive. Uh, so um, I thank you uh, very much, and um, I, I have no questions. Uh, let me ask my friend, uh, Mr. Cole, or... Any, any questions or comments? No, I just uh, quickly, Mr. Chairman, want to associate myself with your remarks. I appreciate my friend's patience being here. I know it's been a very long time for you. Uh, these are thoughtful suggestions, and I appreciate very much the manner in which you always present them, which is short and to the point, and uh, certainly hope that they're given serious consideration by the committee, Mr. Chairman. Any questions on the Democratic side? Uh, any other? Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to, to uh, thank Glenn for for being here, and, and, and it reminds me of something uh, Ms. Torres said earlier, which is that you can't just sit back and wait for your amendments to be made in order. Uh, you got to get out there and fight uh, to make them, them happen. Here we are with a $3 trillion bill uh, here. Uh, I've got someone who has shown up uh, to say, you know what, in, in, in uh, uh, page upon page upon page, scores of pages, hundreds of, of pages, I have three ideas I think can make them uh, better. I think uh, uh, we need more of this participation as opposed to less. And uh, in this, it, it, as uh, uh, Ms. Torres was rewarded uh, for her uh, uh, unwillingness to take no for an answer as she fought for her constituents, I hope we will be able to do the same thing uh, for Mr. Grothman. I uh, thank you for being here. Yield back. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much. You, you are free to go. You want to submit? I'll leave. Record? Say one more thing. Yeah. On this vitamin D. The articles don't tell you how many lives would be saved, but I bet you'd save that. You, I bet that death rate would have been cut by 20 or 25 percent if everybody in this country had enough vitamin D. Thanks much. Do you want to submit those articles for the record? Yeah, yeah, they're up there. Without objection. Okay. Are there any other members who wish to testify in H.R. 6800? Seeing none, uh, this closes the hearing on H.R. 6800. Uh, at this time, the uh, what? Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, So this, we also will close the hearing on HRES 965 uh, and also on HR 6800. So at this time, the chair will entertain a motion from the distinguished gentleman from California, Ms. Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Motion for HRES 965 and HR 6800. I move the committee grant HRES 965 authorizing remote voting by proxy in the House of Representatives and providing for official remote committee proceedings during a public health emergency due to the novel coronavirus for the other and for other purposes a close rule. The rule provides that upon adoption of this resolution it shall be in order without intervention of any point of order to consider HRS 965. The rule provides one hour of general debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on rules. The rule provides that the resolution shall be considered as read. The rule also provides for consideration of H.R. 6800, the Health and Economic Recovery Omnibus Emergency Solutions Act under a closed rule. The rule provides that upon adoption of this resolution, it shall be in order to consider H.R. 6800 without intervention of any question of consideration. The rule provides two hours of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the amendment printed in the Rules Committee report shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule provides that clause 2E of rule 21 shall not apply during consideration of the bill. The rule provides one motion to recommit without 
with or without instructions, the rule provides that until completion of proceedings enabled by the first two sections of the resolution, the chair may decline to entertain any intervening motion except as expressly provided herein. Resolution question or notice, and the chair may decline to entertain the question of consideration. Section four of the rule provides that on any legislative day during the period from May 19th 2020 through July 21, 2020, the journal of the proceedings of the previous day shall be considered as approved and the chair may at any time declare the House adjourned to meet at a date and time to be announced by the chair in declaring the adjournment. The rule provides that the speaker may appoint members to perform the duties of the chair for the duration of the period addressed by section four of the resolution. The rule provides that each day during the period addressed by section four of the resolution shall not constitute a calendar day for the purpose of section seven of the war powers resolution. The rule provides that each day during the period addressed by section four of the resolution shall not constitute a legislative day for the purpose of clause seven of rule 13. The rule provides that each day during a period addressed by section four of the resolution shall not constitute a calendar or legislative day for purposes of clause seven C one of rule 22. The rule provides that each day during a period addressed by section four shall not constitute a legislative day for the purposes of clause seven of rule 15. The rule provides for consideration of concurrent resolutions providing for adjournment during the month of July 2020. The rule provides that it shall be in order at any time through the calendar day of July 19, 2020 for the speaker to entertain motions for the House suspend the rules as though under clause one of rule 15 and that the speaker or her designee shall consult with the minority leader or his designee on the designation of any matter for consideration pursuant to this section. Finally, the rule waivers the requirement of Clause 6A of Rule 13 for a two-thirds vote to consider a report from the Committee of Rules on the same day as it is presented to the House with respect to any resolution reported through the legislative day of July 21, 2020. Thank you very much. Um, you've heard the motion from the gentlewoman from California. Uh, is there any amendment or discussion? Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief, and we'll have a lot fewer amendments. Uh, the rule than we did previously. But I would, uh, Mr. Chairman, like to move for an open rule on HRES uh, 965. As you know from our previous discussion, we have considerable concerns about that. Believe me, our entire side of the aisle does. And so we would like our members to have the opportunity to try and modify this rule and other members that may have good ideas uh, on your side of the aisle uh, to contribute as well. So we move for an open rule on uh, HRES uh, 965, Mr. Chairman. You're back. I appreciate the, the gentleman's uh, suggestion, but let me see, we're, it's about an hour and a half between each vote. If we had an open rule, maybe that would take us into next year um, <laughs> at the way we're moving. But in any event, I appreciate the effort. Um, I would urge a no vote. Um, the vote is now on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Any opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Roll call, please. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin, no. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Woodall. The, I have a, uh, I might have two amendments. Uh, if, if you would entertain a, a question about the text, I'm looking at page five, uh, instructions from members authorizing proxy, announcing instructions. It says immediately prior, this is line 24, immediately prior to casting a vote or recording the presence of another member as a designated proxy under this resolution, the members shall seek recognition from the chair to announce the intended vote or the recorded presence pursuant to the exact instruction received from the member. I'm thinking about our rules committee debate tomorrow. Uh, you're going to finish your closing statement. You're going to move the previous uh, question. How, how do I as a rank and file member then get the attention of the chair to, to make my announcement about all the votes I'll be casting on the previous question vote? 
because I, I, I'm, I'm concerned the wording might be wrong, and we can we can fix that up right here today. Yeah. So during the vote, um, the, the the proxy the, the vote will be announced, um, and then it will be um, it, it announced by the member, and then also by the clerk. The, they're both during the as the as the roll as, yeah. as the electronic the voting is rolling on. Okay, all right. That is the, that's what is anticipated. All right. And then I do not have an amendment uh, uh, there. I do have an amendment uh, to make uh, the uh, the resolution uh, divisible. Uh, we even heard from the leader uh, that he was not a big fan of proxy voting, but he wanted to get to remote uh, voting. I know members on our side of the aisle have a lot of different uh, opinions. Uh, I think the more bipartisan uh, this vote is, the better. Uh, folks who disagree just can't vote yes. But if you allow for the division uh, of the question, there are, as Mr. Davis pointed out, uh, different priorities here. There is how do we make the committees work, there's how do we make the floor work, there's should we move to remote uh, 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 voting. Do we make hearings work, do we make proxies uh, work? Uh, my amendment would allow uh, us to divide the question. Uh, again, uh, if the majority uh, 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 the majority has the votes to push everything through, but you very well might get more bipartisan support. And despite my vociferous objection uh, to proxy uh, voting, uh, not all of my colleagues feel as I do. And I think the larger the bipartisan vote, uh, the better for the institution uh, on this measure. I would provide for division of the question. Okay. Um, the motion is on the vote is on the gentleman's um, amendment. I vote aye. Uh, all those, <laughs> <say> aye. <laughs> all those op opposed say no. I'm, I'm, I'm just having trouble hearing. I don't know. But I think these elastics have been pulling in my ears so long. I'm, I'm having trouble hearing. Um, so, uh, and all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. No. And you chair, the noes have it. A roll call, please, Mr. Chairman. Right. The, the clerk will call the roll. Sorry, Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall. I'm an aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will uh, report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Burgess? Uh, it's actually. Oh, who's next? I think Ms. Lesko. Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee provide for four hours of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking member of the committee on rules for HRES 965. Mr. Chairman, before passing a change of this magnitude, something that hasn't been done in the history of the United States, we owe it to our colleagues and the American people to ensure all members have the opportunity to engage in a thoughtful debate on the House floor. And I ask uh, my fellow members to approve this amendment, and I yield back. Four hours. Four hours. Four hours. Four hours. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, uh, I think we've, well, I uh, appreciate the general lady's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those no, no. Oh. You the chair, the no's have it. You want to roll yeah, call vote? Yes, I do. Thank Clerk you. Call the roll. Mr. Hastings, Mrs. Torres, no. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter, Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin, Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. Or report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, offer as an amendment uh, an open rule for H.R. Uh, 6800. We obviously all had considerable input uh, on H.R.S. Uh, 965, and 
appreciate that very much. Not a single Republican has had any input on H.R. 6800. No consultation, no discussion, no, uh, obviously, hearing, no process whatsoever for inclusion. And that suggests to me there won't be any Republican votes tomorrow. And if there aren't Republican votes tomorrow, we can pass this across the House floor, but I can assure you it won't be entertained by the Senate, and the President's already made known his attentions tonight. So I would argue maybe we should begin the bipartisan process that we somehow skipped over uh, in putting this bill together, and uh, that might enhance its prospects further down the line. You'll back. I appreciate the, uh, the gentleman's amendment. Uh, I, ju I just saw an uh, article that I think uh, Peter King of New York is going to support the bill. Uh, but, uh, uh, Mr. Bur Dr. Burgess, you have I a... I just wanted to speak in favor of Mr. Oh, Cole's... Want... Go ahead. I wanted to speak in favor of Mr. Cole's amendment. I think it's... Uh, he's correct. Uh, it's a very limited participation that uh, half of the House has had. I don't know the participation on the other side, but I know on our side there wasn't any. Uh, really, this hearing today is... And I thank you for that, because it's really the only chance, the only exposition that... Uh, that uh, where we've had a chance to talk about it. And you heard my discussion with Mr. Pallone about uh, the work of the authorizer has been completely eclipsed here. I think giving Mr. Cole's amendment a, uh, an opportunity would, would bring some of that back so that members would have uh, an opportunity to weigh in on the bill. And I think that's an important part on something that is such of such historic significance and so historically large. I thank Mr. Cole for bringing it. I yield back. So the vote now is on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Any of the chair of the noes have it? Roll call, please, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Work report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Members not agreed to. Further amendments. Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would just, uh, to make this more manageable, uh, offer a modified open rule on H.R. 6800, that is to allow for pre-printed amendments so we wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, have uh, a deluge of unexpected things. Majority could prepare for them. It would probably hold down the size of the amendment process, make it much more manageable, but still uh, attain the objective of trying to make what's essentially a very partisan bill somewhat more bipartisan or at least uh, a process that's been totally closed somewhat more open. Go back. Heard the gentleman's amendment. Uh, those in favor of the Cole Amendment, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. 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 Any of the chair of the noes have it. Roll call, please, Mr. Chairman. call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Woodall. Mr. Chairman, uh, I uh, have an amendment uh, to the rule. Uh, and move that the committee uh, uh, go ahead and waive all points of order, uh, except those arising from Clause uh, 9 or 10 of, of Rule 21. I, I raised that issue uh, with uh, Mr. Pallone uh, uh, earlier. Uh, the question was, is all of this emergency spending or is it not? The House rules are very specific. Uh, you and I had a very lengthy discussion earlier today about uh, Mr. Woodall, don't be worried about your protections. If it's in the House rules, it's going to be protected. Uh, well, what I'm asking for is the protection of a provision that's in the House rules. I sit on the Budget Committee. The rules of the House say you cannot stick extraneous provisions in uh, an emergency spending bill. The title uh, of this uh, bill uh, is, and I quote, the Health and Economic Recovery Omnibus Emergency Solutions Act. Uh, 
So my, my amendment would expose those uh, points of order. And I will remind the chairman, uh, again, it's a majoritarian institution, as the ranking member uh, uh, referenced uh, earlier, uh, the majority in its wisdom made an order or exposed these points of order in the 2009 stimulus package. And when uh, that uh, happened, uh, the, the minority raised it as a point of order, and the House had to vote. Should we con consider the bill anyway, or should we not? Uh, wonder of wonders, the House decided they would consider the bill, uh, passed it and sent it to the President's desk uh, for his, uh, his signature. But this is not a, uh, this is not a, a, a nothing. Uh, again, for folks on the Budget Committee, you'll remember we, we uh, as, as an institution, uh, uh, were on the brink of a government shutdown to save $30 billion. This is $3 trillion. Uh, and uh, my only ask is that, as the chairman said to me earlier, if it's in the House rules currently, it will be protected. The rules currently allow us to raise a point of order for non-emergency items that have been stuffed into emergency uh, bills. We all want to respond to this emergency. We all have an interest in keeping out earmarks, keeping out preferred uh, tax benefits, and keeping out non-emergency uh, measures as Rule uh, 21 anticipates. Um, I will urge no vote on this. I mean, this is an emergency, and there are emergency um, provisions that have been put into this rule. Um, you, they, uh, so I would urge a, a no vote on this, and um, and uh, and urge my colleagues to vote no. Uh, so the vote now is on the Woodall Mr. Amendment. Mr. Chairman, yeah. just to be sure that I, I was I explained the amendment properly. I don't want to take out any emergency provisions, not one. Not a single provision that's in, in, in this entire stack of legislation that's an emergency provision. I don't want to strike a single one. My amendment says the non-emergency stuff that a, mem a member may have tucked in there that you and I haven't seen uh, yet because it is tucked in there, the House rules prohibit that behavior. The House rules prohibit members from doing that. And so I want uh, to the members to be able to raise that prohibition, and again, wouldn't thwart the majority's this uh, uh, will, would not prevent the emergency legislation from going forward, simply would follow the House rules, as I have been told time and time and time again, uh, uh, don't worry, Mr. Woodall, if it's in the House rules, those rights will be protected. I have a right as a budget committee member to make a point of order against considering non-emergency spending masquerading as an emergency spending bill. If I find that in my research, I'd like to be able to raise that point of order on the floor. Yeah, I believe, I my I believe you believe that, but I think we're going to stick with what we're doing here. Uh, and I would remind the gentleman um, that when he was in the majority uh, and we were in the minority, uh, you waived all points of order against every bill that you brought to the floor. So, um, uh, I, again, I, I would urge a, um, a no vote on this. Vote is now on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 In the chair, the noes have it. You want a roll call? Uh, please. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Burgess, Dr. Burgess. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule and move that the committee strike the words and, not, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question from the rule. This legislation before us spends $3 trillion, over 20 different sections. It has been a partisan approach taken by the majority. It's unfortunate that we can't divide the question and vote on separate sections of this legislation individually to determine what's really necessary to defeat this invisible enemy, which we all want to see defeated. So this motion allows for that opportunity, and I urge its adoption. Appreciate the gentleman, as he knows this is boilerplate language, very uh, standard language in almost every rule. 
Um, Mr. And Chairman, I it's not a standard. I appreciate the gentleman trying to add more votes, knowing that what we're dealing with now with social distancing and longer votes, about an hour and a half each vote. Um, if you, I, would, I would hope we wouldn't do that, but we will have, we'll have a vote. Those in favor of the Burgess Amendment say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Have Ms. Matsui, vote. no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments. Ms. Lesko. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to make in order my amendment number three to HR 6800. This amendment would strike the entirety of Title I, Subtitle G deduction of state and local taxes from the bill. The bill as written restores the state and local tax deduction, commonly called SALT, that was capped in the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. After the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed beginning in 2018, the SALT deduction was capped at $10,000 through 2025. The cap applies to all state and local income property and sales tax. The greatest beneficiaries of the SALT deduction are wealthy people in states that have high tax rates. The deduction really only benefits high tax states. It is better understood as benefiting high income individuals, many of whom reside in high tax jurisdictions with high housing values. The SALT deduction provides a larger benefit to states with high levels of income and well-being compared to other states. You know, I thought we were supposed to be in this bill. Um, my colleagues say we're helping, you know, the, the people really in need, the people that maybe have low income or out of work. But what this does is putting back in this deduction is actually helping the wealthy people in high-tax states and in taxpayers in my state, which is a low tax state, uh, those taxpayers are subsidizing others' wealthy uh, constituents in high tax state, and I think that's wrong. And I ask uh, my colleagues to please support my amendment, and I yield back. Thank you uh, very much. You just reminded me of the irresponsible tax cut bill that was passed uh, when the Republicans were in control, where the vast majority of the benefits went to the wealthiest individuals in this country, none of it paid for, and there was certainly no input by Democrats. Um, the states that might benefit from the SALT uh, deduction are states like New York right now that are suffering uh, greatly as a result of this uh, terrible coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, so I would urge a no vote on this. The uh, vote is now on the Lesko Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. Can you cheer? The no's have it. Um, it the, uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk we'll report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments. Ms. Lesko. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to make an order and provide the necessary waivers for my amendment, amendment number four to HR 6800. This amendment ensures that no taxpayer money goes to anyone in America who is here illegally. The current bill allows illegal immigrants to receive direct stimulus payments because the bill does not require Social Security number verification. The coronavirus pandemic continues to ravage our nation's health, economic, and immigration systems. Over 33 million people are unemployed and looking for work. And yet, my Democratic colleagues want to bail out this country's 14.3 million illegal aliens 
in this next round of stimulus legislation. Instead of requiring a social security number, illegal aliens with individual taxpayer identification numbers are allowed to receive recovery rebate checks. It would also give these illegal aliens the ability to receive $1,200 checks retroactively from the CARES Act. Um, I just think that's wrong. I think we need to prioritize our U.S. citizens, and I ask for your support, and I yield back. Thank you. I'm going to yield to Ms. Torres. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. We would hope that amendments we are discussing today would do something to bring additional help to people during this pandemic, hardworking people. This amendment, however, is not one of those amendments. It just takes away the help that people need by pre preventing immigrants and their families from getting stimulus payments. The CARES Act provides economic impact payments to families across this country. This is much needed help when people are losing their jobs or getting their hours cut because of the pandemic. But the CARES Act left out a particular group of individuals who pay their taxes. Immigrants who use a taxpayer ID number rather than a social security number. These individuals contribute to our country both through their hard work and through their taxes. Yet, we are not allowing them to receive this extra help in the time of need. My constituents in the Inland Empire have called my office about this concern in desperation and shock that they were left out because they are taxpayers. One constituent called and said that he has a social security number, but he would not be receiving the stimulus payment because his wife does not. In his words, and I quote, sadly, Congress blocked me from getting a stimulus payment because of whom I fell in love with and whom I choose to spend my life with. This is an American citizen that we're denying assistance. That's heartbreaking. That's not family values. That's not standing up for American people. The HEROES Act fixes this issue for this gentleman, his wife, and millions of others across this country. It allows individuals who file taxes using taxpayers' ID number to the payments sent through the CARES Act, as well as the second round of payments in this bill. It ensures immigrants and people in my district are not left out. This amendment, however, does the opposite. It wants to prevent the working poor, the people that are supporting you while this pandemic is rampant. Many people in my district from getting the help that they need from this global pandemic. It is harmful, it is shameful, and I urge members to vote against this amendment. Thank you. Um heard the discussion. Now the, uh, the vote is on the Lesko Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Opinion of the Chair, the roll, no's have it. Roll call vote, please. Clerk call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Ms. Lesko. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to make an order and provide the necessary waivers for my amendment, amendment number five to HR 6800. This amendment would ensure no funds from this bill go to institutions or providers that provide abortions. This amendment will ensure that no taxpayer funds authorized in this bill will be used to aid or support institutions or providers that provide abortions. Um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about human life. Um, the coronavirus is taking away people's life. Um, but. I think we need to reflect on the fact that over a half a million babies are aborted before birth every year in the United States. Um, a Marist poll shows that 75% of Americans would limit abortion to the first three months of pregnancy.
Further, Americans oppose taxpayer funding for abortion in the U.S. 54 percent to 39 percent. And 75 percent of Americans oppose using tax dollars to fund abortions in foreign countries. Um, I think this is an important uh, amendment, and I ask for your support, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are in the middle of a devastating public health crisis. This is the time when we should be coming together to strengthen our health care systems. Instead, this amendment will limit access to critical reproductive health care services. It is policies like this and other anti-choice policies that harm women and their families' access to health care. History demonstrates that these anti-choice regulations disproportionately impact low-income and minority communities. This crisis is not an opportunity to limit care for those in need. Instead, we need to be getting health care funds to families now so that they can treat patients that have COVID-19. Preventing hospitals from getting funds to combat COVID-19 or doctors in those hospitals from getting PPE because they may, may provide abortions is not a way to help our health care providers. This amendment is not a way to help those on the front lines working to save people's lives and risking their own. This is not the time to play politics. It is time to put patients first. Colleagues, I urge a no vote. Thank the gentlelady. Uh, Ms. Lesko. Thank you. And, you know, I know we all have our beliefs, and, but, but to me this isn't politics. This is about human life to me. It's something I hold closely, belief. I'm pro-life, and so it's not politics to me. It's about saving babies' lives. So thank you, and I yield back. Uh, Ms. Shalala. Mr. Chairman, on one hand, people are arguing there are things in the bill that have nothing to do with COVID-19, and then we see an amendment that has nothing to do with COVID-19 asking us to vote uh, for it. I urge my colleagues to vote against it. All right, we've had the discussion. The vote is now on the Lesko Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. 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 The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Askin. No. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui. Matt Suey, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Seeing none, uh, the uh, the vote now is on the uh, on the motion offered by the gentleman from California. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Let's try that one more time. All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. No. And the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Yes. A roll call vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter, aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Morelli, aye. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala, aye. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, no. Mrs. Lesko, Mrs. Lesko, no. Mr. Chairman, aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk report the total. Eight yeas, four nays. Motion is agreed to, and I will manage this for the majority. I'll manage for the Mr. Cole for the minority. I want to thank everybody, and particular, and this, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, Perlmutter, Ed Perlmutter from Colorado. Um, I, I didn't recognize I, uh, I, I, uh, Mr. Uh, Raskin uh, corrected the record on some things. I have to correct the record on a mistake I made. And uh, I made a big point about math. Yep. I did bad math. Um, the, uh, when I was uh, suggesting to Mr. Byrne that, uh, you know, 35 people were missing at 750,000 per 
district, I gave an answer that was about half as many people who, as who were actually sort of not represented at that point. The actual number is 26,250,000 people. I said something like 11 million. I have no idea where I got that number. So I apologize and I want to correct that. The record stands corrected. Yeah. But let me, let, me, let me thank everybody, especially the staff. I mean, we have been here for uh, nine hours. Um, so that's a, probably a record. Uh, but I appreciate the tone uh, of the discussion. Um, and I know these are difficult issues, and I know they're contentious issues. But I do appreciate the tone. I want to thank the ranking member. I want to thank my Republican colleagues and my Democratic colleagues, but uh, especially the staff on both the majority and minority side for, for their patience. And uh, we will have a long day tomorrow. So without objection, the committee is adjourned.